in the process of setting up required tools on windows you should be familiar about a tool called as powershell powershell is available out of the box with windows 10 windows 11 and even earlier versions of windows i'll be demonstrating using windows 11 you should be able to relate it to windows 10 also that being said it is very important for you as a software engineer to understand the relevance of powershell so that you can use it effectively if you have uh, already quite a few uh, years of experience working on windows you might have heard about dos prompt PowerShell is nothing but advanced version of DOS prompt. DOS prompt is typically used to run any Windows based commands to navigate through the file system and also for a few other purposes. PowerShell is a lot more powerful compared to DOS prompt. You should be able to even script using PowerShell. It is used on Windows based projects. However, these days most of the applications are set up on Linux. For shell scripting, you have to take care of installing some additional tools which you will be covering as part of relevant sections in relevant courses. For now, we'll focus on what is PowerShell, how to launch it, and some of the key features related to PowerShell. I have already covered what is PowerShell. It is nothing but command prompt where you should be able to run any commands which are valid on Windows-based system. That being said, how to launch PowerShell? You should be able to click on this search bar or such uh, app. Uh, this is nothing but uh, icon for such app. You can click on this. It will open the search app. I have already searched for Windows PowerShell and hence uh, I am seeing it here. You might not see. You might see something like this. Now you should be able to search for PowerShell here. If you are using Windows 10, you might see a search bar here. You should be able to type PowerShell directly there and you will see quite a few options. You have to choose the appropriate option. In this case, I will be searching for PowerShell here. You see, it is actually showing quite a few options. Uh, there are four of them. We should be clicking on Windows PowerShell without any additional details such as ISC x86 and also ISC x86. We just have to click on Windows PowerShell. It will launch the PowerShell for us. On Windows 10, you might actually end up uh, uh, seeing the PowerShell uh, in blue color. In Windows 11, they have changed the color to black. Except the, uh, for that, uh, most of the other key features related to PowerShell and also the commands related to PowerShell are same irrespective of using Windows 10 or Windows 11. If you want to change any of the settings related to the PowerShell, you just have to go to the top bar. This is nothing but top bar. You can right click. You can click on properties. You can see quite a few settings here. You should be able to change the settings here. Uh, if you wanted to use uh, blue color, you should be able to go to colors and you should be able to change the background and you can take it further. Similarly, if you want to change the font, you can change the font here. These are the details related to how to customize uh, your uh, PowerShell's behavior depending upon your preferences. That being said, now let's uh, talk about some of the key features related to PowerShell. One of the most prominent features related to PowerShell is ability to SSH to remote machines uh, without installing any additional softwares. Uh, if you are already experienced on Windows, you might be using something called as PuTTY to actually connect to remote machines. You don't need to set up PuTTY if you have PowerShell. SSH is already there. You just have to get the username, uh, the host name, etc. And you should be able to leverage that information to connect to the remote machines using SSH that is available out of the box on PowerShell. Like this, there are quite a few other features. You will understand those features as and when it is relevant. One of the prominent features is nothing but ability to connect to the remote machines via SSH. That being said, if you want to list the files uh, using PowerShell, you should be able to use command called as DIR. It is nothing but DOS prompt command and you can see the folders and files that are there. You can also use mkdir command to make the directory. However, if you are from Linux background, PowerShell is not as sophisticated as Linux terminal or Unix terminal. It can run Windows commands. The Windows commands are significantly different from Linux. That being said, we have understood what is PowerShell, how to launch PowerShell, and also some of the prominent features of PowerShell. Also, we have seen how to customize the behavior of the PowerShell so that you can change the behavior depending upon your preferences. That being said, we'll be using PowerShell as and when it is required in several courses in several lectures. As part of this lecture, let's go ahead and set up Ubuntu on Windows. We can leverage something called as WSL or Windows Subsystem for Linux to actually take care of setting up Ubuntu on Windows. To actually set up Ubuntu on Windows using WSL or Windows Subsystem for Linux, you can start with launching PowerShell and then you should be able to take it further. In this case, I have Windows PowerShell as part of my search results here and hence I am clicking on this. If you don't see here, you just have to click on this and search for it and then you can take it further. If you are using Windows 10, you should be seeing a search bar here. You can search for PowerShell in that 
and then you should be able to launch PowerShell. So let me launch PowerShell here. Now PowerShell is launched. You can use a command called as WSL to see if WSL is already set up or not. In most of the Windows 10 and Windows 11 based machines, especially if it is personal machines, WSL should be set up. If you are using your office laptop, it might not be set up. You have to follow up with your uh, IT admin team and you need to make sure WSL is set up. They might set up or they might not depending upon the policy of the organization. In office laptops, WSL might not be pre-set up for you. You just have to keep that in mind. That being said, to see if uh, WSL is set up or not, you should be able to say WSL-V, V V4 version, and you should be able to see the usage of it. Actually, it is not giving the version details. Let me see if there is any other command to actually give us the version. I can use hyphen hyphen help to get more information about WSL. As of now, until you install something, you will not be able to see the version of WSL. Now you can actually set up your first virtual machine using hyphen i or hyphen hyphen install. It will take care of uh, installing the uh, Ubuntu based virtual machine by default. There are quite a few other options also. To get a list of available options, you can actually say WSL hyphen L hyphen hyphen online or hyphen O. Hyphen O is nothing but synonym for hyphen hyphen online. You can see the details here either of the approaches can be used. I am using a hyphen hyphen online here. You can see the available distributions. We should be able to leverage these distributions to set up the virtual machine based upon our preference. Now let's understand how to set up Ubuntu 20.04 virtual machine on Windows using WSL. If you just say WSL hyphen hyphen install, it will default to Ubuntu. You can see the star here. It is the default one. It will take care of setting up the virtual machine using this one. It might be pointing to 18.04. If you wanted to set up using Ubuntu 20.04, you should be able to say WSL hyphen hyphen install hyphen D or hyphen hyphen distribution. You can see the syntax here. After that, you should be able to say Ubuntu hyphen 20.04. It is case sensitive and hence you should be capital here. Then only it will work. I'll be setting up the virtual machine using Ubuntu 20.04. Even if you use Ubuntu, it might end up setting up the virtual machine using Ubuntu 20.04 itself. In my case, I'll be setting up virtual machine using this one. You can select and hit enter. It will be copied. Now you should be able to say WSL hyphen I for hyphen hyphen install. Both are aliases. Either you can say hyphen I or hyphen hyphen install. Then you should be able to say hyphen D or hyphen hyphen distribution. I have already copied into the buffer. Now I am pasting it. I have just right clicked and you can see that it is pasted without any issues. Now we should be able to hit enter. However, it is failing uh, for some reason. It is not actually installing it. Let me check the command. It is nothing but WSL hyphen hyphen install hyphen D. I think uh, uh, there is no alias for install. That's why it is not working. I have to say WSL hyphen hyphen install only. So let me delete this. Let me say hyphen, then install, then hyphen D, Ubuntu hyphen 20.04. Now you can see that it is taking a little bit of time. While the command was running, I have paused recording. Now uh, the command have ran successfully. Let's understand what have happened. It have installed something called as a virtual machine platform. Once a virtual machine platform is uh, installed, it have taken care of installing uh, something called as WSL. WSL is nothing but Windows subsystem for Linux. Even though the commands uh, were available, the actual WSL was not installed. When we try to install our first virtual machine, it will actually take care of installing WSL on this uh, machine or on your Windows machine. Once the WSL is installed, it have taken care of downloading and installing WSL kernel. Uh, once WSL kernel is installed, it have downloaded and installed something called as GUI app support. GUI stands for graphical user interface. WSL also have graphical user interface, but we will not be using it. If you want, you can explore it. After taking care of all the components related to WSL, then it have downloaded Ubuntu 20.04 image for us. Now it has to be installed. The installation is not done. It is saying the requested operation is successful. So the command is successful. However, the changes will not be effective until the system is rebooted. Now it is time for me to reboot this machine so that the installation of the virtual machine using this distribution is taken care of. How to restart this machine? We can actually click on this if you are using Windows 11. Then you can see the power button here. You should be able to click on it and you should be able to restart. If you are using Windows 10, 
you will see similar uh, icon in this corner you should be able to click on it and you should be able to restart your windows machine in this case as i'm using windows 11 i can see the power button as part of uh, this app let me click on it and uh, you can see there is a restart option i should be able to restart this uh, uh, windows machine just by clicking on it now windows machine is being restarted once the windows machine is rebooted we will resume the process of setting up ubuntu 20.04 virtual machine using wsl on windows 10 or 11. at this time we are going to the details about setting up ubuntu based virtual machine using wsl on windows 10 or 11. the system is rebooted after we have ran command called as wsl hyphen hyphen install hyphen d ubuntu 20.04 as the system is restarted it have actually resumed where it have stopped you can see that it have installed the ubuntu 20.04 uh, virtual machine on this uh, windows based machine now it is prompting for the username and password for this ubuntu based virtual machine so in this case i am giving the name as this one this is username it will come handy to log in into the virtual machine at a later point in time make sure you remember the username as well as the password in this case i am entering the password here after entering the password for the first time i have retyped the password as well once the password is retyped then it have created the user successfully on top of ubuntu 20.04 virtual machine which is created on windows you can see that i am already in the uh, ubuntu based virtual machine you should be able to run uname hyphen a to confirm the os details you can see it is nothing but linux based operating system this is nothing but wsl uh, cli or command prompt to change the settings you can actually go to the properties it is nothing but flavor of dos prompt or powershell uh, itself and hence you will see the preferences in the same manner as you have seen with respect to powershell now let me change the font here let me change it to 24 let me click on ok now you can see bigger text here so this is how you should be able to complete the setup process of ubuntu 20.04 based virtual machine on wsl now this is the wsl interface even though it is a flavor of powershell if i exit it will actually exit from the application completely now if you have to log in back again into that virtual machine one of the ways is to leverage the powershell and take it further once again i am actually launching powershell here just to demonstrate how to connect to that virtual machine which was created now the powershell is launched you should be able to list the current running virtual machines by saying wsl hyphen l hyphen v you can see that uh, as of now the virtual machine is in a stopped state to connect to it you just have to say wsl it will automatically connect to it if you have multiple virtual machines it will actually connect to the default one the star represents the default one in this case we have only one and it will be the default one and hence when we say wsl it will automatically get us into that virtual machine now let me exit from here let me run wsl hyphen l hyphen v once again in case if you have multiple virtual machines and if you want to connect to one of the virtual machines you can use wsl hyphen d or hyphen hyphen distribution and you should be able to give the name of the distribution which is nothing but ubuntu 20.04 in this case this is how you should be able to connect to the virtual machine by explicitly specifying the distribution name using which the virtual machine is set up now the virtual machine is set up if the virtual machine is in stopped state when we run wsl command like this it will start and then it will connect us into the virtual machine now you can see that it have got into the home folder of the windows machine uh, this is how the home folder of the windows machine will be represented as part of the virtual machine you can also run ls ltr you should be able to see all the files that are there as part of our windows in the home folder of the user uh, using which we have logged in into this windows machine you can also say exit you can run dir command dir is the valid command on powershell against windows and hence you can run dir command whatever folders you are seeing here you will be seeing all these and few additional hidden folders as well when you actually run ls ltr command as part of the virtual machine which is set up using ubuntu ls ltr is linux based command to list the files and folders and you can see all the files and folders that are there in the home directory some of these are hidden uh, they are not visible when we run dir command on windows however when it comes to linux when we run ls ltr they are not hidden files or folders for linux and hence they are showing up here 
That being said, you can actually go to your home directory on your virtual machine by just running cd command. This is the home directory. You can run pwd command to actually uh, see the home directory path. This is again a Linux or Unix command. It will uh, give us the current working directory or present working directory. Uh, this is the present working directory for the user dgadiraju. And this user have come from the user which is created while setting up the virtual machine. Whatever username you have given while setting up the virtual machine is the one uh, that will be reflected here. When we run wsl-d Ubuntu 20.04 like this to connect to the virtual machine, it will connect to the user which we have created at the time of setting up the virtual machine. This is how you should be able to take care of setting up the Ubuntu based virtual machine on Windows using WSL. We will see the usage of this as and when it is required as part of our courses and also you should be able to leverage this as part of your day to day activities other than our courses. As part of Linux commands for beginners, in this sectional model, we'll go through the details related to getting started with Linux shell commands. We'll start with running our first command, then we'll actually get into the details about using help to get usage of a given Linux command. Once we go through those details, we'll get a high level overview about files and folders in Linux. Also, we'll understand the concepts behind fully qualified or absolute path as well as relative path of files and folders. Keep in mind that this is just getting started with the Linux shell commands. In this, we will only cover those aspects which are common across all the sections or modules. The topics such as files and folders and also the absolute or relative paths are relevant with almost all the sections in this course and hence we will be focusing only on those things. Also, I will actually go through the details about overview of history of Linux shell commands and also how to navigate through the history to get the commands which are already used earlier. Beyond this, we'll cover quite a few other stuff, but over a period of time, you'll be learning all these things in detail. Once we understand how to get started with Linux shell commands, then we'll actually get into the details such as listing files and folders in a Linux file system using commands such as ls, also how to filter files and folders in Linux file system using commands such as find. Then we'll see how to process data in files using commands such as cat, then we have other commands also to process data in files such as cut, sort, unique, etc. Then we'll actually go through the details about understanding file and folder properties. Then we'll actually get into managing files and folders in Linux, so and so forth. There will be quite a few sections or modules which will be covering almost all the important aspects of Linux for beginners, especially from the commands perspective. Keep in mind that this is not the course related to shell scripting and hence there will not be too much of emphasis on shell scripting as part of this course where we are going to cover all the Linux commands for beginners. As we are ready with the Linux uh, virtual machine on top of Windows, let's understand what happens when we get into that uh, virtual machine. Uh, if you are using uh, uh, Linux based desktop directly, you should be able to log in and the interface will be similar to what I am going to use for the demonstrations. First, let's confirm the uh, uh, virtual machine which we are going to connect by running wsl-l-v. You can see that there is only one uh, virtual machine which is set up using Ubuntu-20.04 distribution. Uh, it is default, you can see star here. I, it is important to observe this if you have multiple virtual machines. If you just say WSL, it will connect to the default uh, virtual machine that is set up using uh, respective distribution. Now we should be able to run. It will take care of logging in into the virtual machine which was set up earlier. Uh, when it comes to Ubuntu based desktops, when you actually log in, it will take you to the home directory and you might see the uh, graphical user interface. Uh, on uh, Ubuntu based desktops, there will be a terminal. You can open the terminal. Once you open the terminal, uh, the interface will be similar to this. However, you will be in the default home directory of the user, not in this directory. In this case, as this is running on top of Windows, uh, the path with respect to the default directory is a little bit different. Uh, if you actually launch terminal on your Ubuntu based des desktop, then you will be getting into some other directory by default. It is nothing but this one. The interface will be like this if you are using terminal from the Ubuntu based desktop. This is the username, this is the uh, uh, server name, uh, this is the representation for the home directory. Tilde is a special character that is there as part of the keyboard. It represents the home directory of a given user. Uh, this is how the interface will be when you actually use a terminal on top of your Ubuntu based desktop. If you are using Ubuntu based desktop to practice uh, the Linux commands which I am going to demonstrate as part of this course. Uh, 
Now, I will also demonstrate how to get the details about the operating system. For that, there is a command called as uname. You can use it. You can say hyphen a. It will give you the details about the kernel uh, that is being used to set up this uh, uh, virtual machine. Uh, you can actually go through the details. Don't worry to interpret uh, uh, this at this time. For beginners, it is not very important, but you can always rely on this command to understand uh, what is the operating system uh, uh, that is being used uh, when you actually get into any Linux-based uh, systems. It need not be Ubuntu-based ones. There are quite a few other Linux-based uh, operating systems. You can uh, uh, run this command on all those and you should be able to see the details like this. This is a Linux command, not Windows command. If you come out of this and if you run uname hyphen a, it will not work. You can see that uh, it is complaining that there is no such command. You can read the message here. The term uname is not re recognized as the name of a commandlet, which means there is no such command on Windows. But once you get into the Linux based machine, you should be able to run that uname hyphen a and you should be able to get the details about the operating system. This is how you can actually get started with uh, your first command in Linux, uname hyphen a to get the operating system details. Also keep in mind that when you log in, uh, if you are using Ubuntu based uh, desktop or even uh, some other Linux based desktops, it will directly take you to the home directory, not some directory like this. Because this virtual machine is set up using WSL on Windows, it is actually taking us to Windows home directory, not the Linux home directory. To go to the Linux home directory, you can always use CD and you can go to the uh, Linux home directory here, which is nothing but uh, uh, tilde. Tilde is one of the ways to represent the home directory. You can also run pwd command and also uh, you can say echo dollar home. You should be able to get the home directory details. So cd is the command which will take you to the home directory respective of where you are. You can run this command uh, by being in any directory. It will always take you to the home directory. Tilda represents the home directory. PWD gives you the current working directory. As we have ran cd command, as we got into the home directory, when we say PWD, it is giving us the details about the home directory, which is nothing but this one. No matter where you are, if you run this command, it will give the details about what is the home directory for that user. So in this case, to get the home directory details, you should be able to run this command. Uh, this is the home directory for this user. You not only learnt uname in this uh, lecture, you also understood some basics related to CD. And also you have learnt PWD as well as echo with dollar home. We'll actually go through the details about uh, uh, what is this dollar home and all at a later point in time. Uh, don't worry too much if you do not understand completely. That being said, we just get started by running our first few commands. Now let's deep dive further to understand all the basics related to shell commands in Linux. As part of this lecture, let's understand how to get help on Linux commands. Many people tend to use Google, but using Google for learning purpose can be uh, very less productive or it can be counterproductive. You might waste too much of time in uh, Googling around rather than learning. It is very important for you to have structured learning. Also, it is very important for you to refer to official documentation of the tool which is being explored or any technology which is being explored. I follow this pattern not only to learn uh, Linux commands, uh, whether it is shell scripting or Python based programming or Java based programming, I tend to use official documentation more often than Googling around. I use Google very less. That being said, how to get help on Linux commands? Uh, for most of the commands, uh, there is control argument called as hyphen hyphen help or hyphen h. Uh, I will also explain what is a control argument very soon. First, let's pick one command and try to explore how to get help. There is also another way of getting detailed documentation for a given command. Uh, when it comes to the Linux, it is called as man pages. So either you use help or man pages. I will not be focusing on too much related to man pages. It will be overwhelming for the beginners. But using help on top of command will actually give you required information to get started. Let me pick a command called as the ls. I will also use some other commands to actually demonstrate how to get help uh, irrespective of the command which you are going to explore. Uh, I pick ls because ls is the most commonly used command. I will be covering quite a few details related to ls very soon. 
For now, let's focus on how to get help on LS. LS stands for list. It is primarily used to list files and folders on Linux file system. Now, if you wanted to get help on LS, there is a control argument called as hyphen hyphen help. You should be able to use it. You can see the output here. It gives uh, quite a few details about uh, how you can explore this command. Okay, you actually go here. There are quite a few other control arguments. These are all nothing but control arguments which will actually uh, customize the behavior of the output of the command. I will explain what control argument is in detail at a later point in time. For now, just keep in mind that you can actually see the usage of each and every control argument of a given command by just using ls hyphen hyphen help. For some of the commands, you might not get detailed information like this, but for most of the commands, you will get uh, detailed information like this. You should be able to review these things based upon the requirement, and you should be able to uh, use appropriate control arguments, and you can actually get whatever details you are looking for. That being said, uh, ls space hyphen hyphen help is the command to get the help. Uh, keep in mind that when you try to learn uh, uh, shell commands on Linux, uh, you need to make sure after the command you have space. Many people tend to run commands like this. It will fail. Space is very, very important in between. If I say ls space hyphen hyphen help, I'll be able to see the output. Now let's get help on another very important command which we might use very often. It is nothing but grep. So I can say grep and I can say hyphen hyphen help. I should be able to get the uses of grep. I should be able to scroll up here and I should be able to get the help on grep. And these are the different control arguments which can be used to customize the behavior of grep. Also let me use another command. The other command which I'm going to use is nothing but cat. We use cat also very often to preview the data. You can actually say cat. Then hyphen hyphen help. You should be able to get the uses of cat command also. You can see several control arguments that can customize the behavior of cat. Like this, you can explore any command. Make sure you are comfortable in getting the usage by running help command. This will provide you the relevant information for the version which you are going to explore. Uh, it is important from the perspective of any tool which you are going to explore, not just uh, shell commands in Linux. If you are going to learn Python, you should know how to uh, get help for a given function or class using uh, uh, appropriate uh, code in Python, and you should rely on the first-hand information that is provided to you via the official documentation of the Python itself. Uh, just keep in mind that you always refer to the official documentation while learning instead of googling around. It is very, very important. If you just keep on googling around without framing the question properly, you will be wasting a lot of time. As part of this lecture, I will walk you through the details related to files and folders. Most of you might be familiar about it, but it is very important for you to understand from the perspective of uh, Linux as operating system. When it comes to Windows, you typically use it for watching movies, uh, playing songs, uh, uh, take care of required documentation for your projects and all. But when it comes to Linux, especially from the perspective of day-to-day uh, uh, -day usage as uh, uh, engineers, we typically use it for completely other purposes. We might use it to save the files, to process the data in the files. The files can be text files or uh, uh, there can be data in other file formats also. Uh, or you might end up deploying applications and run applications uh, uh, in Linux-based environment. The applications generate logs. You might have to troubleshoot the issues by looking for certain things as part of those logs. Uh, the tasks which you typically perform on Linux is completely different. Now, uh, before actually uh, exploring the commands in Linux, it is very important for you to understand uh, what is a file and what is a folder or what is a directory and you have to take it further. A file is nothing but uh, a text file or mp4 file which contains the song, uh, a docx which is nothing but word document, a pdf which contains uh, pdf related content, uh, it can be a csv file where you might have data, it can be a parquet file, even parquet files contain the data. So files contain uh, either some content uh, such as movie or uh, files might contain only the data. It can be log file where you might have 
the log messages generated by the applications so and so forth as we have understood some basics related to files let's also uh, understand details related to folder a folder is also known as a directory if you are using windows as operating system windows have graphical user interface you should be able to review folders and files using uh, this one this is nothing but file explorer you should be able to click on it and you should be able to see the files and folders in this uh, you don't uh, know whether these are folders uh, or files unless you interpret these icons uh, or you can also check certain properties and you should be able to determine whether these are folders or files you can also go to this folder called as downloads on windows and you should be able to see several files uh, in it if you have downloaded anything into it as of now uh, there are couple of executables such as chrome setup uh, npp 8.3.2 installer and this is nothing but notepad plus plus and also there is a file called as new user credentials.csv so there are few files in this folder a folder can also contain other folders for example if i go to uh, this pc then if i go to c c is nothing but uh, uh, a drive in windows uh, you see there are quite a few folders in it i can go to users folder then i can go to itvst which is my home directory you can see bunch of folders and files in this and now i can actually go to documents as of now documents is empty let me see if there is any folder which contain files let me actually go to uh, favorites i think favorites is also empty favorites have couple of things one folder and one shortcut and this is a shortcut uh, in uh, windows there is a concept of shortcut in linux we call it as soft link now uh, uh, this is about folders and files you see there is a path here c drive users itvst favorites so this is the path for this folder this folder contain a folder and a file a folder is nothing but favorites bar here bing is nothing but a file which is a shortcut to bing application this is how it will look like in windows now when it comes to linux where you will be using uh, command line interfaces like this uh, you need to understand how to get the details about files and folders i will actually walk you through those details as part of the next lecture for now keep in mind that uh, there will be files which you have to deal with and the files uh, are typically text files uh, mp4 files uh, and quite a few other types of files uh, files can be part of folders folders are typically used to organize the files uh, you can actually uh, have other folders in a folder uh, over a period of time you, you will build a hierarchy and you should be able to navigate through all the folders and files whether it is uh, windows as operating system or mac as operating system or linux as operating system that being said we will actually explore all the important commands to deal with files and folders over a period of time in series of lectures in this course at this time we are going through ls which actually gives details about the files before going further with respect to ls let's cover details related to hidden files as part of this lecture i'll get you an overview about hidden files then we'll see how to use the ls command to get the details about the hidden files i'll start with windows and also i will go through the details about hidden files in linux in windows you can actually get your files and folders as part of your graphical user interface that is there as part of your windows operating system by using file explorer if you are using ubuntu based desktop even ubuntu based desktop will have similar icon like this which will facilitate you to access the files and folders using graphical user interface when it comes to mac you will have finder finder will be somewhere here now as part of this file explorer let me go to my home directory i can go to the home directory by actually going to c drive under c drive i should be able to go to users under users i should be able to go to the folder which is named based upon the logged in user which is nothing but itvst in this case i can click on this and i should be able to see list of folders and files in my home directory when it comes to this view this is called as the list view you can change the view by expanding this you can use uh, different views uh, that are available here uh, this is nothing but details view you can also uh, go with small icons then uh, large icons and also extra large icons but the most common uh, view i use is nothing but details this is the one i typically use whether you use mac or linux or windows there will be lot of hidden folders as part of our file system to view the hidden files in windows all you need to do is you have to expand view then click on show 
you will see hidden items and you should be able to click on this and you should be able to see the hidden files and folders in this uh, uh, folder. As we have enabled hidden folders, no matter which folder you go into, you should be able to see the hidden folders and files. You can actually say view, show, you can see that it is highlighted. Uh, as hidden items is highlighted, if there are any hidden folders or files in this uh, downloads folder, you should be able to see those things. Let me go to my home directory and you can see there are quite a few hidden folders and files uh, which were not uh, visible earlier. Uh, for example, app data was not visible earlier. Now you can see app data here. Same is the case with ntuser.dat. To confirm whether uh, this is hidden file or folder uh, or not, you can actually disable hidden items. Uh, when it comes to app data, you can see that there is grayed out uh, with respect to the icon compared to this. This is bold yellow, this is grayed out yellow. Now you can actually go to view and then show and then uh, deselect hidden items. Now you will not be able to see the hidden folders and files in this location. Both ntuser.dat and also uh, app data are gone. Uh, this is how you should be able to uh, go through the details about hidden folders and files in Windows. Now you have graphical user interface and you should be able to use this option of view, show and hidden items to see hidden files and folders. But when it comes to Linux, you are using this black screen. How to get the details about hidden files and folders? We'll actually go through those details as part of the next lecture. Uh, once I run the command uh, that actually gives us hidden folders and files, I will actually go through the details of hidden folders and files in Linux. I'll go through the details in Linux after covering the command which actually gives us the hidden folders and files. It is again ls command with specific argument. Let's go to the details about how to get details about hidden files and folders in Linux using ls command with specific control argument. At this time we are going through the details about ls command to list files and folders in Linux. ls is the most commonly used Linux shell command. So far we have gone through the arguments such as l, r, t and s. Uh, when it comes to S, it is capital S. Now let's go to the details about ls command to see the hidden files and folders in Linux. First let me go to the home folder. I am using cd command to actually go to the home folder. No matter in which folder you are, you can always use cd command to go to the home folder. Now I am in the home folder. Uh, home folder is represented by tilde. You can also confirm by saying pwd. Uh, it actually confirms that you are in slash home slash dgadaraju. For any given user, the typical home folder is nothing but this, this one. In some environments, they might customize, but typically you will see this behavior. Now, the requirement is we want to see hidden files and folders in this home directory. If I say ls-ltr, we'll be able to see the files and folders in this location. Uh, we'll not be able to see hidden files and folders. Let's see how we can explore appropriate control argument to get the details about hidden folders and files using ls command. Once again, we can actually go to the output of ls-help. In this case, we are talking about hidden or hidden files and folders. All we need to do is just say control f. Then you should be able to search for hidden. But there is no details with respect to hidden. So we will not be able to uh, get documentation uh, based upon hidden keyword. We have to go to the control arguments one at a time. Now, when it comes to hyphen A, it is saying do not ignore entries starting with dot. This is significant. Uh, even though there is no specific information related to hidden, it is saying it will not ignore entries starting with dot. When it comes to Linux, any file or folder which starts with dot is considered as hidden. So in this case, if you don't want to ignore those entries which starts with a dot, uh, you have to use hyphen a or hyphen hyphen all, which means you will be able to see the hidden files and folders. It is very important for you to interpret this to understand how to get details about hidden folders and files in Linux using ls command. Now let's uh, go to the terminal. As part of the terminal, let me actually say ls hyphen a. First let me run ls command. When I run ls command, you can see all the folders and files. There are uh, 12 of them or 14 of them actually. You can see in each line we have 7 entries. 
there are two lines which means there are 14 files now if i say ls a you see there are quite a few additional files and folders uh, you can see dot aws dot cache dot local these are all folders as part of your environment you might not be seeing these many but in my case i'll be seeing these many and there is a reason for that i don't want to get into those details but you will definitely see more than the 14 files or folders or whatever you see uh, under ls you will see a lot more details when you say ls a you will see quite a few hidden folders and files you can see all the uh, entries that are not visible earlier have dot in them and when it comes to hyphen a it also include dot and dot 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 and dot dot are nothing but uh, present working directory and parent directory to list the details about these files and folders you can actually say ls hyphen la or al you can use either of them now you are able to get additional details as well you can see all the additional details here let me actually scroll up a little bit here to go through the output uh, now you can see the output with additional details now i should be able to sort these with uh, t to sort the data in ascending order by time for that i can say ls hyphen lat or alt both will uh, give us the same output now the files are sorted in descending order by time you can see the oldest uh, folder or file at the bottom which is nothing but the parent folder for this uh, current folder which is nothing but slash home slash d gadaraju the parent folder for that is nothing but slash home these are the details related to the slash home uh, now if you wanted to reverse the uh, order of the files by time then you have to use ls space hyphen altr you can see that the output is sorted in uh, reverse order you can see the latest file at the bottom the present working directory which is represented by dot uh, is the one which came at the bottom uh, this is how you should be able to reverse if you wanted to sort the data by size you just have to say ls hyphen a l s r earlier it was a l t r now it is a l capital s r now the uh, files are sorted or for files and folders are sorted by size if you want to reverse you can actually uh, use r already it is reversed the largest one came at the bottom if you want to get the smallest one at the bottom you just have to remove r now you can see that the smallest files came at the bottom this is how you should be able to get details related to hidden files and folders keep in mind that the files or folders which starts with dot are considered as hidden in linux if you want to list those files and folders you have to use control argument minus a or hyphen a a stands for all it is also alias for hyphen hyphen all so far we have gone through quite a few details related to ls command in the pursuit of listing files and folders in linux when we actually start uh, going to the details about hyphen h uh, we started seeing the output uh, by saying k m etc uh, now if you are from computer science background or if you have some experience in it you should be able to interpret this easily but if you are not from computer science background then you might not be able to interpret these details it is very very important for you guys to understand what uh, these actually mean and how these numbers are converted to this uh, to make it human readable now when it comes to computers uh, the sizes are actually referred like this it can be bytes bytes uh, is the lowest one then kilobytes then megabytes then uh, gigabytes then terabytes then petabytes etc and then it continues these are the things that you see as part of the sizes of the files when it comes to our day-to-day -day usage on our systems when we actually review the size of our uh, images or pictures they will be typically in kilobytes when it comes to the uh, uh, audio songs they might be in megabytes when it comes to large video uh, files uh, the files will be in gigabytes uh, but you don't see any files which are in uh, terabytes or petabytes as part of our day-to-day -day usage using our mac or windows based desktops However, when we start working on the projects, 
you might hear these terms a little bit more often uh, terabytes and petabytes it is important for you to understand these terms so that you can communicate effectively with uh, other key stakeholders when it comes to our uh, it projects that being said uh, below bytes there is also uh, something called as bits however we don't use bits that often a byte is nothing but 8 bits okay uh, the relationship between byte and bit is nothing but uh, 8 bits constitute one byte now when it comes to kilobytes it is close to 1000 that's why they call it as kilobytes but uh, it is actually 1024 bytes uh, make it kilobytes so in this case let me actually comment this and hit enter so 1024 bytes implies kilobytes kilobytes uh, is also known as kbs now when it comes to megabytes 1024 kilobytes uh, is nothing but megabytes then 1024 megabytes is nothing but gigabytes then 1024 gigabytes is nothing but terabytes then 1024 terabytes is nothing but petabytes so when it comes to uh, representing megabytes in bytes you need to multiply 1024 with 1024 again whatever number that comes up is nothing but uh, megabytes uh, uh, in bytes that being said now let me open the calculator here So 1024 times 1024. So these many bytes is nothing but one megabytes. Then 1024. These many bytes is nothing but one gigabyte. That being said, now if you take this number, 11327417, and if you try to divide by 1024, you will get the size in kilobytes. Let me clear the uh, calculator here. Then say 1132. 7417 if you divide by 1024 it is nothing but 11061 kilobytes uh, again if you divide by 1024 whatever number uh, you will get will be the uh, megabyte size let me divide this by another 1024 so it is close to 10.8 megabytes so this is nothing but uh, very close to 10.8 megabytes it is rounded off to 11 megabytes that's why you are seeing uh, 11m for this file called as nyc underscore 2015.txt.gz when it comes to representation of this file in bytes it is nothing but this number this is the size of the file in bytes this is the size of the file in megabytes now, uh, if you look at this, instead of saying half MB, it is saying 508 KB, which means it is 508 kilobytes. Uh, the actual representation of 508 kilobytes in bytes is nothing but 519,586. You can actually divide this uh, by uh, 1024. It will be close to 508. That is how the details are printed like this when we use uh, h to get the output in readable format uh, this is a lot more meaningful once you understand what these uh, m k g etc uh, otherwise uh, it is as not meaningful as this one you really need to understand what these actually mean so that you understand why they call it as human readable that being said this is a primer related to the sizes of the files uh, also make sure you are familiar with these terms called as bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, etc. You can actually go through the size of your uh, uh, mp4 files. Uh, they can be songs or large videos. You can also go through the size of the images to understand whether they are in kilobytes or in megabytes or in gigabytes sizes. Uh, make sure you do that exercise so that you really get used to these terms. At this time, we are going through the details about filtering the output of ls command uh, to get the names filtered by name with respect to files and folders. That being said, it will be incomplete if we do not cover some of the additional commands in the perspective of filtering output. Let's go through the details about important command called as grep 
For now, I will show the basic uses of grep. Then we'll see how to integrate LS and grep with piping. I'll cover details about piping as part of the next lecture. Then we'll see how to build solutions by combining LS and grep at a later point in time in the process of filtering the output of LS. Make sure you also understand some of the nuances with respect to grep. We'll explore grep in detail in some other sections. For now, let's go to the basic overview of grep. Then we'll actually get into the details about filtering the output of LS command we'll also see how to leverage grep to perform some advanced filtering. That being said, to understand more about grep, let me go to this folder called as RetailDB, which is there as part of my data folder. Now, if I run ls-ltr command to list the files and folders, it have actually displayed the output, which contains six folders. All of these are nothing but folders. Now, let me get into the orders folder. Now, if I say ls-ltr, you see there is a file called as part-50. If you haven't set up the dataset, you also can use something called as etc password. Let me actually say tail. Tail is the command which will facilitate us to preview the last few lines in a file. Either we can say orders, which will actually display last few lines from orders. Actually, the file name is not orders. That's why it failed. The file name is part hyphen five zeros. It is there as part of the orders folder. Now you can see last few lines as the output. This is the behavior of the tail command. If you do not have this dataset, you can also use with respect to exploring grep. This will be there in almost all the Linux based systems, be it Ubuntu, Red Hat, CentOS, etc. It is nothing but slash etc slash passwd. Pass wd. You can see last few lines of uh, uh, pass wd here. Now let's explore grep command on top of this. This will be there on top of all Linux based systems. The syntax will be like this. You can say grep. You can specify the string using which you wanted to filter. Grep is primarily used to filter data in the file. It can also be used to filter the output. We will see how to filter the output using grep at a later point in time. For now, to understand how to use grep to filter the data in the file for a particular string, first we have to specify grep like this. You can also use grep hyphen hyphen help to get the uses of it. There are quite a few options. You can actually go through it if you are interested. But you can actually say grep. First, let's uh, use the tail once again. Let's uh, say I want to search for lines which contain color in them. Or let's uh, say we would like to see the details related to some other uh, string. Probably no login. No login will be there on almost uh, all the system's uh, etc password file. So let's see if there are any lines which contain no login in them. The way you can uh, achieve it is like this. Grep, which is the main command. Then the string which you want to search as part of the file or data in the file. We can say no login. Now you should be able to specify the path of the file. Uh, you can either use a relative path or fully qualified path. In this case, I'm actually using fully qualified path or absolute path. Now you can see it have displayed all those lines which have no login in them. You can scroll up and you should be able to review the output. It uh, only displays all those lines which have no login in them. Let me move a little bit up. You see now, all the lines contain no login in them. That is the purpose of grep, primarily to filter uh, based on a string against the data in the file that is passed. Now, you should be able to use different variations of grep to customize the behavior of the grep command. We will cover those details at a later point in time. This section is not related to grep. This section is primarily related to filtering the names of the files and folders uh, which are generated using ls command. To understand how to use grep in case of some advanced requirements, we have explored grep at a very higher level. We'll be using it in the process of filtering the output of the ls command at a later point in time. However, we have covered uh, the basic uses of grep. If you want to uh, filter for a particular string in a file, this is how it will look like. Grep, then the string which you want to search, then slash etc slash password, which is nothing but fully qualified or absolute path of the file. And we are able to see the output here. Before going further and understand how to filter the output of the ls command by using certain uh, scenarios along with using grep, uh, let's re-emphasize on grep a little bit so that you are really comfortable about it. We have already searched for a string called as no login in slash etc slash password. Now let's use the part hyphen five zeros file under orders. You can check the file name by running ls hyphen ltr. You can see the file here. Now you should be able to say tail then part hyphen five zeros, and you can see last few lines. Now, if you want to use grep on top of it, and if you want to get all those lines which contain complete in them, this is how you can actually search. You can say grep complete, then part hyphen five zeros, 
and you can see the output here the file contain 68883 records and uh, there are quite a few records which contain complete in them you will see all the output here in case if you want to just get a number of lines that are generated because of this command you can pipe it to something called as wc-l don't worry too much about piping and wc-l at this time just practice so that you understand how to get the count of these lines you can say pipe pipe is nothing but a character which is above enter uh, in your keyboard you just have to hit shift and then that key that key contain two characters one is backward slash and another one is pipe to get the pipe you have to hit shift and that key now you can see the pipe here now you should be able to say wc hyphen l wc stands for word count if you want to consider each line as a word and if you want to get the count you can use this wc hyphen l now the output of the grep command will be pipe to wc command and you should be able to see the output so there are 22899 uh, lines in this file which contain complete in them let me reiterate the syntax of the grep command it is nothing but grep which is nothing but the main command then the string which you want to search from the file which contain data with uh, this pattern then you can actually specify the path of the file it can be relative path like this or it can be fully qualified path also once you run this you should be able to see the output which matches this criteria in the file now if you wanted to uh, get only those lines which not only contain complete but also uh, closed let's first see if we have lines with closed for that i'm saying grep then closed let me remove wc hyphen l so that we can see the output and confirm that it actually displays the lines which have closed in them now i can actually go to here and remove complete then say closed hit enter you can see that there are bunch of lines which have closed in them we can actually pipe the output to another command called as wc hyphen l to get the number of lines which contain closed you can see that there are 7556 lines which contain closed now if you want to get all those lines whether they contain complete or closed then we have to improvise on top of it grep facilitates a simpler way to actually even perform all conditions to actually get the desired output so in this case you just have to say circular brackets like this and then pipe here then complete now we can hit enter there is syntax issue i think we have to escape these characters or we can actually use something called as egrep even egrep did not work let me try and closing in double quotes it might work if not we'll fix it now we can see all those lines which have either complete or closed in them the command which i have used is nothing but this one egrep not grep then closed pipe complete with circular brackets all this uh, is enclosed in double quotes then the uh, relative path of uh, the file name you can also use fully qualified path of the file name here when it comes to egrep it is nothing but enhanced or extended version of grep it will facilitate us to perform some advanced operations using some of the regular expression type of uh, concepts and you should be able to see the results as per the requirements now let's take care of a couple of other scenarios so that we are comfortable with grep or egrep here also we should be able to get the line count by saying wc hyphen l again we piped the output to wc hyphen l command so there are 30455 lines which contain either complete or closed in them let's perform couple of additional tasks to see the power of grep again we are still covering the basics only the actual uh, details related to grep will be covered in a dedicated section we'll be going through quite a few details with respect to grep that being said for now we can say grep let's say i want to see all those lines which contain pending in them whether it is in upper case or lower case it doesn't matter in this case if i just say grep pending and if i pass the file path you can see that it haven't returned anything because all the strings are in upper case that's why it haven't returned anything here now if i say hyphen i i stands for insensitive case insensitive so it will actually match without considering the case now if i say grep hyphen i you can see that there are quite a few lines which contain pending in them you should be able to get the count by saying pipe wc hyphen l and you can see that there are 22640 records which contain pending in them however uh, there are multiple strings with pending one is pending second one is pending underscore payment so and so forth now let's say i want to get only those lines which contain pending but not anything after pending after pending there is end of line character end of line is represented by dollar in linux uh, don't worry if you could not digest at this time 
but keep in mind that dollar represents end of line. So in this case, I can say grep hyphen i pending dollar and then I can actually run like this. You can see the output says only 7610. If I remove pipe and wc hyphen l, you can see that it have returned only those lines which have pending at the end. After pending, there is no other string. As of now, after pending, there are no additional characters except for the new line character or end of line character. Dollar represents end of line character and we are able to search for those lines which ends with pending. This is how you should be able to take care of matching with end of line characters. Even we should be able to take care of matching with beginning line of characters so and so forth. We'll go through those additional details when we actually talk about grep in depth. For now, I just want to show some of the basics related to grep and also power of the grep. That's why I have taken few examples and demonstrated some of the abilities of grep. Now, We'll get into filtering the output of ls command. There are multiple ways to do so. When it comes to advanced filtering, we have to pipe to grep. We'll get into the details about how to use grep on top of ls output by using piping and we'll perform advanced filtering as well.
At this time, we are going through the details about filtering files and folders in a Linux file system. To perform filtering, we should be familiar with pattern matching. As part of this lecture, let's understand the basics of pattern matching. Keep in mind that using regular expressions, we should be able to achieve advanced pattern matching as well. But before getting into those details at a later point in time, for now, let's focus on simple pattern matching, which comes very handy with respect to filtering files and folders based upon certain patterns in their names. One of the common pattern is nothing but having any string. It is nothing but star. Let me show you an example. So in this case, when I say ls hyphen ltr, you can see that there are quite a few folders in it. Let's say I wanted to get all those files where there is a dot in it. It can be files or folders. I just wanted to see all those where there is a dot in it. There can be a string before dot and also after the dot. So the pattern is any string dot any string. To achieve that, we can say ls hyphen ltr star dot star. Now you see, we are able to see only one file, which is nothing but readme.md. I can also get into one of the folders here, return underscore db. Let me actually say ls hyphen ltr. There are quite a few folders. Let me use some other folder rather than this one. Let me go to nysc underscore all. Now let me say ls hyphen ltr. Now let me get into nyc underscore data folder. Now let me say ls hyphen ltr. You see there are quite a few files here. Let's say I want to get all those files which are before 2000. For that I should be able to say nyc underscore 1 star or 19 star. Either of them will work for that example. I can actually say nyc underscore 19 star. You can see the files that are there before uh, nyc underscore 2000. These are the files that are related to these years 97, 98 and 99 in uh, 20th century. That being said, this is a very basic way of using patterns. However, there are quite a few other patterns also. For example, let's say I would like to get the files with only two characters in between after nyc underscore 19, then dot, then whatever string that is there. So I should be able to say ls hyphen ltr nysc underscore 19 uh, to match one character we should be able to use question mark so this will be matching one character it can be anything here then another question mark another character which can be anything then we can actually say dot then star if you want to get those files with some extension after two characters after nysc underscore 19 now you see you are able to get these three files this is how you should be able to leverage pattern matching to filter the files. We'll be seeing quite a few examples as we go along. For now, I have given overview about pattern matching as part of this lecture. Now, let me actually go back to the data folder, cd dot dot to go to the parent folder of the nyc underscore data, then slash, then again dot dot to go to the grandparent folder of nyc underscore data, which is nothing but data. Now you can see that we are in the data folder. Let's run ls hyphen ltr. We should be able to see all the folders. If I try to get the list of directories or files which starts with NYSC, we should be able to use this approach. However, as we are applying patterns on top of directories, instead of listing only these two, it will actually go through the contents of these folders and it will display the output based on the names of the folders and files in those folders. Let me run this so that you understand what I'm talking about. As part of NYSC folder, there are two files. One is company list underscore no header dot csv and the one is nysc underscore data dot tar underscore gz. When it comes to nysc underscore all, there are two folders nysc underscore stocks and nysc underscore data. What I'm trying to convey is when we use patterns, if it actually result in folder names, it will actually go through the folders and it will actually display the contents of the folders. This is the behavior when it comes to using ls hyphen ltr command with patterns like this where the patterns are applied on top of folders. Keep in mind that even though I have demonstrated using ls hyphen ltr command, the patterns can be used with several other commands as well. Now, if you wanted to get only the folder names and file names which have nyc in them, one of the ways is to use ls hyphen ltr, then pipe it to grep and as part of the grep, you should be able to filter for particular string. Let me demonstrate here. ls hyphen ltr, then pipe, then grep nysc. Now you can see that it haven't gone into these folders to get the file names and folders. It have just listed these folders. Even if there are files in this folder with nysc in them, it will actually show even those files. 
this is how you should be able to get started with pattern matching we'll be using uh, quite a few examples over a period of time where you will see quite a lot of uh, usage of pattern matching at this time we are going through the details about filtering files and folders in linux file system we are actually seeing quite a few examples using a very important command called as find so far we have gone through the details about finding the files based upon type such as directory file etc and also based upon patterns on top of files as well as folders now it is time for us to explore few more options where we should be able to filter for files based upon size as well as uh, modified time but before going through those details let's get an overview about some important directories which we typically see in linux they are nothing but slash tmp then slash etc then slash var especially slash var slash log let me walk you through the details about these important folders there are quite a few others but these are uh, some of the most important ones that being said let me hit uh, enter here as there is a hash it will not run anything it is just a comment in linux first let's go to the slash tmp folder for that we should be able to use cd slash tmp almost all the users on a linux server will have access to the slash tmp now i'm in the slash tmp i can run lsf and ltr command to actually look at folders and files here any user can actually write uh, into this folder without too many restrictions one of the common uses with respect to slash tmp is nothing but to share the files between the users the users can use this as a scratch pad they can temporarily copy the files here even if they do not delete the administrators will automatically delete at regular intervals so slash tmp is one of the common folder which is widely used across the system by many users the next folder is nothing but slash etc let me get into the slash etc folder i might not have a cd permission on that in this case i have now let me run ls hyphen ltr you can see there are quite a few folders and files depending upon the software is installed there might be quite a few configuration files in this location typically for each and every software that is installed there will be a folder in this for example you can see that there is something called as postgresql hyphen common the configuration files related to postgresql might be in this folder let me get into this folder let me say cd postgresql hyphen common now i am in that folder now let me run ls hyphen ltr you can see four files in this this is also widely used uh, path and it will help in troubleshooting certain issues with respect to the applications that are running on linux based systems that being said another important folder is nothing but var especially in that folder there is a folder called as log every user of linux system should be familiar about this folder for each and every application that is running on this system typically there will be log files there will be a subfolder in this as part of that subfolder there will be log files for example i have installed postgresql in this there is a folder for postgresql i should be able to get into this folder to see the logs related to postgresql now let me go to postgresql here let me run ls hyphen ltr command you can see there is a log file in your case you might not see this folder uh, because you might not have installed postgresql you can install and you should be able to see the folder the way you can install postgresql is like this let me actually say cd let me say sudo s u hyphen root let me enter the password you need to enter the right password that is used while setting up the linux based system that being said now i have logged in as root once you are logged in as root as this is ubuntu based system you should be able to run apt update it will take care of updating the lists related to apt repositories once the lists are updated then you should be able to install postgres saying apt install postgres sql server it will take care of installing postgres for you the way you can run is like this let me search for apt install actually it is apt install postgres sql not postgres sql server this is how you should be able to install in this case i have already installed and hence it might not install anything but in our case it might install uh, actually i might have uninstalled after installing that's why it is installing again but the log files are still there even though i have uninstalled now you have understood how to install software such as postgresql on ubuntu using apt commands once postgresql is installed then you should be able to see the folders under both slash etc as well as slash var slash log with respect to postgresql now let me go to slash var slash log in this case i have logged in as root now let me run ls hyphen ltr once you install you should be able to see the folder like this 
you can get into the folder then run ls-ltr command like this you should be able to see the log files re related to PostgreSQL. no matter which software you install in most of the cases you'll be finding a folder under where log that folder will have the log files associated with that software that being said as we have understood the relevance of some of the important folders in linux let's go back to the find command we'll be using these folders to actually experiment around find command especially based upon timestamp that way you will be comfortable using find command in real case scenarios at this time we are going through the details related to processing data in files using linux commands before getting into the actual commands which can be used to process the data let's get an overview about file formats we actually see different types of files in our windows based systems they are nothing but mp4 for videos or mp4 for audios jpeg or png for images we'll also see files with extensions such as docx pdf xlsx pptx so and so forth docx is for word docs pdf for adobe pdfs pptx for microsoft powerpoints or google powerpoints so and so forth Keep in mind that the file formats such as pptx, docx, pdf, etc. are nothing but binary file formats. They are not text file formats. Also, we see uh, files which contain plain text without any images and all. Typically, the extensions for such files are nothing but txt, csv, tsv, etc. These are nothing but text files. When it comes to text files, there are different types of specialized text file formats. They are nothing but JSON. JSON is a specialized text file format. Also, we have uh, files with uh, CSV where we will be having delimited records in the file. Uh, I'll actually go through the details uh, in a moment, but these are different types of file formats which we deal with. Now, when it comes to processing data in files using Linux commands, we typically deal with uh, text files only. However, as part of the text files itself, there are a wide variety of files. They are nothing but JSON files, CSV or TSV or PSV, so and so forth. CSV stands for comma separated, TSV stands for tab separated, PSV stands for pipe separated, etc. These are all nothing but delimited text files. Now, as part of data folder, let me go to the data folder here. There is a folder called as retail underscore db. Let me go to retail underscore db. There are several folders in this folder. They are nothing but customers, categories, order items, departments, orders, products, etc. In each of these folders, there are files. Now let me say ls ltr star. It will actually go through the folders and it will list the files in those folders. You can see that there are no extensions for these files, but these are all text files only. Uh, the data in these text files are nothing but delimited records. Let me open one file and let me walk you through. In this case, I'm saying view orders part hyphen five zeros you can see the data in this file this data is actually exported from database tables orders table in the database have four columns order id order date this is nothing but order date order customer id then order status all the values related to those four fields in each and every record are actually separated or delimited by comma here these are nothing but csv files however you can see that there are no extensions for each of these files, there are no extensions. Keep in mind that extensions are only informatory. You can have .txt as extension for this file or .csv or even .mp4, but the file format is still text file format only. Also keep in mind that when it comes to text file format, there are a wide variety of uh, uh, text file formats. Plain text where you'll be having paragraphs uh, with words, then uh, CSV or TSV or PSV or even JSON. Let me actually go to another folder called as retail db json in that also there are six folders if i say ls ltr star i should be able to see all the files in these folders now if i open one of these files by saying view then uh, customers then the file name you can see json records in this each line is nothing but a valid json record so this is nothing but a specialized text file where each and every line is nothing but a valid json record that being said this is a quick overview about different file formats keep in mind that we'll not be able to open files with pdf or docx or excel or powerpoint etc using view commands like this if you try to open you will be seeing all binary characters you will not be seeing plain text in it those files can only be used with respect to softwares if it is mp4 we have to use a media player if it is docx we have to use microsoft word or google word if it is pptx we have to use either google slides or microsoft powerpoint if it is uh, some other uh, binary file format we need to find appropriate tool to actually open those files but when it comes to 
uh, using Linux as operating system, we typically deal with text files. Some of the text files are nothing but JSON, TXT or text, CSV, TSV, PSV, and also log. Log is also very, very important. They are also text files only. However, each and every record will be of uh, standard log format. Now let me go to var log folder and let me go to Postgres init. Now let me say ls ltr, there's a file in it. If I open this file, you should be able to see the log messages here. However, there are no log messages at this time. Let me look at some other file. Let me say ls ltr on var log itself. You can see there is a file by name dpkg.log. Let me actually say tile dpkg.log to see how the log messages are in this file. You see, there is a timestamp and then there are few details related to whatever have happened in the system. Typically, as part of the log files, we will find log messages in one format or the other format. So this is how you can actually get started with file formats. As we have understood different file formats, now let's explore a command which actually gives us the details about the file format. We'll be going through those details as part of the next lecture. At this time, we are going through the details about processing data in files using Linux commands. In the earlier lecture, we have gone through the details related to overview of different file formats. Keep in mind that the extensions for the files are optional and also they are just informatory. They doesn't mean that the files are actually of that file format. In this lecture, we'll actually go through the details about file. File is a command which will actually give us the details about which type of file format it is in many cases. Irrespective we have extensions or not, we should be able to figure out the format of the file by using file command. That being said, let's prove that the extensions are just informatory. In this case, I'm saying vi testing.mp4. The extension is mp4. Now I have opened using vi editor. Now I'm just typing something in this. Now I saved and came out of it. Let me say ls ltr. You can see that there is a file by name testing.mp4. Now, if it is a real mp4 file, when we run comments such as cat or tail or head, it will actually show garbled binary characters. But as it is text file under the hood, when you use comments such as cat, it will actually display the contents of the file without any issues. And this is the content which you have entered in this file. The extensions are just informatory. It doesn't mean that this file is actually of type mp4. So how to get the format of the file in Linux? There's a command called as file. Using that uh, file command, we should be able to get the type of the file or format of the file. In this case, I can say file, then testing.mp4. You can see that the file is of type ASCII text. This is how you should be able to use the simple command called as file and you should be able to get the format of the file. Now let me delete this file. Let's say file hyphen hyphen help to get the usage of file command. I have just used a simple file command. You can actually see that there are quite a few other options related to file command. Let me scroll up a little bit here. You can see other options. I figured out how to navigate through this using this arrow instead of scrolling using this scroll bar and I'm able to go up without any issues and hence I might not be using Jupyter in future. That being said, you can actually go through these details and understand what these options are for. One of the important option is nothing but hyphen f or hyphen hyphen files from. You can actually have a file in which you can specify the paths of the file and using that file you should be able to get format of the files. This is one way to get the formats of the files for different files in one shot. Also, we should be able to use find command and use exec, pass the output of the find command to exec and you should be able to invoke file and you should be able to get the formats of the file. Let's go through the details so that you understand what I'm talking about here. First, let me actually scroll till the end. Let me hit control L so that the screen is cleared. Now the screen is cleared. Now I should be able to go to retail DB folder. In the retail DB folder, there are several other folders. You can see the folders here. Let's say file and let's specify the folder name and see what happens. You can see that it is telling that it is of type directory. Now let me actually say file orders and then specify the name of the file. In this case, the file doesn't have any extension, but still I'm able to get the type of the file. It is of type CSV text. It actually goes through the data and it actually tell what type of content the file contain. In the similar manner, let me go to retail underscore db underscore json. Now let me say file orders. Then let me specify this file. Let's see what type is it. 
it is nothing but json data which is nothing but text file which contain json data even this one is of type text itself that being said even you can pass mp4 files jpeg files etc you should be able to get the type of the file or format of the file using this file command now let me go up one level uh, by saying cd dot dot i have gone up to the parent directory for retail db json it is nothing but data now let's say i want to get the file format of all the files in retail db json folder or even retail db folder for that i should be able to say find retail underscore db star so that i can actually go through all the folders recursively in both retail db as well as retail db json i would like to check only the files and hence let me say hyphen type f it will give us a list of files you can see the list of files here this file is from retail db orders part hyphen five zeros this file is from retail db json orders then part then whatever is the name of the file now i should be able to use exec on top of it like this then say file file is the command which actually gives us the type of the file or format of the file now i can actually say curly braces like this then plus then semicolon hit enter now you see it have actually given the details about format of each and every file which is returned by this command for all these files we are able to get what type of files are they all these files are of type csv text whereas these files are of type json data now let's also run similar command against nyc folders for that i should be able to say find nyc star hyphen type f then hyphen exec file curly braces plus semicolon except for retail db everything else is same retail db is replaced with nysc now let's check the type of each and every file uh, that is there as part of all the folders which starts with nysc you can see the details here this is simple ascii text it also gave us few details about how the lines are terminated when it comes to these files they are of type gzip compressed data you can also check the actual file within the gzip uh, the file is actually this one this is how you should be able to get the details of the files using find command find is quite effective when it comes to checking the types of the files or formats of the files it is very very important for us to understand the format of the file before actually going through using appropriate commands to actually validate the data in the files for example if you wanted to preview the data in the files if it is text files you should be able to use commands such as head tail cat etc if they are non text files such as avro parquet etc first it is better to convert those files into text files then we should be able to preview using commands such as head tail cat etc that being said as we understood how to get format of the file let's go to the details about previewing the data in text files using commands such as tail head cat etc i'll start with head and then i'll walk you through the details about tail and also cat that being said keep in mind that these commands are relevant with respect to reviewing the data in text files only also keep in mind that we should not be using commands such as head tail etc on compressed files first we need to uncompress only when we have text files that are uncompressed then we should be able to use those commands when we talk about text files i am talking about csv txt or uh, text files uh, the files which contain pipe delimited data uh, tab delimited data json data etc even the standard log files can be treated as text files we should be able to leverage commands such as tail head cat etc on top of those log files as well but with respect to other file formats such as uh, pdf docx xlsx pptx etc these commands head tail cat might not be appropriate at this time we are going through the details related to processing data in files using linux commands in that process as part of previous lecture we have seen how to preview the data in the text file using head command now let's explore tail command to preview the data while head gives the number of lines from the beginning tail actually gives the number of lines from the end the simplest form of tail command is like this you can actually say tail in this folder we have a file called as part hyphen 50 so we should be able to specify the file name like this then you should be able to see last 10 lines by default now let's look at the uses of tail command by saying tail hyphen hyphen help now you can see the uses of uh, tail command if you scroll up there are quite a few control arguments to control the behavior of the tail command one of the most frequently used one is nothing but hyphen f i'll actually cover hyphen f as part of the next lecture you can also get specified number of lines by using either hyphen n or hyphen hyphen lines you can pass the number either positive or negative you can also skip this and you should be able to specify the number of lines directly as well for example in this case i can say tail minus 20 
then specify the file name you can see last 20 lines here you can validate by saying tail minus 20 then file name then pipe then wc hyphen l you can see that it have returned 20 lines you can also use hyphen n then you can actually specify the number of lines like this in place of hyphen n you can also say hyphen hyphen lines you can see that it have returned last 20 lines even when i say tail hyphen n 20 we can actually clean up this part and then run it you can see last 20 lines here this is how you should be able to use tail command to preview the data from the bottom of the file it is quite effective to understand how the data is stored in the file that being said in the next lecture let's also review a very important command called as tail hyphen f which will come handy in troubleshooting the issues at this time we are going through the details about processing data in files using linux commands now we are actually talking about tail command one of the important uh, argument with respect to tail command is nothing but hyphen f for that we need to make sure the logs are being generated continuously let's try to set up something called as uh, apache 2 as part of the ubuntu based machine so that when we start using the web server that is being set up using apache 2 it will actually generate logs for us to take care of setting up uh, apache 2 you just have to run app update it will take care of updating the list from which the software can be downloaded as the user that is used to log in is nothing but this one in this case to make sure we run app update successfully we have to use sudo it is primarily to run commands as administrator then we should be able to say apt update like this it will take care of updating all the lists related to apt in this case we have to specify the password related to dgadraju we have set up the username and password when we actually set up this ubuntu based machine now the lists are being updated once the lists are updated then we should be able to install apache 2 by saying sudo apt install apache 2 we'll install once the update is done now the update is done let's say sudo apt install then apache 2 let me hit enter now apache 2 is being installed we need to hit enter so that it will actually take care of installation if you say n it will not install either you can say capital y or y or you can hit enter to actually take care of the installation now apache 2 is being installed once apache 2 is installed then we should be able to start the apache 2 server and then we will see whether the logs are being generated or not now the apache 2 is installed you should be able to validate by saying ls ltr slash etc slash apache 2 you can see here now we should be able to start the apache 2 server by saying sudo system ctl start apache 2 however it is not able to start let me actually say sudo service apache 2 start now you can see that apache 2 is started you should be able to validate by saying sudo service apache 2 status you can see that it is running now you should be able to use http using browser uh, leveraging localhost we should be able to access uh, this apache 2 web application let me go to the browser here in this case i have to open the browser on the windows if you are using ubuntu desktop you should be able to open the browser as part of your ubuntu desktop as well now i should be able to say http colon slash slash 127.0.0.1 now let me hit enter it should launch the apache web server however it is not launching let me validate what is going on here let me open this now let me actually say sudo service apache 2 status it is running we can actually validate by using telnet command first let's confirm whether telnet is set up on this ubuntu based machine or not telnet is set up and hence i should be able to say telnet localhost 80 you can see that apache 2 server is running to make sure the logs are generated you can actually say curl then localhost or http localhost it will take care of generating the logs let's see now you can see that the curl command have worked you should be able to see the output here Keep in mind that this lecture is not about curl command and hence bear with me for now. Don't break your head around curl command. Just use curl command so that you can validate the uh, Apache 2 web application that is started as part of this Ubuntu based machine. Now let's go to the var log. Let me say ls ltr. Let me go to Apache 2 folder. 
now let me say ls hyphen ltr you can see there is a file called as access.log then hit enter you should be able to see the details of this log file there are only two lines in this log file as you run curl command uh, often uh, there should be more logs uh, that will be generated as part of this log file now let me run curl command once again now let me actually run tail command on access.log you can see the third entry in the file now it is time for us to explore tail hyphen f command However, before exploring tail hyphen f command, let's come up with a shell script where we'll continuously generate logs by running curl command against http colon slash slash localhost. Let's first take care of the script, then we'll actually get into the details about tail hyphen f command. As part of the sectional model, we are going through the details about processing data in files using Linux commands. At this time, we are exploring tail command to preview the data. Already, we have seen some basic uses of tail and also we have set up something called as Apache 2 web server so that we can explore advanced argument called as hyphen f to actually preview the log files in the process of troubleshooting the issues. We have not only set up the Apache 2 web server, we have also come up with a script called as run underscore apache2.sh which will actually trigger curl command every one second which will internally generate a log message in the access.log file associated with the Apache 2 web server. The location for the access.log is nothing but this one where log Apache 2 then you have the access.log. You can see the access.log here. As of now, it is being refreshed every one second because of the script run underscore apache2.sh which is triggered using nohub with sleep using one second. Now, either you can actually run tail command like this to see the new messages that are being generated multiple times. In this case, I'm running tail command multiple times, which can be a little bit counterproductive. If instead of uh, running tail command multiple times, uh, we can actually get the output refreshed very frequently as soon as the log messages are generated. It will be easier for us to actually monitor what is going on as part of this log file. For that, we should be able to use this very important control argument called as hyphen f. Then we can actually say axe.log and hit enter. Now you see it is being refreshed every one second because we are getting messages every one second into this uh, access.log file. It is automatically refreshed. You can also control the number of lines using which you wanted to start with along with hyphen f. Let me say control c to come out of this tail hyphen f command. That is how you can actually come out of the tail hyphen f. Otherwise, it will just keep on refreshing for us. Now, to make sure we start with 20 lines or 30 lines, we can actually say tail hyphen 30, then hyphen f, then access.log. I think it is just tail 30, not hyphen 30. Let me remove hyphen here. Let me hit enter. I think there is some issue with respect to the way the number of lines are passed. Let me say tail hyphen hyphen help to see the usage. Now let me scroll up a little bit here. It is hyphen n 30. You can say tail hyphen n 30, then hyphen f, then access.log, hit enter. Now you see it has started with 30 lines, then every second as the log messages are generated in access.log, it is refreshed on the screen. So if there are any errors and all, you should be able to monitor and you can actually uh, take care of troubleshooting the issues. This is how you should be able to use tail with hyphen f along with hyphen n to get started with uh, enough number of lines and then you can actually monitor whether the logs that are being generated have any errors or not. Tail hyphen F is very very effective command in the process of troubleshooting the issues. Make sure you are comfortable with it. Now before going further, let's make sure the nohub job is terminated so that we will not be wasting resources unnecessarily. For that, let me go to the home directory by saying cd. Now we can actually say ps hyphen ef, then grep apache2 because the script which we try to run have apache2 in it. You can actually review the name of the script by saying ls hyphen ltr. You can see that the script name is nothing but run underscore apache2.sh. So we should be able to say ps hyphen ef grep apache2 hit enter. You can see the script here. You should be able to kill this session by saying kill hyphen 95133. It will be gone. If you have given a different name and if you are not able to figure out, one of the ways to figure out whatever process that are being run using the current user is nothing but ps hyphen fu then the username which is nothing but dgadraju hit enter you should be able to see all the scripts that are being run by this user ps hyphen fu is the one which you can leverage you for the user even without passing the username it should work it will just give us the processes that are being run by the current user 
you can see here now you should be able to kill using this pid we just have to say kill hyphen nine five one three three then the session will be gone now if you say tail where log apache 2 then access dot log no more logs are being generated in this file the last one is 11506 it is not changing anymore this is how you should be able to stop the job that is being running in the background using nohub so that the resources are not wasted as we are done with the tail now let's take it further to understand the rest of the topics related to processing files in linux file system at this time we are going through the details about processing data in files using linux commands in previous lectures we have gone through the details about previewing the data using head as well as tail command another command that can be used to preview the data is nothing but more command when head actually gives us first few lines in the file and tail actually gives us the last few lines in the file more actually starts with first few lines in the file however you should be able to preview rest of the data as well by just hitting space continuously it will facilitate us to scroll through the data and preview in continuous fashion it is a very powerful tool to understand the characteristics of the data as long as the data in the file is in text format now when it comes to the more the usage is like this we can actually say more hyphen hyphen help to get the usage of more command you can see that there are quite a few control arguments with respect to more command let's start with the simplest form of more it is nothing but more and then the file name before actually running the more command let me say cd then let me go to data retail underscore db then orders now i should be able to say more and then i should be able to specify the file name you can see that it have actually got as many lines as possible which can occupy the entire screen now you can see that there is a more at the bottom you should be able to hit space and it will actually get next set of lines like this you should be able to go through all the lines in the file in continuous fashion at any point in time if you want to come out you can actually say ctrl c you will be able to come out of the more command now let's again uh, see the usage of the more command by saying more hyphen hyphen help if you want to control number of lines you can actually say more then hyphen then you should be able to specify the number let's say five then we should be able to specify the file name like this this time it will only get five lines at a time you can see that the lines are being scrolled another variation of more command is nothing but these control arguments hyphen c or hyphen p hyphen c will actually take care of not scrolling uh, even hyphen p behave in similar manner however there is subtle difference you don't need to break your head around that either you can use hyphen c or hyphen p to not to scroll but just refresh the output on the screen itself now let me say more then hyphen c then hyphen 5 then part hyphen 5 zeros you can see that first five lines came here if i hit space it is refreshing at the same spot it is not actually scrolling through the data in the file that is the difference between the previous more command and this more command with control arguments such as hyphen c or hyphen p even hyphen p behave in similar fashion let me say hyphen p here then hyphen 5 then part hyphen 5 zeros which is nothing but file name you can see that this time also it is not actually scrolling through the contents of the file it is just refreshing the same file lines again and again this is about more command which is another powerful command to preview the data in the text files once again i'm reiterating whenever you want to come out of the more command you just have to hit ctrl c then you'll be out of the more command as part of this section we are going through the details related to processing data in files using linux commands so far we have gone through the commands such as head tail more etc now it is time for us to explore little bit advanced commands such as cut cut can be used to extract required data from the delimited text files first let's review the file which is there as part of data retail db orders the file name is nothing but part hyphen five zeros you can see that the file contain delimited data now uh, sometimes we would like to extract certain information from these delimited records in those scenarios we should be able to use cut command first let's review the usage of the cut command by saying cut hyphen hyphen help uh, there are quite a few control arguments the most important ones are nothing but hyphen d to specify the delimiter hyphen f to list the fields which you want to get based on the delimiter and also hyphen hyphen output hyphen delimiter so that the output is separated by custom delimiter let's start with hyphen d and hyphen f then we'll also go to the details about hyphen hyphen output delimiter in this case let's say we'd like to get order ids from this data set 
the first field is nothing but order id then comma then order date then comma then order customer id then comma then order status in this case each of these attribute values are actually delimited or separated by comma and hence we should be able to say cut hyphen d comma then hyphen f1 to get the order id 2 to get the order date to get the order customer id 4 to get the order status let's go to the example here cut hyphen d comma is the delimiter hyphen f1 then part hyphen 5 zeros it will actually return order ids if you want to get order date you can actually say hyphen f2 it will return order dates if you want to get order status you should be able to say f4 it will return order status now if you want to get both order id and order status then you should be able to say hyphen f1 comma 4 as part of the output you will actually see the comma as delimiter between these two fields now if you want to customize the delimiter you should be able to say hyphen hyphen output delimiter equal to whatever delimiter you want to use let's say output hyphen delimiter however if you want to use special characters such as semicolon it will not work directly we need to escape in this case you can see that it is struck it is because semicolon is special character when it comes to this command now if i escape and if i say semicolon like this you can see that order id and order status in each line is actually delimited or separated by semicolon you can also specify other delimiters such as space you might have to specify space like this let's say space like this let's see what happens you can see that the values are actually separated by space this is how you should be able to use cut command to extract the data from the delimited files now as we have understood nuances with respect to cut command let's go to the details about another important command which is nothing but sort i'll be covering quite a few details with respect to sort in the subsequent lectures we'll also see details related to unique also we'll see how we can leverage the combination of these commands to get the output as per the requirements at this time we are going through the details about processing data in files using linux commands in the previous lecture we have gone through the details about extracting the data from files in linux using cut command now it is time for us to explore another very important command called as sort let's look at the usage of sort command by saying sort hyphen hyphen help you can see that sort have quite a few control arguments we'll be exploring uh, quite a few of them to understand the behavior of the sort command sort is very useful and hence i'll be covering sort in multiple lectures when it comes to the simple usage of sort it is like this you can just say sort and you should be able to specify the file name it will automatically sort the data based upon some default behavior let's understand the default behavior and we'll take it further so let me say sort and let me specify the file name part hyphen five zeros you can see that data is actually alphanumerically sorted by default as it is alphanumerically sorted the last record is 9999 then comma then blah 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 if you go up before nines it actually got eights then sevens so and so forth even though the first field in this data is numeric the data is automatically sorted in the form of alphanumeric values in case if you want to sort this data numerically then you should be able to use control argument called as hyphen n let me say sort hyphen hyphen help let me scroll up here let's go to the details with respect to hyphen n you can see here hyphen n stands for numeric sort also there is something called as human numeric sort which is hyphen h or hyphen hyphen uh, human numeric sort but we typically use hyphen n or numeric sort itself in this case i can actually say sort hyphen n then part hyphen five zeros make sure you uh, look through the output now you can see that data is actually sorted in ascending order by numeric values the 68883 is the largest order id that's why we got the record with the 68883 at the bottom as we have said sort hyphen n you can also reverse the sorting by using hyphen r let me say hyphen r here you can see that data is being sorted in reverse numerical order you can see that the least order id came at the bottom this is how you should be able to sort the data using several control arguments to get the expected behavior we have gone through the simple sort command and also we have explored hyphen n to get data sorted in a numeric fashion also we have gone through the details about hyphen r where it can reverse the sorting behavior now we might also want to sort the data based upon certain field in this data we will go through those details as part of the next lecture we will see how to sort the data 
based on order date or order customer ID or order status. There is a way to do so. We'll go through those details in the next lecture. Keep in mind that using these commands such as sort, cut, etc., the files will be untouched. In this case, I can actually run tail command on part hyphen five zeros. You can see that last 10 lines are as is. It haven't touched any data in the file. The files will not be updated. You can also run ls hyphen ltr. The file is not updated in the recent times. This is how you should be able to use sort command. Now let's go to the details about sorting the data based upon particular key. As part of the sectional module, we are going through the details related to processing data in files using Linux commands. In the past few lectures, we have gone through commands such as cut, sort, etc. Now it is time for us to explore unique command to get unique results based upon the input data. Uh, to achieve that, first we need to make sure we have right data set where we can explore unique command in detail. Let's go through the details about using cut command to extract the data we are looking for. We'll redirect the data to a file so that we have required data set to explore unique command. In this case, if I go to data, then if I go to retail DB folder, there is a orders folder. In that we have this file, part hyphen five zeros. You can use tail command like this to preview last few lines to understand how data look like. If you look at one record, the record contain values related to four fields. They are nothing but order ID, order date, order customer ID, then order status. Let's say I would like to get all these statuses from here and write to a file so that we can explore unique command on top of that file. For that, let me go to the home directory. Let me use cut command. We have already seen details related to the cut command. In this case, I can say hyphen D to specify delimiter. The delimiter is nothing but comma. I would like to get the last field, which is nothing but fourth one and hence I have to say uh, hyphen f4. Now I should be able to say data retail underscore db orders then part hyphen five zeros. Uh, this is the relative path for this file from the home directory. Now if I hit enter I should be able to get the order statuses. Now I would like to capture these order statuses into a file. Let me hit up arrow. Then let me use a single greater than symbol. It will take care of redirecting the output into whatever file we are going to specify here. The file need not exist. If the file exists, it will overwrite. If the file doesn't exist, it will create and the content will be redirected to that file. In this case, the content is nothing but output of this command cut hyphen D comma hyphen F4 and then the file name. Now let's say order statuses as the file name. In this case, I'm specifying the file name itself, which means the file name will be created in home directory. Now let me hit enter. Now the content is written to that file. We can preview last few lines by saying tail and then order underscore statuses. You can see the last few lines here. This is how you should be able to extract the information from a given file and redirect the extracted information into a new file. In this case, I have used single greater than so that the data is written to a file. If the file already exists, the file will be overwritten with this output. If not, it will actually create the file and the output will be written to that file. Now it is time for us to explore unique command using this order statuses file. At this time, we are in the process of understanding unique command to get unique results based upon the input data or files. In the previous lecture, we made sure that we have right dataset to explore unique command by extracting the information from a given file into a new file. We have extracted order statuses from the orders dataset. You can actually recollect whatever we have done as part of the previous lecture by seeing the output here. Now let me clear the screen and also let me emphasize that we should be able to leverage the sort command also to actually get the unique results. Let's first explore sort command, then we'll actually get into the details about unique command. To explore sort command from the perspective of getting unique results, let's say sort hyphen hyphen help to see the usage of sort command. One of the option is nothing but hyphen u. You should be able to specify hyphen u and you should be able to get unique values based upon the input data from files. In this case, we have order statuses. Using tail command, you should be able to review the last few lines in the file. You can see that there are duplicates in this file. Now to get unique values, we should be able to say sort hyphen u, then order statuses. You can see the unique values here. This is how you should be able to use sort command to get unique values. You can also use piping and you should be able to use sort hyphen u to actually get the unique values. For example, against orders data set, which is there as part of data retail underscore db, then orders, then part hyphen five zeros. We have extracted the order statuses using cut command. 
let's explore the cut command here. This is the cut command which we have used to actually get order statuses from the above file. So using this file, we are able to get order statuses. You can actually review the output here. Now, if you want to get only unique order statuses, you should be able to pipe this output to sort hyphen u like this. You can see that it have only returned the unique order statuses, which means you should be able to pass the output of one command to sort with hyphen u to get the unique values. Let's use the orders dataset itself and perform another task. In this case, I would like to see the unique dates. Let's preview last few records in orders dataset. In each and every record, the second attribute is nothing but order date. You can see here. Now to extract order dates, we can use the same cut command. In this case, instead of saying hyphen F4, which will actually give us order statuses, we should be able to say hyphen F2 to get order dates. You can see all the order dates here. You should be able to get the number of order dates by saying pipe wc hyphen l. You can see that it have returned 68,083. Now to get unique order dates, I can actually say sort hyphen u like this. It will give us unique order dates. To confirm these dates are unique, you should be able to pipe the output of this command to wc hyphen l. It will give us the number of records that are returned by this command. You can see that there are 364 records only. The original dataset contains 68,083 before sort hyphen u. After sort hyphen u, it have returned only 364 records. This is how you should be able to get unique values using sort hyphen u. We can also use unique command. We'll explore details with respect to unique command as part of the next lecture. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details related to processing data in files using Linux commands. At this time, we are actually talking about dealing with unique values. In the previous lecture, we have gone through the details about how to get unique values using sort hyphen u. Now, it is time for us to explore another important command called as unique. Unique have better features compared to sort hyphen u to deal with unique values. To get the uses of unique, you can actually say u n i q, that is the spelling of unique command, then hyphen hyphen help, you should be able to see the help here. There are quite a few important arguments which you can consider when it comes to dealing with unique values. They are nothing but hyphen c or hyphen hyphen count, hyphen i or hyphen hyphen ignore case. There are few others also, but these are the ones which I commonly use. That being said, let's start with simple unique command, then we'll take it further. First, let me preview the data in the file called as order statuses. We have created this file in prior lectures and you can see the last few lines here. Now, you can see that there are quite a few duplicate values, complete actually repeated six times. Then on hold is repeated three times, pending payment is repeated only one time. Now let's see the simple usage of unique, then we'll actually take it further. When I actually pipe the tail output to unique, just to deal with these 10 records, you can see that this command with unique have returned only eight records, whereas the original tail command without unique which is this one, have returned 10 records. If you compare the output, uh, first one is complete, even here first one is complete, the second one is on hold, even here the second one is on hold, the third one is complete here, here also it is complete, the fourth one is on hold, here also it is on hold, but after that there are three completes, whereas there is only one complete. So the default behavior of unique is, it will not sort the data, it will just skip duplicates when they are side by side. If you have only two unique values, but if they are not repeated immediately, then the unique will actually yield the same results as its original data. That being said, to actually make sure you get unique values, you might have to sort the data first and then run unique. Unique works well when data is pre-sorted. When data is pre-sorted, it need not sort the data. The performance will be better. That's why they have implemented the functionality in that manner. However, if the data is not pre-sorted, then you have to sort the data first. Then you have to pass the output to unique so that you get unique results. That being said, in this case, let's say wc hyphen l order statuses. You can see that there are 68,083 order statuses in it. There are quite a few duplicates in this file. Now. Let's use unique, then let's say order statuses. You can see that there are quite a few repetitions, but if I pass the output to wc hyphen l, at this time we got only 55,096 values. In this case, the duplicates which are side by side are eliminated and only one value is presented. Now, if you want to get only the unique values, 
you can actually say sort order statuses then unique you can see that you got unique values here you can also use wc hyphen l to see the number of records you can see that it have returned nine now you can also use unique hyphen c hyphen c or hyphen hyphen count to get the count if you just say unique hyphen c then order statuses you can review the output here uh, we got the order status and the count however the duplicates are eliminated only when they are side by side the data is not sorted before applying the unique logic now i should be able to say sort order statuses then unique hyphen c now you can see the output with order statuses along with respect to count of that status in this case as part of this data set there are 22899 completes 7556 closed so and so forth this is how you should be able to use unique hyphen c to get not only unique values but also counts related to those unique values however unique will not sort the data you need to make sure that data is pre sorted before applying unique on top of it now if you want to sort the data based on the number of orders in each status we should be able to pipe the output to sort again so let's say sort you can review the output here data is sorted by count you can also reverse the count by saying hyphen r like this this is how you should be able to use unique to get the unique values keep in mind that data has to be pre sorted before using unique on top of it you can also use unique hyphen i or ignore case to actually ignore the case while getting the unique values once again i am reiterating that data has to be pre sorted to use unique effectively if you don't pre sort the data you will not be getting unique values globally you will only get unique values where there are duplicates side by side in this short section or module let's get a overview about properties of files and folders already we have seen commands such as ls hyphen l which will give us the details about the files and folders we need to make sure we interpret the information such as this one which is nothing but permissions and also this one which is nothing but owner and also this one which is nothing but group we'll cover the details related to owners groups and others and also we'll actually get into all the details related to the permissions this will be a short section of module where we'll be emphasizing on only the permissions and owners as well as groups of files and folders at this time we are in the process of understanding file and folder properties in this lecture let's get details about owner of the file or folder that being said in this case let me go one level up by saying cd dot dot cd stands for change directory now let me run ls hyphen ltr command you can see there are several folders and files in this location all are owned by this user now even when we create new files in the system depending upon the user that is logged in the files will be created by that user which means the files will be owned by that user let's explore few comments such as who am i which actually give us the details about the logged in user in this case the logged in user is nothing but dgadraju now there is a command called as touch which will actually create empty file now if i say touch abc now if i say ls hyphen ltr you can see that the file is owned by abc when you create files by default the owner will be the logged in user using which you have created that file in this case by using touch command we have created empty file by name abc as the logged in user is nothing but this one the owner is also this one when it comes to ubuntu that is set up using wsl when it comes to each of the users that are created there will be group also associated with by same name that's why you are seeing group name also here when you actually start working in the projects the group name will be different in this case this is owner this is group we'll actually talk about groups as part of the next lecture that being said now as dgadraju is owner he should be able to delete the file as well without any issues you can see that it is deleted now let's run ls hyphen ltr command once again to see abc still exists or not you can see that the file is gone now let me run a command called as sudo su space hyphen space root it will facilitate me to log in into root it is prompting for the password we need to enter the password using which the dgadraju user is set up as sudo or when you actually set up uh, linux using wsl you will automatically set up user and password that user is a sudo or which means he should be able to get into root user as well root is nothing but super admin when it comes to linux operating system now there is a folder called as tmp i am in the tmp folder let me say ls hyphen ltr as of now there are few folders and files let me create a temporary file here let me name it as abc itself 
Now let me say ls ltr. You can see the file is created. The owner is nothing but root. Now if I exit, I came back to the dgadraju user. Now the logged in user is nothing but dgadraju. You can confirm by running who am I here. You can see that the logged in user is nothing but dgadraju. You can also see the details here. When it comes to the earlier session before we run exit, the logged in user is nothing but root. Now I should be able to go to the temp folder like this. If I say ls ltr, I can see the abc file here. However, if I try to delete this file, let me say rm abc, it will fail. It is because abc is owned by root, not by dgadaraju user. In this case, the key thing which you need to keep in mind is by default, the owner of the file is nothing but the logged in user. In this case, when I say touch abc after logging in as root, the file is created as root as owner. Once the file is created with root as owner, when we try to use regular users like dgadaraju to delete that file in a temp, it is failing because the file is owned by root, not by dgadaraju. That being said, now I should be able to sudo to root by saying sudo su hyphen root. Now let me go to temp folder. Now let me say ls hyphen ltr, we can see abc file here. Now let me say rm abc, the file will be gone. As the file is owned by a root user, as I am logged in as root, I should be able to delete the file as well. So once again, I am reiterating, when it comes to the files, the files will be owned by the user that is logged in while creating the file. Only those users will be able to delete. However, the super admins like root should be able to delete any file in the system. We can always get the owner level information at this place when we run commands such as ls-l or ls-ltr. When it comes to this value, it is nothing but group value. Now let's go to the details about group in next lecture. As part of the section module, we are in the process of understanding file and folder properties. So far we have got details related to owner and groups. Now it is time for us to create couple of groups so that we can experiment around those groups. There's a very simple command to add groups. It is nothing but group add. You can see the usage of group add command by saying group add hyphen hyphen help. Also, there is another command called as add group. You should be able to use add group also to add groups. Let me say add group hyphen hyphen help to get the usage of add group command. Using either of the commands, you should be able to add groups. I'll be using group add to actually add the groups. In this case, the syntax is nothing but group add and I should be able to specify the group name. Let's say dev. It will take care of adding the group by name dev. However, dgadaraju is a normal user but he has pseudo permissions in this case if you try to just use group add command like this it will fail saying permission denied to make sure we can add the group we should be able to use sudo like this as the user which i have used to log in into the system is a sudo i should be able to run this command without any issues if you don't have admin permissions uh, which is nothing but running commands as sudo you will not be able to run this command and add the group by name dev. Now it is prompting for the password. Let me enter the password that is used while setting up the uh, Linux based system on this Windows based system using WSL. Now the group is added. Once the group is added, there are multiple ways to validate. One of them is nothing but using cat command by saying cat etc group. There will be an entry for each and every group as part of this file. You can actually check the entry here. As the group is just added, it is shown at the end. You can also say grep dev and then slash etc slash group to get the groups with dev in them. There are three groups with dev in them. You can see they are nothing but plug dev, net dev, then dev. Now let's add another group by name support. Again, we should be able to use group add command itself. Let me say group add and then support, then hit enter. You can see that it have failed because there are no permissions to run it directly. In this case, we have to use sudo so that the user which is sudo can actually use sudo to actually uh, add the group using group add command. Now group is added. Once again, let's run command called as cat then slash etc slash group. You can see support group at the end. You can also say grep support then etc then group. You can see that there's only one group with support in it. It is nothing but support itself. Uh, when it comes to dev, we have three groups where dev is part of them, but with respect to support, there's only one group. As we have successfully created groups such as dev and support, it is time for us to add users to these groups. I'll be demonstrating about how to add dev1, dev2, dev3 as users 
into a group called as dev you can take uh, it as an exercise and add user sub1 sub2 sub3 to group called as support in this case we'll be adding these users uh, to respective groups as primary groups uh, i'll also demonstrate about how to add dev1 dev2 dev3 to support group as regular members uh, for these users support will not be the primary group dev will be the primary group you can also take it as an exercise and make sure you add sub1 sub2 sub3 to dev group where support will be the primary group dev will be another group in which they can be members of that being said the command which you are supposed to use to add users is nothing but user add you can actually get the help by saying user add hyphen hyphen help only admin users or super users can actually use user add command to actually add users in the system you can see that there are quite a few control arguments one of the control argument which you should be focus on is nothing but hyphen g if you wanted to specify a particular group as a primary group you have to use this hyphen g you can also explore others to use based upon your requirements other important ones are nothing but hyphen d or hyphen hyphen home dir where you can actually specify a specific directory as home directory in this case i will uh, show what is the default home directory and also i will uh, actually walk you through what happens when we use hyphen g versus when we don't use hyphen g so let's start with simple user add let me say sudo user add let me specify the username as dummy let me hit enter it is asking for the dgadraju password we need to specify the password which is used while setting up this user when we actually set up ubuntu based operating system on this machine now the user is added you can actually say cat etc password or pass wd and then you can actually grab for dummy so let's grab for dummy here you can see that the user dummy is created the home directory for the user is nothing but this one the default shell is nothing but this one bin sh you can actually say sudo su dummy because dgadraju is super user we should be able to impersonate as dummy in this case which means we can log in into this system as a dummy using this command now let me hit enter you can see that i am able to log in into the system using this user i'm in the same system but i have logged in using a different user called as dummy now let me say pwd you can see that i'm in uh, slash home slash dgadraju there is a reason why uh, this is the uh, present working directory for this user you will understand very soon i'll be explaining it in detail however if i say who am i you can see that i have logged in as a dummy now let me exit from here now i am back into the system as dgadraju itself i'm not dummy anymore now i can actually use who am i command to actually confirm you can see that the user that is logged in at this time into the system is nothing but this one now i can actually say id dummy you can see that the user is created as dummy the default group for this user is nothing but dummy itself so when we actually use commands such as user add if you do not specify specific group it will actually try to create group with the same username and it will try to add that user to that group you can also confirm by saying cat etc group hit enter you see the dummy group is created so for each and every user the group will be created which need not be a good practice that being said now let me clean up this dummy user and also let me clean up this dummy group and then i'll take it further so in this case i can say sudo user del is the command which can be leveraged to delete a user i would like to delete dummy user let me hit enter now the user is deleted you can actually confirm by saying id dummy if the user exists we should be able to see the details of that user however it is complaining saying that no such user also we should be able to validate by saying cat etc pass wd for each and every os user there should be an entry in this now you can see that there is no dummy user you can also say grep dummy etc pass wd you can see there is no entry in this file you can also grep for dummy as part of etc group you can see that even the group is deleted so when we actually deleted the user the group that is created uh, based on the username is also deleted this is the default behavior when we use user add command now also when i actually use user add command and try to add the user let me try again now the user is added when i try to log in as that user by using this command you can see that it is complaining saying cannot touch home dummy which means it is not able to create the home directory and it is complaining no such folder directory by default it is trying to get into this folder however as the folder doesn't exist it is failing 
Now let me exit. Let me delete the user. Now the user is deleted. Now let's say user add hyphen hyphen help. We can use several control arguments when it comes to user add. The important one in this case to create the home directory is nothing but this one. If I say hyphen m or hyphen hyphen create home, it will take care of creating the home directory as well. You can also set the password while creating the user by using hyphen p or hyphen hyphen password. You can also change the shell. By default, it is bin sh. If you wanted to change, you can change it. Like this, there are quite a few control arguments. You just need to understand the characteristics of having a user in Linux based system and you should be able to explore. That being said, now I can actually say sudo user add dummy, then hyphen m, then that's it. I should be able to hit enter. Now if I say sudo su dummy, now it didn't throw any error. However, it is not confirming whether we are in the right directory or not the way it is showing here. There is a reason why when it comes to the dgadraju, the output is like this. When it comes to the other users such as dummy, the output is like this. I'll be covering those details at a later point in time. For now, let's focus on running pwd command. You can see that now it is slash home slash dummy. Also, there is no error as we have seen earlier. Earlier, there was an error by saying no such file or directory. Now that error is gone. Now I can actually exit. Then if I run lsfn ltr slash home, I'll be able to see a new folder by name dummy. In this case, as I have used hyphen m while running user add command, uh, it have actually created a folder under slash home by default using that username. You can see the details here. Now let's say sudo user del and if we specify dummy, it will delete the user. However, the home folder will not be deleted. Let's look at the help on user del. For that, I can actually say user del hyphen hyphen help hit enter. You can see there are few control arguments with respect to user del. If you wanted to remove the home directory, you can use hyphen r or hyphen hyphen remove. If you don't specify this, even though the user and respective group are deleted, it will not delete the home folder. To make sure home folder is also deleted, we should be able to use hyphen r. So in this case, I can say sudo user del, then hyphen r, then dummy. Now the user will be deleted the associated group that is created by default will be deleted and also the folder will be deleted. You can validate by saying ls-ltr slash home. You can see that the folder is deleted. That being said, this is a quick overview about user add command and also user del command to create a simple user. Now when it comes to user add, when we do not specify a group, it will by default create a group by the username and it will make sure that group is the primary group for that user. However, our requirement is to create users such as dev1, dev2, dev3 as part of group called as dev. We'll actually take care of it as part of the next lecture. So far, we have gone through the details about creating a user by name dummy. We have actually seen the default behavior and also we have explored quite a few options to customize the default behavior. Now, leveraging that knowledge, let's go ahead and create users dev1, dev2, dev3 where dev will be the primary group for those users. In the process of understanding how to add users, so far we have explored quite a few options. Now let's leverage those details and try to add users dev1, dev2, dev3 in such a way that dev is the primary group for them. First, let's start with uh, user add help by saying user add space hyphen hyphen help. Let me hit enter. Already we have seen hyphen m so that the home directory is created. Also, we can use hyphen s to change the default shell to bash instead of uh, sh so that when we log in into that user, we see feedback the way we are seeing here. Now, when it comes to adding users to a specific group rather than creating a new group, the option is nothing but hyphen g or hyphen hyphen gid. You should be able to specify the name or id of the primary group of the new account. Now, already we have created two groups dev and support we can actually say grep hyphen w then dev then slash etc slash group let me hit enter you can see the group dev here the id for this group is nothing but 1001 so using hyphen g either i can say dev or 1001 it should work without any issues now let's say sudo user add hyphen m to create the home directory hyphen s to use slash bin slash bash as the default shell then let me actually say hyphen g either i can say dev or 1001 then i have to specify the username the username is nothing but dev1 now the user is added i can actually say id dev1 i should be able to see the details of this user you can see the primary group details here it is nothing but dev you can also say grep dev then slash etc 
slash group we should not be seeing dev1 over there because the group is not supposed to be created with the same username that is used because we have said user add hyphen g dev to make sure dev is the group that is used for this user in this case dev is the primary group for this user you can see there is no dev1 group here but the dev1 user is created because we have used hyphen s bin bash now when i say sudo su dev1 you can see the feedback as we are seeing for the users such as dgadraju this is the login session for dev1 user on itv windows 11 now let me exit from here let's add another user by name dev2 this time i'll be using group id rather than group name the group id for dev is nothing but 1001 in this case i haven't changed the username that's why it thrown error saying dev1 already exists now i, I have changed the username to dev2 now it should work now i can say id dev2 you can see that dev2 user is added the group for this dev2 user is nothing but dev in this manner we can also add another user let's say dev3 again either you can specify name or id i am changing it to name the name is nothing but dev now even dev3 user is added we should be able to say grep dev then slash etc slash password or passwd to see all the users dev1 dev2 dev3 as part of the output all this dev1 dev2 dev3 have the home directory like this and also the shell is nothing but bin bash this is how you should be able to add users such as dev1 dev2 dev3 to a standard group called as dev now take it as an exercise and try to add sub1 sub2 sub3 where the primary group that should be associated with that users is nothing but support already the support group is created you can explore the id or name of that support group you should be able to leverage either id or name and you should be able to create the users
as part of this sectional module we are actually going through the details about file and folder properties what are the properties associated with files and folders we should be able to use commands such as ls hyphen l whatever information that is displayed here uh, can be considered as properties related to files and folders you have permission related details here you have owner then group and also last modified time as well as the size of uh, the file or folder that being said now let's focus on this information and then we'll take it further i'm copying this and then i'm actually opening a file called as concepts as part of this let me paste it now let's understand what they actually mean in decimal format uh, this is a variation of binary representation when it comes to binary representation we only have zeros and ones we don't have anything else so if i want to represent this in binary format it is something like this 111 then 101 for next three bits then 101 for last three bits as there are no hyphens in this we are actually saying 111 as there is a hyphen here you can see there is zero here so this r hyphen x can be treated as 101 again this r hyphen x can be treated as 101 it can actually mean 755 in the decimal format this 111 can be treated as 7 then this 101 can be treated as 5 again this 101 can be treated as 5 understanding this in the form of decimal representation is very very important unless you understand these details it will be tough for you to understand some important commands such as u mask and also ch mod which can be used to manipulate the permissions on files and folders that being said this value can be represented like this in decimal in binary it can be represented like this now let's spend some time to understand how this is actually converted to this for that you just have to recollect uh, your high school mathematics where binary to decimal is covered so when it comes to binary to decimal conversion you just have to say 000 as 0 so 000 is represented as 0 in decimal even you can say 0 Uh, to zero with respect to binary to decimal conversion however as we have three bits i am actually representing like this even you can say zero implies zero from binary to decimal now one or zero zero one is nothing but one in decimal but after zero zero one the next number with respect to binary is nothing but ten or zero one zero so if it is zero one zero in binary format in decimal format it is nothing but two if it is zero one one in binary format in decimal it is nothing but 3 if it is 100 it is nothing but 4 101 it is nothing but 5 110 it is nothing but 6 111 it is nothing but 7 after that if we have 1000 it is nothing but 8 so and so forth in this case all these three different uh, values represent only up to 7 starting from 0 now you can see here 111 means 7 101 means 5 again 101 means 5 so with respect to this value in binary format it can be represented like this in decimal format it can be represented like this why it is very important for us to understand these things only then you should be able to use commands such as ch mod to actually manipulate the permissions on files and folders also there is another command called as umask even to understand umask you should be able to understand these concepts otherwise you will not be able to understand that being said we only covered the permissions part of it okay now these permissions are related to the owner which you see here then these permissions are related to the members in the group however in this case uh, when it comes to digadraju user he is part of uh, digadraju group itself there will be only one user with uh, this default group we will be exploring the details using dev1 dev2 dev3 users which are part of dev group then it will start making more sense to you any other member who is neither owner nor member of the group here will actually inherit these permissions so the permissions which you are seeing here are related to the owner group and others which are neither part of the owner or members as part of the group let's uh, look at few examples using dev1 dev2 dev3 users which are part of dev group you will be able to understand all these nuances uh, with a lot more clarity before going to those details let's also explore command called as umask and then we'll take it further
At this time, we are going through the details about file and folder properties. The important properties related to file and folders are nothing but owners, groups, and also the permissions. We are in the process of understanding the nuances related to permissions. In that process, we have created users called as dev1, dev2, dev3. Also, these users have a primary group called as dev. Uh, it is very important for you to understand that these users are part of a group called as dev. For all these three users, the primary group is nothing but dev. You can validate by saying id dev1, then id dev2, and also id dev3. You can see all the three users exist. And also you can see the default group, which is nothing but primary group for all the three users. It is nothing but dev itself. Now, before actually getting into the details about how the permissions between users work, let's understand how the permissions are by default generated for home folders for these three users. The home folders for these three users are nothing but slash home slash dev1, slash home slash dev2, slash home slash dev3 respectively. Let's run ls ltr command on slash home. Let's see the details here. The home folders for dev1, dev2, dev3 are nothing but these ones respectively. You can see the owner for this folder dev1. It is nothing but dev1. Uh, the owner for dev2 is nothing but dev2. The owner for dev3 is nothing but dev3. Also, as we have specified dev as the primary group when we actually created these users, you can see the group details as well. Now, if you look at the permissions, when it comes to dev1 as user, uh, because he is the owner for this folder under slash home, he should be able to read, write as well as execute in this folder. So uh, the user dev1 should be able to create files and folders under this folder. Same is the case with dev2. The dev2 user can actually take care of creating files and folders under this folder because the owner is dev2. When it comes to the permissions, they are nothing but read, write and execute. Same applies for dev3. You can see the owner. When it comes to the permissions, it is nothing but read, write and execute. Let me quickly demonstrate so that you understand what I'm talking about here. In this case, I'm actually saying sudo su hyphen dev1. Now I have logged in into the dev1 account. You can see the dev1 here. Now I can actually say pwd. You can see the home directory. For this user, it is nothing but slash home slash dev1. Now I should be able to say touch dev1 dummy. It will take care of creating a file. As user dev1 have right permissions on this because of this, the user dev1 is able to create this uh, file called as dev1 dummy. You can run lsf and ltr command to review the properties of dev1 dummy. You can see that when it comes to the owner with respect to dev1 dummy, the owner is nothing but dev1. Whatever user that is used uh, to actually create this file, the uh, default owner will be the user which is logged in at this time. In this case, we have logged in as dev1 and the file is created as dev1 and hence the owner for this file is nothing but dev1. When it comes to the group, it is nothing but the primary group. In this case, dev is the primary group for this uh, user dev1. That's why you are seeing dev here. Now we also have umask. When it comes to creating the files, this value will be subtracted from 666. It will result in 644. That's why we got read write for owner, read only for group and read only for others. Because of the umask, the properties related to this uh, file is like this. When I say properties, I'm talking about permissions here. Even if I create a folder, let's say mkdir dev1 dummy dir. Now let me run lsf and ltr. In this case, uh, you'll be seeing these uh, permissions because the 022 will be subtracted from 777, which is nothing but 755. As we have 7 for owner, it is nothing but read, write, execute permissions. For group, it is nothing but read and execute only because it is 5. For others, it is again read and execute because it is 5. So based upon the umask value, the permissions on the files and the folders will be uh, determined. That being said, this is with respect to slash home slash dev1, which is owned by dev1 user. Now, as dev1 user, as of now, I have logged in as dev1 user, you can see here. I can actually say cd slash home slash dev2. Now you can see that I'm in the folder dev2. Why I'm able to get into that folder dev2? That is because, let's say, I say cd and come back to dev1 home folder, which is nothing but home dev1. Now if I say ls ltr slash home, when it comes to dev2, the owner is dev2, the group is dev. When it comes to members in the group and others, they have read and execute permissions, but they don't have write permissions. Because they have read and execute permissions, the 
dev1 user can actually get into this folder without any issue. That's why when I say cd slash form slash dev2, I'm able to get into that folder without any issues. However, if I try to create a file saying touch dummy, it will fail. You can see it is saying permission denied because the user dev1 doesn't have right permissions on slash form slash dev2. However, if I exit from here, now I am back to dgatheraju user. Now let's say sudo su dev2. Now I have logged in as dev2 user. You can check the home directory for the dev2. It is nothing but slash home slash dev2. Now I can actually say touch dev2 dummy. You can see the file is created without any issues. You can run lsf and ltr and you can see the file. Because this is the home directory for dev2 and dev2 is the owner for this directory and hence uh, logging in as dev2 user we should be able to manage files and folders in this without any issues as the user have write permissions on that home directory now using this uh, dev2 user we should be able to get into either slash home slash dev1 or even slash home slash dev3 but the uh, user dev2 will not be able to create any files or folders either in home dev1 or in home dev3 let me try to create a file by saying touch dummy you can see that it is failing saying permission denied this is a brief introduction about uh, the cross user permissions it is very very important for you to understand this it will facilitate you to troubleshoot the issues when you actually start developing the applications or dealing with the data sets make sure you practice enough and be comfortable as of now we have gone through quite a few details with respect to users groups the home directories and also uh, permissions associated with the home directories uh, for the owners and uh, non-owners. In this case, dev1 is the owner for slash home slash dev1, which is home directory for that user. That user should be able to manipulate folders and files without any gaps. However, the other users such as dev2, dev3, and even the users which are not part of the group dev can actually read and execute the folders and also read the files, but they will not be able to write. We'll get into the details about uh, the groups and others uh, uh, so that you understand what is the difference between group and others and why they have categorized into owners groups and others those details will be covered as part of the next lecture at this time we are going through the details about uh, files and uh, folder properties the main properties related to files and folders are nothing but permissions uh, as well as owners and groups when we run comments such as ls ltr we'll actually see the permissions uh, related to owner group and others as part of the previous lecture we have gone through the details about how dev1 dev2 dev3 will have write permissions for their respect to home directories and read only permissions on others uh, directories however in this case whether it is dev2 dev3 with respect to dev1 or any other user like dgatheraju the behavior will be the same so in this case if i look at slash home folder there are dev1 dev2 dev3 then sub1 sub2 sub3 and also dgatheraju user now I have logged in as dgatheraju user. Even though dgatheraju is not part of dev group, the dgatheraju as a user can actually get into any of the home directories and he will have the read permissions on uh, files and folders in those home directories. It is because when it comes to the home directories of dev1, dev2 and dev3, not only group but also others on the system have read and execute permissions due to which users like dgatheraju can actually get into those home folders and they should be able to uh, go through the folders and files without any issues as long as the permissions on those files and folders are satisfying the read permissions for the others or read and execute permissions for the others that being said now let's see what happens when we restrict the permissions so in this case i'll be using a command called as sudo chmod chmod is primarily to modify the permissions and we will try to restrict the permissions only for users groups for others we want to make sure there are no permissions at all so let's go to the details in this lecture i'll just walk you through the command called as chmod how we can leverage to change the permissions on certain folders then we'll take it further so in this case dgatheraju is a super user which means he is also admin in the system. So as dgatheraju, he should be able to control the permissions of other users' home directories. So let me say cd, and let me go to the uh, home directory of dgatheraju. Now let me say sudo chmod, then let me say 750. So 750 means read, write, execute for owners, read and execute for group, no permissions for others. Then I should be able to say slash home, slash dev1 now the permissions with respect to the home directory of user uh, dev1 is being changed let me enter the password once again 
Now the permissions are changed. Let me say ls ltr slash home. When it comes to dev1, when it comes to others, there are no permissions at all. Only the owner and the group have the permissions. Group have only read and execute permissions. The owner have read, write, execute permissions, but others doesn't have any permissions. Now let me log in as uh, dev1. By default, he will be in the home directory of dev1. Now I can say ls ltr and I should be able to see the files and folders. I can actually delete these files and folders. Everything will work without any issues. Now I have exited from dev1 user. Now let me log in as dev2. When it comes to dev2, dev2 is part of dev group. Uh, when it comes to the dev1 home directory, the members in the dev group have read and execute permissions. Who are the members in the dev group? They are nothing but dev2 and dev3. I have logged in as dev2 here. Now I should be able to say cd slash home slash dev1. You can see that dev2 can actually get into the home directory of dev1. Dev2 can actually run commands such as ls and ltr. As of now, there are no files and folders in this. However, if we try to create a new file by saying touch dummy, you can see that it is failing saying permission denied because dev2 who is part of dev group doesn't have write permissions on the home folder of the dev1. That's why he is not able to create the files or folders under slash home slash dev1 which is nothing but home directory for the dev1 user. Now let me actually come out of this. Again I came back to the dgadraju user. In this case I am not going to use sudo. If I use sudo as sudo will actually give super permissions to dgadraju user. It will work without any issues. Without using sudo I will be trying to get into the slash home slash dev1. Now you can see that it is saying permission denied because for others there are no permissions on the home directory of the dev1. That's why the user dgadraju without sudo is not able to get into this folder called as slash home slash dev1 but he will be able to get into slash home slash dev2 or even slash home slash dev3. You can see it is working fine. Now let's uh, make sure we go to the home directory of dgadraju user and let's run sudo chmod command by saying 750 on slash home slash dev2 and also slash home slash dev3. Now for both dev2 as well as dev3 under home, we have removed the permissions for others. We should be able to validate by saying ls ltr slash home. Now you can see that even with respect to dev2 and dev3, for others there are no permissions. Now without using sudo, if I try to say cd slash home slash dev2 as dgadraju which is other which is not part of the dev group, it will fail. You can see that it have failed saying permission denied because others doesn't have any permissions on these home folders anymore. This is how you can actually differentiate the permissions with respect to group versus others. It is very very important for you to understand these uh, uh, subtle differences. Make sure you practice enough and uh, understand these subtle differences so that uh, you can improve your troubleshooting capabilities uh, whenever you encounter these issues such as permission denied when you deploy your applications or when you try to process your data. We have created groups. As part of the groups, we have added users. Then we have understood the permissions associated with uh, owners, groups, and others. As part of this sectional module, uh, we have gone through the details related to file and folder properties. In this lecture, I'll actually conclude it so that uh, you can uh, connect all the dots that are covered in this sectional module. The main command which you can leverage to actually get uh, the details related to files and uh, folders is nothing but ls-l. Keep in mind that folder is nothing but synonym for directory. So either you can call it as directory or folder. Now uh, the first part of this output for each and every entry is nothing but the permissions. Then uh, I'm not 100% sure about this. Then owner, then group, then the size of folder or file, then the last updated timestamp, then the name of the folder or file. The first bit in these permissions will actually talk about whether the entry is related to a directory or file. If it is D, it is directory or folder. If it is hyphen or minus, it is nothing but file. Apart from these, you might also see some things like L, which represents soft link, so and so forth. However, 95 to 98% of the entries will have either D or hyphen. Then the rest of the information is nothing but permissions. The first three bits are related to owner. So in this case, the owner have read, write and execute permissions. The next three bits are related to the group. All the members in this group will be having these permissions, then followed by the 
permissions related to the others. We have gone through the details related to how this can be represented in binary format, in decimal format. We have also gone through the details about the relevance of umask command, which will control the default behavior of creating the files or folders whenever we run commands such as touch, mkdir, or even when we actually try to create files by redirecting the output into the files and all. We haven't covered those details, but we have demonstrated using touch where we have created the file and we have understood how the permissions are inherited based upon the umask. Then we have gone through the details about creating the required users in specific groups. We have actually created dev1, dev2, dev3 users and we have added those users to dev group. Then we have gone through the details about how the permissions are inherited on the files to the members of the group and also to the others. It is very very important for you to understand all these nuances so that you can troubleshoot issues related to permission denied whenever you run applications in Linux based systems and also whenever you get files from the external systems. For all types of engineers who work on Linux based systems, it is very very important to understand these nuances. That being said, let's go ahead and clean up whatever is created as part of this sectional module. I have created a few files such as dummy, dummy1, dummy1 directory, dummy directory. As all the files have dummy as the pattern, I should be able to say rm-rf dummy star. It will take care of deleting all the files and folders which starts with dummy. Now let's also go ahead and delete all the users and groups that are created earlier. In this case, I should be able to use user del to actually delete the users. Let's run the command called as uh, grep and then cap character, then dev, then say etc pass wd. It will actually give us the list of users with dev in it. So we have three users, dev1, dev2, dev3. To delete these users, we can actually say sudo user del hyphen r, then dev1, it will take care of deleting the dev1 user, then dev2, it will take care of deleting the dev2 user, then dev3, it will take care of deleting the dev3 user. We should be able to validate using this approach. Now take it as an exercise and delete sub1, sub2, sub3. We can also delete the group by saying sudo group and then you have group del. So we can use group del and then we should be able to delete the group as well. So in this case the group name is nothing but dev. You can take it as an exercise and you should be able to delete support group as well. Now let's review whether the home directories are deleted or not by saying ls-ltr slash home. You can see that with respect to dev1, dev2, dev3, the home directories are deleted. Uh, also, you can actually confirm whether the users are deleted or not by using this command. You can see the users are deleted. You can also say grep then uh, dev etc group. You can confirm that there is no entry for dev in etc group as the group is deleted. Uh, this is how you should be able to clean up the users and groups that are created for your uh, practice purpose. Make sure you clean up so that your system is clean. Also make sure you are comfortable with uh, all the file and folder properties that are covered in this sectional module. It will facilitate you to troubleshoot your issues better when it comes to supporting your applications in UAT, prod, etc. As of now, we are talking about Linux commands for beginners. So far, after setting up the environment, we have seen how to get started with Linux shell commands. Then we have seen how to list files and folders using ls and also how to filter files and folders using commands such as find. Then we have gone through the details about processing data in files using Linux commands. Then we have gone through the details about understanding file and folder properties. Typically, we see the file and folder properties using commands such as ls-l or ls-ltr. Now it is time for us to explore all the details with respect to managing files and folders in Linux. We'll start with the touch to create empty files and also update the properties of the files. Then we'll actually get into the details about creating the directories using mkdir. We'll also get an overview of awk command. We'll be using awk quite extensively as part of this section to take care of automation around commands such as cp, mv, rm, etc. cp is primarily used to copy the files and folders. mv is used to move files and folders from one location to another location. rm is used to remove files and folders based upon certain criteria. In between, we'll also see how to take the backup using tar so that when we actually explore mv or rm we will be able to restore the impacted folders to their original format 
By the end of the section or module, you will not only be comfortable with commands such as CP, MV, RM, etc. You will also be comfortable with touch, MKDIR, and also the commands such as awk for simple automations. Also, I'll be using find quite extensively in this as part of the automation. Also, you'll be picking up a very important command called a star from the perspective of taking the backups. Make sure you go through each and every command and learn these commands. They will come handy in many ways as you evolve as a professional. At this time, we're actually going through the details about managing files and folders in Linux. First, we'll start with the touch, then we'll actually go through the rest of the commands that are relevant with respect to managing files and folders in Linux. Let's start with the usage of touch. We can actually say touch, then hyphen hyphen help, hit enter. You can see there are quite a few control arguments that are relevant for the touch. The primary purpose of the touch is to create empty file. You should be able to create empty file using touch command in whatever folder you want. So in this case, I am in the home folder for dgadraju. Let me actually run pwd command, which stands for present working directory. And you can see that uh, there is a folder dgadraju under home. This is the home directory for this user called as dgadraju. Now I should be able to say touch, then dummy. If the file doesn't exist, it will just create the file. Let me run lsf and ltr. You can see the uh, dummy file here. Let me run rm command. Let me delete it. Now the file is deleted. You can see that there is no dummy file here. Now let me run touch again. If the file doesn't exist, it will just create that file. You can validate by running ls-ltr command. Even though it's an empty file, there are permissions associated with that file. And also there's the owner as well as group associated with that file. Now when it comes to running touch on top of existing file, it will just update the properties of the file. In this case, it will update the timestamp. If some other user try to use touch on the existing file where he have write permissions on that folder, it might even update the owner and group. But typically when we use touch on the existing file, it will update the timestamp on that file. You can see that the file dummy have 1.33 pm on April 25th as timestamp. Now if I run touch command again, before running touch command, let's run date command. Date will actually confirm the current time you can see that it is 1.34 p.m. Now I can actually say touch dummy, hit enter. Now it have actually returned without any issues. Now if I say LSF and LTR, you can see that the timestamp is updated to 1.34 p.m. Let me run once again. Now let me run LSF and LTR once again. You can see that it is changed to 1.35. So touch will actually create a new empty file if the file doesn't exist. If the file already exists, it will just update the timestamp. Even though touch command is very simple, it is very effective with respect to streamlining the shell scripts. At this time, I don't want to cover the nuances related to shell scripting. Even in commands also, touch can be leveraged. For example, let's say I wanted to create files to generate the file names with specific naming convention. I should be able to use touch and I should be able to create uh, files. Let's say I wanted to create files from 1 to 5 with a dummy as prefix. I just want to make sure I have empty files. For that, I can actually say touch, then dummy. Then I should be able to use expressions like this. It will take care of creating five files for us. Now we should be able to run lsf and ltr command. You can see that five files are created. In case if you want to use cut and make sure you want to process these file names, you should be able to leverage the touch to generate the files with a certain naming convention. Touch is very effective to learn as well. Uh, let me give another example so that it is clear for you. For now, let me delete all these files by saying rm dummy star. All the files which starts with the dummy will be deleted. You can validate by saying ls ltr. You can see that there are no folders or files with dummy prefix. Now let's say I would like to learn some advanced stuff by combining ls command with cut to extract certain information from the file names. For that, I would like to generate some files with certain pattern. For example, I would like to create 20 files related to four albums. The naming convention is nothing but album1 underscore song1, album1 underscore song2, like that up to album1 underscore song5. Then I would like to have album2 underscore song1 up to album2 underscore song5 in the similar manner for album3 as well as album4. I should be able to use one touch command to generate all these files. I don't have to use multiple touch commands. In this case, I can actually say touch album and then one to four, then underscore, then song, then one to five. Also, let's make sure we have extension also. In this case, I'm saying mp4. 
this mp4 is just informational all these files are text files only now the touch command is successful let me run lsfn ltr you can see 20 files here you can run file command on any of these files let me say album1 underscore song1 dot mp4 it is actually saying empty it is neither saying text file nor mp4 file this is how you should be able to generate multiple files at once now let's say i would like to get all unique albums from this then i should be able to say ls hyphen one which will only give the file names you can see uh, it only gives the file names i can actually say album star to get only these files discarding the others now i can pipe this to cut then hyphen f or hyphen d for delimiter the delimiter is nothing but underscore then i can actually say hyphen f1 to get the field one which is nothing but album you can see album details now i should be able to pipe the output to sort and then unique to get all the unique albums uh, this is how i should be able to extract the information from the files when i generate files like this so if you wanted to explore the commands with simpler examples like this and if you wanted to create files so that you get some real experience one of the ways to generate the files is by using touch command you should be able to use patterns or expressions and you should be able to generate multiple files at once so the command that is used to generate all these files is nothing but this one let me show you this is the command that is used we should be able to use similar patterns as part of rm command as well so let me actually use similar pattern and then pass it as argument to rm all the files will be deleted at once you can run ls and ltr and you can see that all the files are gone this is one of the uses with respect to touch command to generate multiple files uh, at once using certain patterns in this case we are not only learning uh, commands such as touch we are also getting used to patterns make sure you are comfortable with patterns as well already we have seen some patterns when we actually explored ls command in detail as part of the earlier modules now we are actually exploring different type of patterns where we are able to generate files uh, using range in this case we have passed 1 to 4 with respect to album in curly braces like this and we have passed 1 to 5 with respect to song using curly braces like this it took care of uh, creating the files using that range and also deleting the files using that range so these patterns are pretty powerful make sure you are comfortable with these things as we have understood the details related to touch command now let's go to the details about mkdir command and understand how to create directories in linux using mkdir command also when it comes to touch it can be used on top of uh, non-empty files also if you just use touch on non-empty files it will actually behave the same way as it have behaved on existing empty file it will just update the timestamp and if there are enough permissions it might even change the user details for example in this case i have this gen underscore logs dot sh you can see that the timestamp related to this file is nothing but april 18th 4 59 pm now i can say touch and then gen underscore logs dot sh now i can run lsf and ltr you can see the size is still 62 bytes however when it comes to the timestamp now it is updated to april 25th 159 pm so touch can be used to update the timestamp on existing files or folders whether they are empty or not it doesn't matter sometimes we might have to use this approach to make sure uh, the file is updated to show in a certain type of queries however it is not very common but make sure you know the purpose of touch even on top of uh, non-empty files if they're existing already but if the file doesn't exist it will always create empty file only at this time we are going through the details about managing files and folders in linux folders are also known as directories in the previous lecture we have gone through the details about creating empty files or updating existing files using touch command when it comes to update primarily to update the properties of the file not the content of the file that being said now let's explore a very important command in linux which is nothing but mkdir mkdir stands for make directory you can actually get the usage of mkdir command in linux by saying mkdir hyphen hyphen help it have very few control arguments they are nothing but hyphen p hyphen m uh, hyphen p is a little bit important and i'll be emphasizing on hyphen p the simplest form of mkdir command is like this let me say mkdir parent dir now you can see that the folder is created at times we might want to create multiple levels of folders in one shot 
instead of creating the high level folder first and then getting into that folder and then creating second level folder and then getting into that folder and then again uh, creating another subfolder we can actually use mkdir hyphen p command and we should be able to create the entire hierarchy let me take an example so that you understand what i am talking about in this case let me delete this folder called as parent dir now let's say we would like to create folder hierarchy like this retail then orders then year 2022 then month 04 then date 25 in this case you cannot just use mkdir and make sure all these uh, folders exist retail is the parent folder 25 is the uh, leaf level folder in between we have orders then 2022 then april then 25th right if we try to run this command it will complain saying that cannot create directory no such file or directory because to create this one we need to make sure we have this entire stuff to create this one we need to make sure that we have this entire stuff or hierarchy uh, to have 2022 we need to have this one so and so forth now if you look at the help on mkdir by saying mkdir hyphen hyphen help there is a control argument called as hyphen p you can actually go through the details here also there is the alias for this hyphen p it is nothing but hyphen hyphen parents now if you go to the description here it says no error if existing make parent directories as needed so in case if any of the folder already exists in this it will just ignore it will not throw any error however if any of the folders are missing they will be automatically created now let me say mkdir retail if i try to run the same command again it will fail in this case it have failed saying cannot create directory retail file like this there is a reason why it is saying file like this instead of directory exists even a directory is nothing but file in linux don't worry too much about uh, this in this case you can see that this mkdr command is successful however when we try to run second time it have failed now if i say mkdr hyphen p retail as the folder exists it will just ignore you can see that it haven't thrown any error now we should be able to copy this entire stuff and then we can actually say mkdr hyphen p except retail none of the subfolders exist in the hierarchy all those subfolders will be created once we paste it here so let me paste here now you can see that the command is successful you can also validate by saying find retail you should be able to review all the subfolders here retail have orders retail orders have 2022 then we have 04 then 25 the parent folder for 25 is nothing but this one the parent folder for this one is nothing but this one the parent folder for this one is nothing but this one this is the ultimate parent folder from the current directory this is how you should be able to create the entire folder hierarchy even we can use patterns and we should be able to create multiple folder hierarchies as well for example let's say we would like to create multiple album folders uh, in each of the album folders we would like to have artist folders we can actually say mkdr hyphen p and we should be able to specify the pattern and we should be able to create all the folders at once in this case if the pattern is album one album two album three album four in each of the albums let's say there are three artists we should be able to create all those folders in one shot for that we just have to say mkdr hyphen p album then one two four then slash then artist one two three now let me hit enter now let me say lsf and ltr you can see there are four folders album one album two album three album four each of these folders have three subfolders you can see the details here this is how you should be able to create multiple folder hierarchies as well by passing certain patterns now let me remove these folders both retail as well as all those which contain album in them now all the folders are gone you can run lsf and ltr command to ensure that all the folders such as retail as well as the folders which starts with the album are gone that being said this is how you should be able to use mkdr command not only to create one folder but also hierarchy of folders we can also create multiple first level folders itself already we have seen this example of creating multiple folders with a certain pattern again with the subfolders in them 
it actually took care of creating album 1 album 2 album 3 album 4 folders in each of those folders it have created subfolders by name artist 1 artist 2 artist 3 you can also create just first level folders by saying mkdr hyphen p then album and then in curly braces 1 to 4 when it comes to creating the first level folders you don't need to use hyphen p for example in this case if you just want to create album 1 to 4 folders you can actually say mkdr album 1 to 4 it will take care of creating these folders for you you can see all first level folders are created without any issues now let me say rm hyphen rf then album star all the folders are gone this is how you should be able to leverage the mkdr command to make sure you create bunch of folders at once it comes very handy when it comes to generating the certain data sets or folder structures to make sure you take care of validations or unit testing on your linux based systems especially the one level hierarchy which we have seen earlier is quite useful for example if you look at this creating retail orders 2022-04-25 folder hierarchy using one command comes very handy even we can actually create folders such as 2022-04 from 1 to 30 in one shot you can again use patterns like this in this case we can specify the range like this now the folders will be created with that hierarchy you can actually say find retail and you should be able to see the folders from 1 to 30 within 04 so all the folders can be created in one shot so mkdr comes very handy with respect to generating the folders before copying the data into that folder hierarchy even as part of the shell scripting we use it quite extensively As part of the sectional module we are in the process of understanding how to manage files and folders in Linux. So far we have gone through the details about commands such as touch and mkdir. Touch is used to create empty files or update the properties of the existing files whereas mkdir is primarily used to create empty folders. That being said, before getting into further commands to manage files and folders such as cp, mv, rm etc, let's re review a very important command called as awk or awk. I haven't covered this before. I'll be starting with simple examples for now. Later wherever it is appropriate, we'll try to use awk. Already we have seen cut command to extract the information from the files. Awk can also be used in those scenarios. Let's review the cut command and then we'll actually see how to implement it using awk. Let me actually get into the folder called as data retail db then orders. Let's review the last few lines in the file called as part hyphen five zeros which is part of orders folder. You can see the last few lines here. These are nothing but records from some source table. When it comes to these records, these records have values related to four different attributes. If you take one record which is nothing but one line from part hyphen five zeros, you can see that there are four attribute values. The first one. belongs to order id the second one belongs to order date then the third one belongs to order customer id the fourth one belongs to order status all these four attribute values are separated by comma you can see comma here comma here and comma here when it comes to using cut to extract certain information from these lines or records it will be like this let's say we would like to get the order status which is nothing but this one it is nothing but the fourth value when it comes to each line after separated by comma the way you can actually extract order status is like this you have to say cut then hyphen d for delimiter delimiter is nothing but synonym for the separator then comma in this case comma is the delimiter you can see the comma here then after delimiting each record with comma or separating each record with comma we want to extract fourth field and hence hyphen f f for field then four then we should be able to specify the file name which is nothing but this one now you can actually see the order statuses you can also pipe the output to sort then to unique to get all the unique order statuses you can also get all the unique order dates by just changing this 4 to 2 you can see the order date if you want to get both order id as well as order status then you should be able to specify like this first field is order id and hence we can say f1 then comma 4 now we should be able to get only order id and order status from each of the line in part hyphen 50 zeros you can see the output here order id and then order status the values are separated by comma uh, this is the command which we have used to get order id and order status this is the command which we have used 
to get order status. Now let's say we would like to implement this using arc. It will be like this. Arc is quite powerful. It is much broader compared to cut. But we'll be seeing very simple examples to make sure we are comfortable with arc. As and when it is required, I will actually come up with simple one-liners using arc and I will explain the command in detail. Now the arc command will be like this. Arc, the last argument can be the file name. Let's specify the file name here. Now we need to specify the delimiter. With respect to cut, we can specify the delimiter using hyphen D. Then we have to specify the delimiter itself, which is nothing but comma. When it comes to arc, we should be able to specify the delimiter using hyphen capital F. Here F stands for field delimiter. That's why they are using hyphen capital F. Now when it comes to the delimiter, one of the ways to pass the delimiter is by using double quotes after hyphen capital F. Now the records will be delimited by comma however we need to print whatever information we want to in this case we want to print uh, order status uh, the print statement should be enclosed as part of single quotes like this in that we need to have curly braces like this within these curly braces we can have print statement like this let me say space then print then we should be able to specify dollar four like this to get the fourth field after delimiting each and every line with comma dollar four means fourth element after delimiting by comma now we should be able to hit enter and we should be able to get the order statuses we can also pipe the output to sort then to unique to get only the unique order statuses you can see the unique order statuses here uh, we are able to get this uh, both by using cut as well as arc however when it comes to the cut command you will not be able to prepend or append with common string before the data that is extracted for example in this case if I go to the cut command, let me go to this cut command where I have only extracted order statuses. Let's say instead of just printing order statuses like this, I would also want to prepend some common string like order status is something like that. With cut, it is not straightforward. You will not be able to use cut command only to get that additional information. You might have to pipe to some other command and you might have to take it further. With awk, you should be able to get that additional flexibility. Uh, using awk, you can actually write very complex programs, but I don't want to get into those details. I'll be covering some of the common and simple examples using awk. So in this case, let's say we would like to add additional string before order status, something like this. Order status is, then we would like to print order status. Let me actually change O to capital here. Now let me remove sort and unique. When it comes to the actual data that is being extracted from the file, it is specified using this. There are no double quotes around it. But for the literal string, which is nothing but order status is, uh, which is nothing but a constant value, we have enclosed in double quotes. Now we can hit enter. You can see the output. It says order status is before each and every order status. We can also pipe to sort and then to unique to just get unique order statuses. And you can see the output here. With cut, it is not very straightforward. You might have to use a bit complex technique to actually get this kind of output. So these are some of the advantages using awk. We'll be seeing quite a few examples as we go along. We have just got started with awk. In case if you want to deal with uh, uh, delimited data, you can specify the delimiter like this and then you can have simple logic as part of uh, curly braces and single quotes like this. You can actually pass the file name like this. You can also uh, cat this file and then pipe the output of this cat command to the awk. We can also use this approach. Let me paste here. Now let me say sort then pipe then unique. You can see the output here. So you should be able to pipe the output of commands such as cat, ls, so and so forth to awk and you should be able to process the output as well. We will see quite a few examples from that perspective very soon. For now we have just covered some basic usage of awk. Even though awk is very powerful, don't try to master awk. Arc itself is uh, very complex and it will take too much of time to master Arc. Just focus on how it can be leveraged for simple tasks like this. That is more than enough rather than mastering the Arc. 
if you want to be a hardcore linux professional probably mastering awk makes sense for all other roles mastering awk by spending too much of time doesn't make sense just follow some of the examples which i am covering and try to understand the command and make sure you can explore depending upon the requirements and try to use it for some uh, simple automations at this time we are going through the details about managing files and folders in linux in this lecture let me walk you through a very important command called as cp cp is primarily used to copy the files from one location to another location within the same linux based system for now let me go to the home directory by saying cd now i am in the home directory let me create a folder by name demo now the folder is created now let me get into the demo folder now let me go to the details about cp command to understand the uses of cp command let me make sure to create some files i'll be creating empty files using touch command so let me say touch and let me create multiple files in one shot i would like to create uh, files with this pattern album 1 to 4 then song 1 to 5 also i would like to have the extension mp4 so it will take care of creating 20 files uh, let's run this then let's run ls-l to see the output you can see the file names here album1 underscore song1 dot mp4 album1 underscore song2 dot mp4 like that we have up to album4 underscore song5 dot mp4 now using these files let's explore the copy command you can get the usage of copy command by saying cp hyphen hyphen help you can see there are quite a few options with respect to copy command let me actually go up here there are quite a few options i'll be covering some of the important ones they are nothing but hyphen f which is nothing but uh, uh, force also there is something called as hyphen r for recursive you can see here either you can use hyphen r or hyphen capital r or hyphen hyphen recursive for recursive on top of uh, hyphen capital r or hyphen r or hyphen hyphen recursive as well as hyphen f or hyphen hyphen force and the important control argument is nothing but uh, hyphen p or hyphen hyphen preserve you can see the details here this will facilitate us to copy even the properties of the files if we are dealing with multiple users so these three are the important control arguments with respect to cp command also you need to make sure you are comfortable using cp from the automation perspective let's see few examples so that you understand all important aspects of cp command to copy the files as we got over you about cp command and also as we have set up files now let's go to the details about using it let me say ls hyphen ltr let me list the files here we have several files here all files have certain pattern now let's say i would like to copy this file to some other location let's say temp temp is a standard location where everyone have right access to i should be able to copy like this i can actually first create a directory under temp by saying mkdir slash temp let me name it as demo itself now the folder is created now you should be able to copy these files into this folder the syntax is like this you can say cp then specify the file name album1 underscore song1 dot mp4 i am only copying one file here then i should be able to say slash tmp slash demo now this file will be copied into this location with the same name even if you do not specify the target file name let me hit enter now the file is created now let me say ls hyphen ltr slash tmp slash demo you can see the file under slash tmp slash demo now let's try copying another file which is nothing but this one let me copy this paste here then i can actually say slash tmp slash demo slash i can give the name here as well so whatever name is given here using that name it will actually copy the file into this location so earlier we haven't specified any name it have used whatever source name that is there with respect to this file and it have copied using the same name under the target location which is nothing but this one we have already reviewed this time we have specified the file name in this case both the source file name and the target file name under target folder slash tmp slash demo are same now let's hit enter the file will be copied now let's run ls hyphen ltr we should be able to see both the files here now i would like to have a folder called as albums under slash tmp slash demo for each and every album i would like to have a separate folder and then i just want to uh, have files 
as song one dot mp4 song two dot mp4 song three dot mp4 etc let's see an example so that you understand what i'm talking about here first let me create a folder by name slash tmp slash demo slash albums in that albums folder let me create another folder by name album one now let's say ls iphone ltr let's copy this then paste you can see that it is empty now i would like to copy songs as song one dot mp4 song two dot mp4 song three dot mp4 song four dot mp4 song five dot mp4 which have album one as a prefix i should be able to say cp like this and then let's say album one underscore song three dot mp4 the target location is nothing but this one now if i run this it will actually copy the file with this name itself in this target location however i wanted to copy as song dot mp4 i should be able to specify whatever name i want to give to this uh, new file that is being copied into that location now if i say ls iphone ltr tmp demo albums album one we can see one file song dot mp4 so this is how you should be able to copy with a different name than the source name the target location is nothing but this one the target file is nothing but this one this is how we should be able to leverage to copy files from one location to another location. Now, in this case, we want to restructure these files in such a way that we have four folders, album one, album two, album three, album four. And then we want to copy the respective songs of respective album to appropriate folder. All song one, song two, song three, song four, song five related to album one should go to album one. Songs with same name, with album 2 should go to album 2 so and so forth instead of copying one file at a time we should automate this let's go to the automation in the subsequent lectures in this sectional module first we'll try to create folders by name album 1 album 2 album 3 album 4 then we will see how to copy all the files at once to the appropriate folders before getting into those details let's clean up temp demo folder i can actually say rm hyphen rf then slash tmp slash demo slash star everything will be cleaned up we can actually validate by saying lsfn ltr slash tmp slash demo. You can see that it is empty. I will be explaining the command rm hyphen rf very soon in this uh, section. For now, don't worry too much about it. Just use this command to clean up uh, the temp demo folder. All the subfolders and files under temp demo are gone. Now, let me actually create a new folder by name albums under temp demo. Let's go to the details about creating the four folders, album 1, album 2, album 3, album 4, using a simple one-liner under this folder. I'll be covering those details in the next lecture. As part of this sectional model, we are going through the details about managing files and folders in Linux. In that process, we are understanding cp command in detail. We have already gone through the details related to cp command where we are able to copy the files with the same name as well as different name from source location to the target location. Now, we are in the process of automating the copy process so that the songs go to the respective albums. First, let's go ahead and create folders by names album 1, album 2, album 3, album 4. Either we can use mkdr command or we should be able to automate the process using awk command. If you wanted to use mkdr command, you can actually take care of creating all the four folders at once by saying mkdir. You can add hyphen p. In case if there are folders already, uh, it will ignore. Otherwise, it will create. Before running this command, let's review the details with respect to temp demo albums. You can see that it is empty. Now we can say mkdr hyphen p, then temp demo albums, then album. In curly braces, you can say one, two, four. It will take care of creating all the four folders at once. Now to validate, we should be able to run ls hyphen ltr command, which we have ran earlier. You can see all the four folders are created. Now let me remove these four folders. I'm actually saying rm hyphen rf temp demo albums then i should be able to say album star all the four folders will be gone we can validate by running this once again another way of automating uh, the creation of the folders based upon the names that are there as part of the files here uh, is by using awk you can also use cut to get the unique album names however using cut command to generate the mkdr command will be a little bit tricky with awk it is straightforward so in this case i can say awk hyphen capital f then underscore is the delimiter we need to make sure we pass the output of ls hyphen ltr to the awk command like this now for this output underscore is the delimiter to get the album names i just have to print the first 
value that is uh, extracted after delimiting by underscore we should be able to specify print like this we need to make sure we enclose the print command between curly brace and single quote now let's hit enter you can see that we got uh, all the album names however we have got this additional information there's a command called as ls-1 which will actually display the file names using single column you can see here so instead of using ls hyphen ltr output i should be able to use ls hyphen one output to make sure that we get only the album names not the additional information now let me say hyphen one let me hit enter you can see the names of the albums here now we should be able to say sort then unique we should be able to get all the four uh, album names here now i would like to use mkdr command and create the folders by these names under slash tmp slash demo slash albums so in this case i can actually say print then double quotes then i can actually say slash tmp slash demo slash albums i haven't added mkdr here now let me hit enter there's forward slash missing so let me add forward slash also after albums so that uh, we get the names properly. Now we can actually use MKDR on top of it and we should be able to create these four folders at once. Now let's improvise this command by adding MKDR hyphen P in this double quotes. It will just print this command. It will not execute. Let's validate the location to confirm whether the folders exist or not. For that I should be able to use this ls hyphen ltr command on temp demo albums you can see there are no folders in that location now this actually gives us the required mkdr commands we need to execute these four commands so that the four folders are created without any issues for that you can just hit up arrow then pipe then pass it to bash all these will be executed as commands that's it all the four folders are created at once now let's use ls7 ltr on temp demo albums you can see the four folders what is the advantage of using this approach? Depending upon the file names, we are able to extract the album names and we are able to create these albums. Even though mkdr command can be used using ranges, it is not appropriate to use it. In this case, I have simplified uh, file names. In your case, the album names might be different. You might have a pattern where the songs are named after album name underscore song name with extension. And you might want to extract the album names which is there before first underscore and you want to create folders, you should be able to use this approach. ls one have given the file names in a single column, then the output of this command is passed to this which have actually generated the mkdr commands however there might be multiple entries because there are multiple uh, files with album 1 album 2 album 3 album 4 prefixes we have sorted and we have applied unique on top of it to get unique mkdr commands like this these mkdr commands are then passed to bash which resulted in creating folders for us like this that being said as the four albums are created now it is time for us to copy the respective songs to respective folders let's see how we can automate and copy all the files at once rather than copying one file at a time at this time we are going through the details related to managing files and folders in linux we have already gone through the commands such as touch mkdr cp etc we have also got an overview of awk command at this time we are exploring cp command and we want to automate the process of copying multiple files at once using some criteria so in this case if you look at the source files under demo the file names are like this they are nothing but album 1 underscore song 1, song 2, song 3, song 4, song 5. Then album 2 underscore song 1, song 2, song 3, song 4, song 5, so and so forth. We have target folders in this location. The folder names are nothing but album 1, album 2, album 3, album 4. First, let us understand how to copy the files without automation. Then we'll actually go through the details related to automation. Uh, while automating, we'll also make sure the requirements are improvised further. That being said, in this case, if I just wanted to copy all these five songs into this folder album one under temp demo albums the command will be like this we can say cp then album one star dot mp4 so all those files which have album one prefix will be picked in this case we are even filtering for only those files with mp4 extension 
now i should be able to say target folder which is nothing but temp demo albums then album one now the files are copied into that location you can validate by saying ls ltr temp demo albums album one you can see the five files there now you can take care of copying the songs related to album two to respect to folder again by using same cp command we can say cp album star dot mp4 then we should be able to specify the target location as tmp then demo then albums then album 2 now the files with the prefix album 2 are actually copied into this location we should be able to validate by saying ls hyphen ltr then temp demo albums album 2 we can see the five files here in this manner we should be able to even copy the files related to album 3 we just have to improvise saying cp album 3 then temp demo albums album 3 like this now the files related to album 3 are actually copied into this location we can validate by running ls ltr on that location i haven't copied this into the buffer that's why it have pasted album 2 rather than album 3 let me hit up arrow let me replace 2 with 3 you can see the files related to album 3 in this folder we can also copy the files related to album 4 into the specific location which is nothing but temp demo albums album 4 the command to copy looks like this now all the files are copied to respective folders to validate we should be able to leverage find command and validate all the files at once we can say find then tmp then demo then albums then we should be able to specify hyphen name like this then star.mp4 we can actually uh, get the details in this case i have to specify the pattern as part of double quotes like this as there was no double quotes it was failing earlier now you can see the output uh, you can actually see the folder name and the respect to song names this is how you should be able to uh, copy the files however if you want to make it a bit more specific and if you want to copy the songs with only the title names without album names then using this cp command will not work uh, we need to make sure we include cp as part of automation using awk we'll go through those details as part of the next lecture before getting into the next lecture let's remove all these files at once using find command itself we should be able to use hyphen exec then rm then we should be able to use curly braces like this then plus then semicolon now all the files will be gone however it have failed because there is a syntax error here i need to make sure there is a space between curly braces and plus now let me hit enter now the files are gone we should be able to use find command by saying find tmp demo albums to validate whether the files exist or not as of now there are no files in this folder we have folders album 1 album 2 album 3 album 4 but these folders doesn't contain any files now let's take care of copying the songs with only titles without albums to respect to albums which means we would like to copy song 1 song 2 song 3 song 4 song 5 with those names only but the songs which are related to album 1 will go to album 1 the songs which are related to uh, album 2 will go to album 2 let's see the example as part of the next lecture so that you understand what i'm talking about and also you will be understanding how to automate using the power of awk and cp to take care of this complex copy as part of this sectional module, we are in the process of understanding how to manage files and folders in Linux. So far, we have gone through commands such as touch, mkdr, cp, etc. Now, we are at a position where we wanted to automate the process of copying the files with certain patterns. In this case, we have the source files using this format. You might have got several songs from your friend with album name prefix, then underscore, then the song title. Now, you want to organize in your own way where you want to create folders based upon album names and in those album names you just want to have the songs using the song title names without having album name as prefix in this case the source files are under demo within home directory of d Gadraju. the target location where we want to organize the, the files in a different way is nothing but this one temp demo albums and then the names of the folders are based upon the albums you can see the folders here so we'd like to copy the files to the respective folders so in this case with respect to this song we need to use command like this cp album1 underscore song1 dot mp4 then temp demo albums album1 
then it should be song1.mp4. This is how we should be coming up with cp command so that we can execute all at once to make sure all the songs are copied to respective folders with the song title names. We should be able to use awk and we should be able to generate a command like this. Once we get commands like this, we should be able to pass these commands to bash and we should be able to copy all songs at once. Now let me hit Ctrl C so that uh, the cp command is not executed and come out of that line. Now we should be able to say ls-1 which will generate only the names of the files as output. It will not have any additional properties. Now I can actually say pipe arc hyphen f or hyphen capital F underscore is the delimiter. Now I can actually come up with print statement in this. Now we have to use this command as reference. So let me say double quotes here. We have to say cp. Now if we use dollar $1, it will only get the album name. If we use $2, it will only get this part. Let's see so that you understand what I am talking about here. In this case, let's say CP in double quotes, then come out of it, then space, then $1. Space is optional. Just to make it readable, I am using space here. However, this space is mandatory. Without this space, CP and the data that is extracted will be concatenated together. Now CP space, then the $1 which is nothing but album 1, album 2, album 3, album 4. You can see the output here. Okay, now if I say $2, it will get song1.mp4, song2.mp4, song3.mp4, etc. Now to get the complete record along with the part of it, we have to use this approach. We have to say dollar zero. Let me first come up with the command, then I will explain in detail. Then we need to have a space and hence let me say dollar space dollar. Now let me actually say dollar two. Now let me hit enter. Now you can see that we got CP, then the original name, then part of it. We got original name because we have dollar zero. Dollar zero have a significance around it. It will actually give us the original record itself without uh, extracting a part of it based upon the delimiter. Using dollar two, you can actually extract the second part of it. Now this is supposed to be concatenated with slash tmp slash demos slash albums. So in this case, we can improvise further this command like this. We can say tmp then demos then albums then hit enter. However if we just make sure we pass this output to bash, it will actually create the songs within temp demos albums, which is not right. We wanted to create as part of respective folders such as album 1, album 2, album 3, album 4. So in this case, we also need to make sure we dynamically pass the folder name into which these files should be copied to using these names. So the way you can achieve it is like this. You can hit up arrow. Now you can actually say dollar one dollar one is the one which actually gives us album one album two album three album four etc then you have to include forward slash like this then you have to specify dollar two now let's hit enter you can see the output here cp the original uh, song name then the target folder along with the song name both the folder and the song name are extracted from the original name of the file itself you can see here dollar one is nothing but the folder name which is from here dollar two is nothing but song name which is from here now we should be able to pass this or pipe this to bash all these uh, uh, statements which are printed here will be executed at once however it have failed it could be because there might be bug in this let's troubleshoot and then take it further for now, let's copy this. We are supposed to have this folder already. Let me say ls-ltr, paste. You can see that there are no folders such as album 1, album 2, album 3, album 4 in this path. Now, I think there is a uh, error or bug in this. The original folder, uh, I think, is nothing but a slash tmp slash demo. Let's say ls-ltr slash tmp slash demo. Then albums. You can see that album 1, album 2, album 3, album 4 exists under temp demo albums. But under temp, there is no demos. Let me say ls ltr then slash tmp. There is no demos. That's why it was failing. Now let's hit up arrow and then fix the bug in this piece of command. I just have to replace demos with demo. Then hit enter. 
Now all the files are copied at once. You should be able to validate by saying find then temp demo albums hit enter you can see all the mp4 files are copied to specific folders using only the title names discarding the album names because the folders themselves are named after album names this is how you should be able to leverage awk with other commands such as cp along with bash to take care of the automation like this it is very very important for you to understand these capabilities of awk and also how to integrate multiple commands to achieve whatever you are looking for without putting too much of effort you'll only be able to take care of these things comfortably by coming up with your scenarios and by practicing enough at this time we are going through the details related to cp command uh, in the pursuit of managing files and folders in linux we have gone through the details with respect to copying the files and also we have gone through the details uh, with respect to automation while copying the files now let's uh, understand how to copy the folders using cp command at this time we have a folder by name temp demo in that we have albums you can see that there are four folders album 1 album 2 album 3 album 4 now let's say i would like to copy all the files and folders within albums into demo the source location is this one the target location is nothing but demo or current working directory for that we should be able to use cp hyphen r r for recursive you can also say hyphen hyphen recursive but hyphen r is commonly used more than hyphen hyphen recursive then you should be able to specify the source location which is nothing but this one then you can actually specify the target location dot represents the present working directory and hence i am saying dot so albums folder will be copied to this so you'll be seeing albums folder in this current folder before running it let me say ls hyphen ltr to see if there is a folder by name albums you can see that this folder doesn't contain any folders that being said now i can say cp hyphen r slash tmp slash demo slash albums then dot we can hit enter then we can say ls hyphen ltr you can see the albums folder copied here you can validate whether all the subfolders and files are copied or not by saying find albums like this and you can see all the subfolders and files within albums everything is copied successfully now if you try to run cp hyphen r command once again let's see what happens it is copying without any issues so by default it is actually doing force copy that's why it is copying without any issues otherwise it will throw errors that being said it is not very important for us to explore hyphen f which is nothing but force because by default it is using force option if force option is not used when we run these commands it should fail now let me make sure there is no corruption with respect to these folders i have ran find albums once again and we can see all the subfolders and files related to albums in it i will also talk about the corruption issue sometimes what happens when we try to use cp command we might end up corrupting the existing folders when i say corrupt it might end up accomplishing the task against our uh, original intention for example let's say i would like to create this albums folder under demo as is from temp demo albums now let me delete the albums folder which is there in the current directory let me run ls hyphen ltr there is no uh, directory by name albums in this you can see here we have only files now if i say cp hyphen rf then temp demo albums and if i specify albums here it will create this folder and it will recursively copy the contents of this folder into this you can actually run this and then you should be able to say find albums to validate what we have as part of the albums folder now if we rerun this command once again cp hyphen r or hyphen rf either of the commands if you run it again it is successful however it will end up creating a subfolder by name albums within albums you can see here we have the original files intact and then we have subfolder albums and again in that subfolder albums it have copied the files from the source location so the target folder ended up in corruption it is not actually meeting our original intention it is because of this command when we say cp hyphen r slash temp slash demo albums and specify the target location if it doesn't exist it is fine if it exists if the target is a folder it will try to copy the source folder as a subfolder in the target folder which is not right now to clean this up we can actually use rm hyphen rf then albums 
then albums now the folder is deleted in case if there are any changes to the original location for example let's go to temp demo then albums let's say we have new album now mkdr album 5 let's generate few files in it saying song then range 1 to 5 dot mp4 now we got a new set of files in this we can say ls ltr album 5 and we can see the five songs here now let's go to the demo folder now if we use this command once again cp hyphen r temp demo albums albums instead of just copying album 5 folder under albums it will actually uh, create a subfolder by name albums under albums and it will copy all the albums once again which is not right so in this case either you can say cp hyphen r temp demo albums and then album 5 like this it should work or you can just say cp hyphen r temp demo albums dot it will uh, refresh the current folder now let's say find and then albums you can see album 5 and respect to songs let me clean album 5 from this uh, folder let me say rm hyphen rf then albums then album 5 now album 5 folder is gone now i should be able to use cp hyphen r command by saying temp demo albums then space then dot hit enter now we should be able to use find albums and review the output you can see the data as per the expectations so you need to make sure you don't specify the target location with the same folder name especially if the folder already exists it will end up corrupting the folder you have to be careful with it that being said we have already covered hyphen r which actually takes care of copying the files recursively in ubuntu based systems it seems hyphen f is uh, by default and hence even when i don't use hyphen f it is actually copying the files by replacing the existing target files in other operating systems or even earlier versions of ubuntu it might fail if the force is not default for the cp command just make sure you understand the relevance of hyphen f command even though i haven't demonstrated also before you move on make sure you remember that to copy the folders recursively you have to use hyphen r without hyphen r you will not be able to copy the folders recursively let me demonstrate so that you understand and remember about this if i just say cp then temp demo albums and if i specify the target location as a dot you see it is failing it is saying hyphen r not specified omitting directory because temp demo albums is directory so in the pursuit of copying folders or copying the contents of folders or directories you have to use hyphen r always hyphen r stands for recursive
As part of this external module, we are going through the details related to managing files and folders in Linux. In the past few lectures, we have gone through a command called as cp, which is used to actually copy files from one location to another location. Now, it is time for us to explore a command called as mv, which stands for move, to move files from one location to another location. The main difference between cp and uh, MV or copy and move is nothing but with the CP you'll be having two copies of the files whereas with the MV you'll be having only one copy of the files at the destination. The files at the source will be gone. That being said first let's see the usage of MV command by running MV hyphen hyphen help. You can see the usage of MV command here. One of the most important argument which we typically use with MV is nothing but hyphen F or hyphen hyphen force. It will make sure you are not prompted before overwriting. It will just overwrite the files or folders automatically for us. At times we might also end up using hyphen I or hyphen hyphen interactive so that the target files are not accidentally overwritten. Except for these two, we don't use other arguments that often. When it comes to CP, we also use R for recursive. In case if you want to copy a folder which contains files and folders in it, then we use hyphen R or hyphen hyphen recursive to ensure that the folder or directory is copied recursively. Many times if we use CP very often, we end up making the mistake of using hyphen R with MV. It will not work because there is no hyphen R option with respect to MV command. Now let's see a few examples so that we understand how to copy the files. Let me say ls hyphen LTR. You can see there are quite a few folders and files. Let me actually create a folder called as demo. Let me get into that demo folder. Now let me run the touch command which we have used earlier uh, to actually copy multiple files and folders. In this case, uh, uh, I'll be using this uh, touch command. Touch album one to four underscore song one to five dot mp4. Now you can see bunch of files here. Now let's say we would like to move these files from one location to another location. You can actually create another folder and you should be able to move all these files in one shot. Now let me create another folder called as slash tmp slash albums. Now we have uh, albums folder under slash tmp. If we would like to move only one file at a time, we should be able to use command like this mv specify the file name let's say album1 underscore song1 then we should be able to specify the target location like this now the file is moved we can say ls7 ltr slash tmp slash albums even though i haven't specified the name for the target file it uses the same name as source and the file is moved here now if i say ls7 ltr you can see that there is no album1 underscore song1 dot mp4 here the file is gone earlier it is here now it is not there now when it comes to move command as in a cp command you should be able to move the file with a different name also so move can be used for renaming the files now the way you can actually rename the file while moving to different location is like this you can say mv album1 underscore song 2 dot mp4 then uh, we should be able to specify the target file name let's say song 2 dot mp4 let me also say a1 underscore song 2 dot mp4 uh, because we have other song 2s also that's why i would like to have some prefix which represents album 1 now you can see that uh, it is moved successfully we should be able to validate uh, in the destination by using this command you can see there are two files one is album 1 underscore song 1 dot mp4 the other one is nothing but a1 underscore song 2 dot mp4 now if i say ls and ltr album1 underscore song2 which was there earlier is now gone. You can also use the approach of ls ltr pipe wc hyphen l to get the number of files. You can see there are 19 of them. The reason why it is saying 19 is it is also counting this. To make sure it only consider the entries with uh, mp4 extension, we can actually say star dot mp4 like this and then pipe to wc hyphen l. Now you can see that we have 18 files in this location. Originally, we have created 20 files. So this is how we should be able to validate what is happening internally by using simple commands which you, you have already learned earlier. Now, you should be able to move multiple files at once using patterns. Let's say I would like to move all files related to album 1 at once. What I can do, I can say mv, then album1 underscore star dot mp4. It is optional to have dot mp4 
to make sure we only copy dot mp4 which starts with album one we can add this dot mp4 at the end now we need to specify the target location let me say slash tmp slash albums now the all the three files uh, uh, which have album one as prefix should be moved to target location we can validate by saying lsf and ltr tmp albums even though we'll be able to move files at once to the target location using this approach in case if you wanted to rename these files based upon certain patterns using mv command alone will not suffice we have to use the combination of awk and mv then only it will work that being said let me give you a problem statement think through it try to come up with a solution if not uh, watch the next lecture and uh, go through the solution so that you can understand what i'm talking about here now let me hit ctrl c to come out of it let me say else hyphen ltr we can see that uh, in the current location demo we have several uh, files uh, with album 2 prefix album 3 prefix and album 4 prefix let's say i would like to move all the files which belong to album 2 to uh, slash tmp slash albums however while moving there i would like to rename these files to a2 underscore song 1 a2 underscore song 2 etc which means the album name will be changed to a2 if you want to run one command at a time we can use this approach we can say mv album 2 underscore song 1 dot mp4 then slash tmp slash albums then slash a2 underscore song 1 dot mp4 now if you want to move all the files it is not possible if you just say star here let's say star here then let's say star here and then try running it you can see that it is failing it is failing because it could not figure out what basis the file should be moved that being said as we have seen with the cp where we have copied multiple files with different names at once using combination of awk and cp uh, we should be able to come up with a solution for mv also you should be able to use this command called as history then you should be able to pipe to grep let's say cp and also let's say grep awk we should be able to see all the commands which we have gone through earlier this is the command which we have used to copy multiple files at once with different names you should be able to leverage this approach and you should be able to come up with the solution using mv to move multiple files with different names to the target location try out by yourself if you could not figure out watch the next lecture i'll go step by step so that you understand how to move multiple files at once by giving different names at the target first let's come up with the logic to create all the three folders at once the three folders we are supposed to create are nothing but album 2 album 3 album 4 ls-1 will only give the file names in one column it will not print any of the properties of these files this is a good starting point as we have seen earlier to create the folders we can say ls-1 then awk then hyphen capital f in this case underscore is the delimiter then we can actually say single quote curly braces print dollar one then curly braces then single quote so print statement should be enclosed in single quote and curly braces now we should be able to hit enter and we can actually get the album names we can actually sort and then apply unique to get all the unique uh, album names now we want to create the folders for that we can actually say mkdir the target location for these folders is nothing but this one slash tmp slash albums then under uh, slash tmp slash albums we should be seeing folders such as album 2 album 3 album 4 now let's hit enter you can see the mkdir commands now we should be able to pipe the output which is nothing but the set of mkdir commands to bash hit enter album 2 already exists that's why it failed let's validate whether album 3 and album 4 are created or not for that we should be able to say lsf and ltr then slash tmp slash albums you can see that album 3 album 4 are created uh, also with respect to album 2 as it already exists it have failed to make sure it doesn't uh, throw these errors in case of uh, folders already exist we should be able to use control argument called as hyphen p if the folders already exist it will just ignore you can see it didn't throw any error even though album 2 album 3 album 4 already exists in temp albums now we want to move the songs into respect to album folders by discarding the album names from uh, the song names 
for that the logic will be like this we can say ls hyphen l then pipe then arc then underscore is the delimiter we have to pass the delimiter using hyphen capital f then we should be able to say print as part of the print we have to give the move command so we have to say mv so in this case the original song name which is nothing but this one should be moved to song4.mp4 under slash tmp slash albums album2 so we have to get the complete song name for that we should be able to use dollar zero we have seen this earlier also now i am reiterating this will actually say mv whatever song name we have it will not delimit and extract part of it so dollar zero means the original uh, line itself or the original record in the output itself now we should be able to say slash tmp slash albums slash now we have to specify the album into which it is supposed to be copied as these records are delimited by underscore we should be able to say dollar one which will give us the album name the album names are nothing but album two album three album four now we need to make sure the song name is also changed this is a folder and hence first we need to close the folder and then we have to specify the the target song name in this case the target song name is nothing but this part the first part before underscore should be discarded while uh, giving the name to the songs and hence uh, we should be able to say dollar two like this now we can validate by closing the curly braces and also the single quotes hit enter it should print the appropriate mv command however there is a space missing here i haven't executed these commands i have just printed how the commands uh, will look like now the space is missing here especially after giving the source file name we need to add that space now we can hit enter now you can review the commands which we have generated using the awk now the commands look fine all we need to do is hit up arrow then pipe then bash hit enter it will take care of moving all the files at once you can validate by saying ls hyphen ltr slash tmp slash albums then slash then uh, album 2 album 3 album 4 you can see the songs are now renamed in such a way that the album names are gone from the song names this is how you should be able to move multiple files at once while changing the names of them that being said these kind of scenarios are not only relevant for projects but also as part of our day-to-day -day usage you might have quite a lot of images using certain patterns now you might want to reorganize them you should be able to use either cp or mv in combination with awk and you should be able to automate the renaming of your files using the new approach also your friends might share songs or movies in the form of dvds or uh, usb drives or hard drives you might want to organize while copying into your system again you should be able to leverage this approach and you should be able to rename the titles now let me remind you few scenarios which might not be related to projects where these can come handy for example you might end up downloading songs from different websites over a period of time you might want to organize in a proper form so that you can access those with ease each website might give you the files using their own standard you might want to adapt those to your standard you should be able to automate using these approaches which i have shown earlier also your friends might share the movies or songs with you in the form of dvds usb drives etc you might again want to reorganize those song files and movie files in your own way even in those scenarios it will come handy you might end up having uh, so many images over a period of time again there might be few patterns uh, on which the images might have been copied over a period of time if you can identify those patterns you should be able to leverage the approaches which have suggested earlier to organize your images as well like this there will be n number of uh, scenarios where you should be able to leverage these approaches to actually automate and take care of organizing at once it will be less buggy less error prone and also standards will be enforced and hence it will be easier for you to actually navigate through your file system and get these files faster based upon your usage requirement
As part of the sectional module, we are actually going through the details about managing files and folders in Linux. At this time, we are exploring a command called as MV to move files and folders from one location to another location in Linux. Now, before actually getting into the demonstrations related to MV command to move folders from one location to another location, the folder which I will be using for the demonstrations, which is nothing but data, I would like to take the backup of it. One of the ways to take the backup is by using a command called as star. Uh, tar have wide variety of usages but we'll be using it for taking the backup i'll also try to cover tar in detail if it is required in subsequent sections or modules but for now from the perspective of taking the backup we'll be exploring the tar command i'll be covering the tar command in two to three lectures so that you are really comfortable with tar when it comes to tar if you would like to get the help on tar you should be able to set tar hyphen hyphen help you should be able to see the help related to the tar. You can see that there are quite a few options with respect to tar. You can explore based on the requirements. From the perspective of the backup, we just have to explore some of the important options. They are nothing but C, V, F, X and Z. I will explain those in detail and then I will actually get into the demonstrations. You can see that there are quite a few options with respect to tar you can uh, glance through and see if you can understand some of these things after going through whatever uh, i am going to cover I if at all it is required you can uh, use tar depending upon your requirements for other scenarios as well for now we'll be using tar for taking the backups also when it comes to using tar to actually uh, build the tarball it not only takes the backup of uh, files and folders it will also take the backup of properties of the files and folders that are part of the folder using which we are trying to create the tarball in the process of taking the backup of that folder. For example, if we take the backup of data folder, uh, data have several subfolders and files in it. It not only takes the backup of all those files and folders, it also takes the backup of properties related to the files and folders. The properties are nothing but these ones. Uh, the properties include the permissions, owner group and also the last updated timestamp of each and every file and folder that is part of the folder that is being backed up we'll be demonstrating using data in this case all the files and folders within data folder will be backed up along with the properties of those files and folders that being said now let's explore some of the important control arguments that are associated with tar uh, they are nothing but c c is primarily used to create the tarball Along with C, we also use F. Hyphen CF is typically used to create the tarball. However, we might want to see the feedback while creating the tarball. For that purpose, we can use V. V stands for verbose. There are several commands where we would like to see the feedback. In all those scenarios, we can use V. Typically, V in those commands is nothing but verbose. So CVF is the combination which is used while creating the tarball while getting the feedback. If you want to untar and restore the files and folders the way they were earlier, then you have to use xvf. x for extract, v for verbose, f is also used while extracting the tarball to its original form. When we use hyphen cvf, it will actually create uncompressed tarball. The size of the uncompressed tarball will be almost equivalent to the original size of the files and folders that are being tarred. Uh, if you want to compress and reduce the size of the tarball, you can use Z option. So if you say CZVF, typically the tarball will be created in compressed format. The compression algorithm that will be used is nothing but GZIP. Now, if you want to uncompress and untar the compressed tarball, then you use the combination of XZVF. X for extract, Z for deal with compression, uh, V for verbose and we have to use F as well. So these are the important control arguments. We have covered five of them. C, V, F, X, and Z. Now using these, let's see how to take the backup and also how to restore. I'll be covering those as part of the subsequent lectures in this sectional module. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details about managing files and folders in Linux. At this time, we are exploring a command called as tar to take the backups. Keep in mind that tar can be used for other purposes also, but one of the common uses of tar command is primarily to take the backup and also to restore, if at all we would like to restore. In this lecture, let's go through the details about how to use tar command to take the backup. We'll be taking the backup of uh, data folder. All the files and folders uh, that are part of data folder will be backed up in the form of tarball. 
the syntax will be like this tar then control arguments in this case to create the tarball especially uncompressed tarball we can use hyphen cf it will take care of creating the tarball for us the first argument to tar command is nothing but the tarball name in this case i am naming it as data.tar because we are trying to take the backup of data folder however you can give any name you want even the extension is just uh, uh, informational you don't need to specify the extension like this but it is a better practice to actually specify the extension for uncompressed tarballs we use dot tar as extension then we can actually specify the name of the folder for which we wanted to take the backup now i can hit enter it will take a moment and it will take the backup of this folder called as data using this name uh, let's wait until the backup is done then we'll actually take it further now the tar command is executed if you observe it took some time to actually create the tarball the reason is the size of this data folder is little bit bigger now let me say ls hyphen ltr you can see data dot tar here you can see the size of it now let's say ls uh, not ls but du hyphen sh data and also data dot tar you can see the size of tarball is same as the original folder that being said uh, even though it took time we don't know whether it is actually building the tarball or it is hung because there is no feedback in case if you would like to get the feedback uh, while creating the tarball or even while uh, restoring the tarball to its original folder we should be able to add v it will actually provide the feedback now let me delete the tarball now the tarball is deleted now let me go back to the tar cf command now let me add v now you can see that there is feedback while tarball is being created now the tarball is created now let me say ls hyphen ltr you can see that it is created successfully and we were able to see the feedback the advantage of v is primarily to get the feedback while the tarball is being created now the tarball is created successfully however you might want to see what this tarball contain if you use the x it will directly extract the tarball and restore the folder without extracting also we should be able to review what this tarball contain for that we have to use control argument called as t i haven't covered t earlier you should be using t to actually list the contents of a tarball again we typically use t and f to actually list the contents of the tarball so in this case i can say tar hyphen tf v doesn't make sense with respect to t and hence you can skip v when you try to list the contents of the tarball using t now you have to specify the name of the tarball and you can see the contents of this tarball it haven't extracted the tarball yet however it is actually showing the contents of the tarball when we actually use t now we have created uncompressed tarball and we have already reviewed the size of data folder and also data dot tar tarball both of them are same keep in mind that tarball is nothing but a file it is backup of this folder and that's why when we say ls hyphen ltr when it comes to data it have d at the beginning whereas with respect to tarball there is no d at the beginning because it is just a file however it is a special file which will have the backup of the original folder data that being said many times when we want to create tarball for the backup we typically compress compression have several advantages one of them is nothing but reduction in the size of the tarball the way you can compress is like this you can say tar and then instead of cvf you can say czvf or cvzf you can uh, place these control arguments in any order then you can specify the tarball name when it comes to compressed tarballs we typically use this format either tar.gz or tgz just to convey the message saying that this is a compressed tarball then we should be able to specify the folder for which we are going to build the tarball now i can hit enter you can see that it is taking a little bit more time to compress uh, and create the tarball uh, we'll wait until it is executed and then we'll review the size of the compressed tarball and also uncompressed tarball to see the difference you can see that it is taking quite a lot of time when it comes to creating a compressed tarball because it has to compress the files that are there as part of the tarball while creating the tarball now let me say ls hyphen ltr you can see the size here the tarball which is uncompressed is of size this much whereas tarball which is compressed is of size this much in this case we haven't got significant amount of reduction with respect to size of the compressed tarball it is because most of the files in a data folder are compressed already let me go up and let me show the bigger files 
they are nothing but these ones you can see they are already compressed as they are already compressed the savings with respect to size is not significant in this case however if all these files and folders are uncompressed then the composite tarball will be much less in size compared to uncompressed tarball you can see all these big files are actually compressed already so this is the command which is used to create the compressed tarball to list the files in the compressed tarball you just have to say hyphen tzf now let me remove this folder name we have to specify the tarball name like this only data.tgz is the name of the compressed tarball now we can remove v with respect to listing we just have to say tzf like this now you can see the list of files in the compressed tarball yeah you have gone through the details about using tar command to take the backup of a given folder in the form of a tarball now it is time for us to understand how to restore the restoration can be in the same location in which we have taken the backup or it can be in different location within the same server or it can be in a different server altogether in this case i'll demonstrate the restoration process by copying these tar files to temp folder let's go to the details as part of the next lecture yes yeah, part of the section module we are going through the details related to managing files and folders in linux at this time we are talking about tar command one of the usage with respect to tar is nothing but to take the backup of files and folders along with the properties and also to restore already we have taken the backup of data folder in this case we have backed up twice one as uncompressed tarball and the one as compressed tarball this is the uncompressed tarball and this is the compressed tarball at any point in time if you would like to list the contents of the tarballs you should be able to use hyphen t if it is compressed you should be able to say z and then f and then you should be able to pass the compressed tarball name you can see the contents of the compressed tarball data dot tgz for uncompressed tarball you just have to say tar hyphen tf and then the tarball name in this case the uncompressed tarball name is nothing but data dot tar now we should be able to say hyphen tf to list the files and folders in uncompressed tarball as we have understood how to take the backup and also how to list the contents of the tarballs now it is time for us to explore how to restore yeah i have mentioned earlier we should be able to restore these files in this folder itself this is the folder in which we have data folder and also we have created tarballs in this folder itself or we should be able to move these files to a different location in this server and we should be able to restore over there we can also copy these to remote servers and we should be able to restore even in the remote servers for now let's move these files to temp folder and let's see how to restore these files as part of the temp folder to move these to temp folder we should be able to use mv command which we have seen already in this case data dot tar is nothing but a file which contain the contents of data folder the contents are nothing but files and folders within data folder as it is a file we don't need to specify anything that is specific to a folder we just have to say mv data dot tar which is nothing but the file name and the target location which is nothing but slash tmp then if you run it the data dot tar will be moved to slash tmp folder let's say ls hyphen ltr slash tmp you can see data dot tar over there let's also move data dot tgz to slash tmp now let's say ls hyphen ltr slash tmp we should be able to see both the tarballs the uncompressed tarball as well as the compressed tarball now let's go to the temp folder let's run ls hyphen ltr as of now there is no data folder under slash tmp you can see here however we have already moved both the uncompressed tarball as well as compressed tarball to this location now let's see how to untar the uncompressed tarball we just have to say tar then hyphen x for untar we have seen c to create t for list x for extract then v so that we can see the feedback then we have to use the f also then we have to specify the uncompressed tarball name which is nothing but data dot tar and you should be able to hit enter you can see that the files are being uh, untarred and you should be able to validate whether data folder is created or not by running ls hyphen ltr you can see the data folder here if you look at the timestamp even though it is just untarred in this uh, location it is saying april 18th 11:53, which is same as whatever we have in the home directory of dgadraj user which is used to log in into the system at this time let me hit enter you can see the data folder you can see the permissions uh, owner group and also the timestamp both the data in temp folder which is nothing but this one 
and the data in home directory have same. You can also go through the files and folders within these data folders. You will see the permissions to be same. That being said, there is also a command called as diff which can be leveraged to actually see the differences between not only files but also the folders. We'll cover those uh, in a dedicated section. If you want, you can use diff and you should be able to compare everything related to these files and folders uh, which is there under data in temp and also the home directory of the user that is used to login. Now let me run ls-ltr once again. We have untarred the uncompressed tarball and you can see the folder here. You can also say du-sh data to get the size of the folder. You can see that it is 631 MB. Now let's go to the details about untarring the compressed tarball. Uh, let's remove the data folder which is already there. For that I am saying rm-rf. Now the data folder is deleted. Let me say ls ltr you can see there is no data folder here. If you want, you can leave the data folder as is and you can try untaring the compressed tarball. You can see if there will be any deviation in the behavior. If there is any deviation in the behavior, you should be able to troubleshoot and understand what is going on internally. I will leave it as an exercise to you. That being said, now if I want to untar this compressed tarball on top of hyphen xvf which we have seen earlier, we have to include z also. You can place z anywhere. Typically, I place z after c or x or even t. v for verbose, then f is required for almost all the tar commands. Now, we should be able to say data.tgz. Now, it will not only uncompress this compressed tarball, it will also untar and it will take care of creating the folder data for us. Let's wait until it is completely executed. Once it is completely executed, we should be able to run ls ltr and we should be able to review that the folder is created as it was earlier under home directory of the user that is used to login. You can again say ls ltr tilde. You can see the data folder here. The properties related to this data folder and the properties related to the data folder from this composite tarball are same. You can also use du hyphen yes, then data and you should be able to see the size of the data folder. It is close to 631 MB. You can also add H to make it human readable. Once again, I am reiterating, if you are curious about if there is any corruption with respect to files and folders under data between the data in home directory and data in a temp, you should be able to leverage diff command. I will demonstrate the details related to diff command in a dedicated section about it. That being said, we have seen how to use tar to not only create the tarballs but also to list the contents of the tarballs and also to restore the tarball to its original format. Make sure you are comfortable with it. It comes quite handy when it comes to taking the backup of the files and folders in several scenarios. It can be your code when you try to deploy. It can be the data. It can be many other things. As part of this section or module, we are going through the details related to managing files and folders in Linux. At this time, we are actually talking about commands such as MV to move files and folders from one location to another location in a given server. Already we have seen quite a few details with respect to moving files. Now let's talk about moving folders. When it comes to moving folders, it is same as what we have seen with respect to files. It is not much different. However, when it comes to MV, we might end up using hyphen F quite often to make sure the target locations are overwritten if the target location exists. Now let me actually say ls ltr. You can see that uh, there is a folder called as data. I will be using this data folder. I will be using this data folder to actually demonstrate details with respect to moving folders using mv command. Let me get into that folder. Now I am in the data folder. Already I have taken the backup of data folder under slash tmp. Uh, you can actually validate by saying ls ltr then slash tmp. You can see data folder here. And also you can see compressed tarball as well as uncompressed tarball. To avoid confusion, first let me remove this uh, folder. If you don't have it already, you can ignore. In my case, I already have it and hence I'm actually removing the data folder under slash tmp. Now I'll start with uh, moving retail underscore db folder which is there as part of data. You can see retail underscore db. Already there is a retail underscore db folder under slash tmp. Let's see what happens when I use mv command. I am using mv command. Then I am actually saying retail underscore db, then slash tmp. I would like to move using same name for the folder and hence I am not specifying anything after slash tmp. As slash tmp is a valid directory, it will try to move retail underscore db to slash tmp. Now when I try to run mv command, it is saying whether we would like to override or not. Let's see what happens if I say yes. It is saying operation not permitted. 
ఇట్ ఈస్ బికాస్ రీటైల్ అండ్ స్కోర్ డిబి ఈజ్ నాట్ ఓన్డ్ బై డి గాదిరాజు యూజర్ యాజ్ డి గాదిరాజు ఈజ్ ఏ సూపర్ యూజర్ వీ షుడ్ బి ఏబుల్ టు చేంజ్ ది ఓనర్ ఆఫ్ రీటైల్ అండ్ స్కోర్ డిబి ఫోల్డర్ బై సేయింగ్ సూడో సిహెచ్ ఓన్ దెన్ డి గాదిరాజు కాలన్ డి గాదిరాజు దెన్ డేటా నాట్ డేటా యాక్చువల్లీ ఇట్ ఈస్ టెంప్ రీటైల్ అండ్ స్కోర్ డిబి ఇన్ దిస్ కేస్ ఐ వుడ్ లైక్ టు మేక్ షూర్ the permissions are changed not only for return underscore db but also all the files and folders in it recursively for that i should be able to use hyphen capital r like this it will recursively change the ownership of return underscore db to dgadraju now it is run it is prompting for the password now it should be successful let's say ls hyphen lts slash tmp you can see that the owner for return underscore db is changed to dgadraju as we have used hyphen capital r it will recursively change the owner for each and every file and folder under retail underscore db let's review what we have under retail underscore db folder by saying ls hyphen ltr slash tmp slash retail underscore db you can see that there are six folders now let's review the retail underscore db under data folder in home directory i'm already in data folder in home directory and hence i should be able to use relative path like this now you can see even this one have same files and folders now let me say mv retail underscore db slash tmp already slash tmp have retail underscore db folder let's see what happens you can see the error message here it is saying cannot move retail underscore db from the current folder to slash tmp slash retail underscore db because the directory is not empty if directory is not empty it is inevitable for us to use hyphen f so that uh, it can be moved now i should be able to say mv hyphen f retail underscore db then slash tmp it will take care of moving the retail underscore db now before running this let's remove the retail underscore db folder under slash tmp i should be able to say rm hyphen rf slash tmp slash retail underscore db now let me hit enter you can see the folder is deleted now let me try this command once again let's see what happens okay when the target folder doesn't exist it did not say directory not empty it have just moved retail underscore db to that location without any issues you can validate by saying ls hyphen ltr slash tmp slash retail db you can see all the files and folders so if the target folder exists then it will complain like this now let me do one more thing we also have retail underscore db underscore json you can see here now what i'm trying to do is i'm actually creating an empty folder under slash tmp by name retail underscore db underscore json now there is an empty folder called as retail underscore db underscore json under slash tmp now let's say mv retail underscore db underscore json then slash tmp we are trying to move to the existing folder but this time it is empty earlier slash tmp slash retail underscore db was not empty and it have failed now let's see what happens now as retail underscore db underscore json under tmp is empty the files seems to be copied successfully we can validate by saying ls hyphen ltr slash tmp slash retail underscore db underscore json you can see all the folders and files you can also compare with the files that are there under retail underscore db underscore json in the data folder as the folder is already moved we are not able to review which means everything is successfully copied so keep in mind that you have to experiment to actually interpret these messages it is saying directory not empty we are not sure whether this directory not empty is related to the source folder or destination folder because it is not specifying the actual folder name while complaining directory not empty now by experimenting we figured it out that it is actually complaining about the target directory if target directory is empty the move command will work without any issue but if it is not empty then it might not work that being said now let me say ls hyphen ltr let's create a scenario where uh, the target folder into which we are trying to move already have some files in it but not exactly the same way as the source and see what happens so in this case i'm actually saying mkdir slash tmp slash cards i'll be using cards folder under data to experiment this now if i look at cards folder you see there are four files i'll be copying only one file to that location so let me say cp cards deck of cards the location into which i would like to copy is nothing but slash tmp slash cards now let me hit enter now the file is copied you can validate by saying ls hyphen ltr slash tmp slash cards now let's say mv then cards then slash tmp then it will fail saying directory not empty 
Now let's use mv-f, then say cards, then slash tmp, and let's see what happens. Even with hyphen f, it is saying directory not empty. So you will not be able to move into the directory which is not empty. One of the ways to make sure the files and folders under cards are actually moved to slash tmp slash cards is by taking care using some automation. So we should be able to say ls hyphen one, then cards. It will actually list the files and folders in that location. Then we should be able to say pipe, then awk, then hyphen uh, capital F. So in this case, we don't need to use hyphen capital F. We can ignore. We can just say print mv, then uh, whatever we have as part of the cards, which is nothing but cards slash. So I have to say cards slash, then dollar one which is nothing but the individual file name. Then the target location. The target location is nothing but slash tmp slash cards. First let's print and then we'll take it further. Now you can see the mv commands here. As the mv commands are generated as per the expectations, now we should be able to pipe to bash and hit enter. Now all the folders and files under cards are actually moved into the target location, which is nothing but slash tmp slash cards. We should be able to validate by saying ls hyphen ltr slash tmp slash cards. So all the files under home directory data cards are actually moved to slash tmp slash cards. Now it is time for us to validate whether we have anything under cards folder. You can see there are no files and folders and hence we should be able to clean up the cards folder like this. This is how you should be able to explore the commands and make sure you come up with solutions based upon your requirements working around the limitations posed by those commands. You need to make sure not only to understand how to use those commands but also how to build solutions around those commands depending upon the requirements. That being said, as we have understood all the details with respect to CP as well as MV, now it is time for us to go through the details about RM command. RM is typically used to clean up files and folders. We have been using it quite often. Now we'll actually understand what RM is all about from the perspective of cleaning up or deleting the files and folders in Linux. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details about managing files and folders in Linux. In that process, we have explored commands such as cpmv. cp is primarily used to copy files from one location to another location in Linux file system, while mv is used to move files from one location to another location. In this lecture, let's go through the details about rm command. rm is used to remove or delete files or folders from Linux file system. Let's start with the usage of rm command. For that, we should be able to use rm-help. It will give us the details about the rm command. We should be able to look at the details by scrolling up here. Some of the important control arguments that can be used with rm command uh, are nothing but hyphen f or hyphen hyphen force, hyphen small r or hyphen capital r or hyphen hyphen recursive. These are the two most important control arguments which we typically use with uh, rm command. On top of these things, we also use hyphen i. Uh, it is primarily to avoid accidental deletes of the files. It is also very important control argument. I will also cover few details with respect to that. Also sometimes we might have to delete empty directories. Uh, we should be able to use hyphen D or hyphen hyphen DAR to remove empty directories. We also have alias or alternate command for uh, rm hyphen D uh, to remove empty directories. It is nothing but rm DAR. That being said, let me first run some command called as uh, which and see what output we'll get. So in this case I'm saying which rm you can see that it is pointing to user bin rm. In most of the Linux based systems, uh, when it comes to rm command, they might define a alias uh, by saying rm i. If they say rm i, whenever you try to delete any file, it will prompt you to confirm whether you would like to delete it or not. Uh, we'll see an example very soon. In this case, it is not pointing to uh, alias of rm i. It is a direct rm command only under user bin, which means the files will be deleted automatically when we run the command without prompting. That being said, as we understood the usage of rm command, let's perform a few tasks so that we really understand how to use rm effectively while deleting the files or folders. First, we'll start with files, then we'll actually get into the folders. In that process, we'll explore all the important control arguments as well. 
Yes, part of the sectional module, we are going through the details about managing files and folders in Linux. In the previous lecture, we got an overview of rm command to remove files from Linux file system. In this lecture, let's understand how to use rm command to remove the files. Now, I'm in the data folder. Let me say ls-ltr so that we see what we have under this location. There is one file, readme.md, and then there are these folders. To perform the tasks I am performing, make sure you have these folders and files in your data folder. If not, you can restore from your tarball or you can also clone from the git repository. That being said, now let's start with uh, removing the file readme.md. You can see readme.md in data folder and we are in the data folder at this time. Now I should be able to say rm readme.md. You can see that the file is deleted without any issues. Sometimes you might try to delete the file accidentally. To avoid, we would like to get prompts whenever we try to delete the files. For that purpose, we can use hyphen i. It will make sure it will prompt you to confirm whether you would like to really delete the file or not. Now let me actually go to nyse underscore all. This is the folder. Now let me say ls hyphen ltr. This have two folders, nyse underscore stocks and nyse underscore data. Uh, let's try deleting these folders directly. In this case, I'm just saying rm. I'm not adding any additional arguments uh, before passing the folder name. When I say arguments, I'm talking about control arguments such as hyphen r, hyphen i, etc. I'm not going to pass any control arguments. Let me try to pass the folder name as argument directly. Let's say nyc underscore data. That is the folder which I would like to delete. Now you see, it is complaining saying nyc underscore data is a directory. We'll see how to remove directories or delete directories as part of the next lecture. Now let's get into this directory called as nyc underscore data. Now let me say ls hyphen ltr. You can see there are quite a few files in this. Uh, there are uh, almost uh, 20 files. Let me actually confirm. I can actually say ls hyphen l star dot gz then wc hyphen l to get the number of files in this location, we have 21 files. Now let's say uh, we'd like to delete this file, nyc underscore 1997.txt.gz, but we'd like to get the prompt so that the files are not deleted accidentally. For that, we can say rm hyphen i, then paste the name of the file. I haven't copied, now I'm copying. Now it is copied, now let me paste. Now let me hit enter, you see? It is prompting saying uh, you are trying to delete a regular file with name. Do you really want to, to delete or not? If you say yes, it will delete. Otherwise, it will not. Now, let's try deleting another file. In this case, it is 1998.txt.gz. Again, using hyphen i option. Now, let's say n or no. You see, it will not be deleted. Let me say ls hyphen ltr. You can see the file still exists. Except Y or yes, if you type anything, it will not be deleted. Let's try once again and let's hit enter directly. Now let's say ls hyphen ltr. You see the file still exists. So only when you say Y or yes, it will be deleted. Earlier we have seen with yes. Now let's say Y. Now let's say ls hyphen ltr. You can see the file is deleted. Only when it is Y or yes, the file will be deleted. For all others, it will be ignored. It will not throw any error when you type anything other than y or yes or n or no. Only when uh, we type y or yes like this, the file will be deleted. Otherwise, it will not be deleted. It's not only about n or no, any other character or any other word, it will not be deleted. That being said, let's go through the details about how to make sure we get the behavior of rm hyphen i by creating a alias by name rm for this command. I'll cover those details as part of the next lecture. That being said, uh, if hyphen i is not used to delete the file, we can just say rm and we should be able to pass the file name. The files will be deleted for us. Let's go through the details about how to use alias to define alias for this command so that in systems like production, we typically get prompts whenever we try to delete the files. Also, sometimes we would like to overcome that. I will also demonstrate how to overcome that after creating alias for this command by name rm. All those details will be covered as part of the next lecture. As part of this sectional model, we are going through the details related to managing files and folders in Linux. 
at this time we are actually talking about rm command already we have seen how to use rm command to remove the files however when we try to use rm in production we would like to avoid accidental deletes whenever we use rm we would like to get the behavior of rm i where we get a, a prompt like this to confirm whether we would like to delete the file or not for that purpose we should be able to create alias for this by saying rm let's go through the details about how to create alias by name rm for this command for that let's say alias and then hyphen hyphen help so that we understand the uses of alias command it is pretty straightforward you just have to give command like this alias then a name in this case rm equal to value which is nothing but rm hyphen i as there is a space in between we have to make sure rm hyphen i is passed using single quotes let's go through the details so that you understand what i'm talking about here so the way you can use alias is like this alias rm equal to then single quotes or even double quotes rm hyphen i then run it the alias will be created you can confirm by saying alias rm you can see the details here. Now let's say ls ltr to list the files and folders in this location. We have only files in this location. Now let's try to delete this file. I have copied this file. I have copied this file name. Now let's say rm. I am not using hyphen i. Now let me paste it. Hit enter. You see it is prompting even though I haven't specified hyphen i. So using alias like this, we should be able to get the behavior of rm hyphen i even for rm command. Now we should be able to say yr yes to actually delete the file. Now we can say ls hyphen l. We should be able to see the output here. There is no file by name nyc underscore 1999.txt.gz because it is deleted. This is how you should be able to leverage alias to actually redefine the meaning of the original commands. It is widely used especially to control the behavior of rm command in non-development servers. We typically create alias for rm hyphen i as rm so that whenever someone try to use rm command the files are not deleted directly. Now as alias is created let's say we'd like to delete all the files at once. For that we should be able to say rm then nyse underscore then let's say 200 then star dot txt dot gz. Following this pattern, we have these many files starting from 2002 to 2009. So these are the files which we are trying to delete at once. Because rm is actually rm i due to the alias, it will prompt for each and every file. You can see here. First it is prompting for nyc underscore 2000 dot txt dot gz. You can say yrn. Now it is asking for 2001 so and so forth. So in this case, it will prompt you 10 times, which is a overkill, uh, especially sometimes we would like to delete hundreds of files at once. And if alias is defined for rm i as rm, for each and every file, it will actually prompt like this. To avoid that, you can use hyphen f or hyphen hyphen force. So you can say rm hyphen f. First, let me actually run ls hyphen l to confirm the files 2001 and 2002 are deleted. You can see that those two files are deleted. Now, instead of saying rm nyc underscore 200 star dot gz, let me say rm hyphen f, then nyc underscore 200 star dot txt dot gz. Now hit enter, all the files are gone. The hyphen f will actually force delete all the files matching the pattern. Now we should be able to say ls hyphen l. You can see all the files which follow this pattern are deleted. This is how you should be able to use hyphen f in terms of uh, avoiding the prompts even if alias is defined for rm hyphen i as rm. It is very very important for you to keep this in mind. Also, if I exit from this session, now I have exited from this session. Now I am actually getting into this session again. Now if I look at alias for rm, you can see that there is no alias for rm. That being said, the alias is gone as we have logged out of that session where alias is defined and we logged into a new session. To make sure these aliases persist across the sessions of a given user, the user's profile should be updated. Now I am in the home directory. Now let me say ls hyphen al so that we can see hidden files also. There are quite a few hidden files. Let me actually go up here. You can see there are quite a few hidden files. All the hidden files starts with a dot. The important hidden files which controls the behavior of user sessions are nothing but dot bash rc and dot bash underscore profile or dot profile. I will actually cover the details about profiles at a later point in time. For now, I'll be updating dot bash rc with the alias 
and we will see the behavior persisting across the sessions. Let me open the .bash rc file. If you are not comfortable with VA editor, make sure not to use it at this time. Don't worry too much updating this .bash rc. I'll be covering details about the profiles at a later point in time. Until that point, don't touch anything in .bash rc or any other hidden files such as .bash rc, which controls the behavior of your environment. That being said, now I can actually go to the end of the file. Let me create a new line. Now let me say alias rm equal to rm hyphen i. I have to have a space between rm and hyphen i. Now let me close this session. Still it will not work. If I say alias rm, it will complain saying rm not found. But if I exit, then if I get into the uh, session once again, then if I say alias rm, now you can see that the alias is visible. And this is how you should be able to use files such as .bash rc or .bash underscore profile to persist the behavior of certain commands such as rm across the sessions of a given user. Now if I try to use rm on any file it will prompt by default. Let me actually get into the data nyse then nyse underscore all folder. There is no nyse underscore all let me say cd data nyse underscore data it's nyc underscore all here then nyc underscore data this is the right path now let me say ls hyphen l we have these files now let's say rm i'm not specifying hyphen i now let me copy then paste you can see that it is prompting because of the alias that is defined as part of the bash rc I haven't defined alias in this session because it is defined as part of the bash rc all the sessions will automatically inherit that now i can say n to not to delete to forcefully delete we can actually say rm hyphen f and even though rm is pointing to rm hyphen i the file will be deleted without any issue first let me clean this up then let me say ls hyphen l now let me say rm hyphen f the file still exists you can see here now let me hit enter now let me say ls hyphen l now the file is gone. This is how you should be able to use alias to control the behavior of rm command to interactively delete the files. Uh, however, you should be able to use hyphen f to force delete in case you are using rm command as part of the scripts. Many times when we use rm command as part of the scripts, we don't want to get the prompts. Finally, you need to make sure the aliases are defined as part of profile files such as bash rc so that the behavior is uh, persisting across the sessions of a given user. I hope you are comfortable with this. Make sure you understand all these nuances so that you work effectively as part of the Linux environment. As part of this sectional model, we are going through the details about managing files and folders in Linux. At this time, we are actually talking about rm command. Already we have seen how to use rm command to delete files. Now let's go through the details about using rm command to delete folders or directories. Already we have specified alias for rm i as rm. We'll continue using the same while exploring uh, rm command to delete folders or directories. I'm in nyc underscore data folder. You can see the fully qualified path of this folder here. Now let me first delete all the files in this folder. If I do not use hyphen f, it will prompt for each and every file. And hence I'm actually saying rm hyphen f. In this case, I would like to delete all the files. And hence let me say star. Hit enter. Now all the files are deleted. Now I should be able to delete the empty folder by using rmdir then specifying the empty folder name. You can see that the folder is deleted without any issues. Let me create empty folder once again. We can use mkdir command to actually create empty folder. Now let's say rm then hyphen d nyse underscore data. As rm is pointing to rm hyphen i, it is prompting whether we would like to delete the directory or not. We can say yr yes and the directory will be deleted. You can also create the folder once again. If you would like to force delete empty folder, you can actually say rm hyphen df. It will take care of deleting the empty folder for you. Now let me say ls hyphen l. There is only one folder which is nothing but nyse underscore stocks. Now let me say rm hyphen df. Then nyse underscore stocks, hit enter. It is complaining saying directory not empty. As the directory is not empty, we will not be able to use either rm hyphen d or rmdir command to delete that folder. You can see that it is complaining saying directory not empty. Even rmdir cannot be used to delete the folders or directories when it have files. Now let's look at the usage of rmdir command. 
You can see the options that are available on top of rmdir command to confirm if it can be used to delete non-empty folders. You can see that there are no such control arguments which means we will not be able to use rmdir to delete non-empty folders. First we have to delete all the files in that folder and then we should be able to use rmdir to delete the empty folder. However, we should be able to use rm command to actually even delete the non-empty folders recursively. That's where hyphen r option comes into picture or hyphen r control argument comes into picture. Now let me say ls hyphen l. You can see there is this folder called nyse underscore stocks. Now let me say ls hyphen l nyse underscore stocks. You can see that there is only one file. Now I should be able to say rm hyphen r then nyse underscore stocks. It will try to delete uh, all the files recursively. Then it will try to delete nyse underscore stocks folder. However, as we have defined alias by name rm for rm hyphen i. It will actually prompt like this. Now you have to say why. Then only the files will start getting deleted from the directory. Now you can see that it is asking to remove regular file. Uh, we would like to say yes. Now the file is deleted. Now it have deleted the directory. Now you can say ls hyphen l. You can see that nyc underscore stocks is gone. Now let's go one level up. Now let me say rm hyphen f. In this case df nyse underscore all even this folder will be deleted because it's a empty folder it is deleted without any issues when i say rm hyphen df we can also use rmdir now let's say ls hyphen l let's pick uh, lca you can say ls hyphen l lca you can see that lca folder have four files now we should be able to say rm hyphen r Again, if you do not uh, specify f, it will prompt for each and every file recursively to delete. To make sure uh, the files are deleted without prompting, you have to use rm-rf lca. Now the entire folder along with the files will be deleted without prompting. You can see uh, it is deleted. Now let me actually say alias rm equal to, I am not actually touching the bash rc file i'm actually overwriting the behavior of rm command using alias in this session you can actually say alias rm equal to the original path of rm for that we should be able to say which rm you can see that it is nothing but user bin rm now let me copy this now let me say alias rm equal to as there is no space in between we don't need to use single quotes we can directly paste user bin rm now you can say alias rm, it is pointing to user bin rm. We have got the original behavior of the rm command. Now let's say ls hyphen l here. We have nyse folder. Let's see what we have in nyse folder. Then we'll take it further. It have two files in it. Now let me say rm hyphen r, which will try to delete the files recursively. And we do not uh, have f in it. And let's see the default behavior without i or f by just using rm hyphen r. In this case, nyse hit enter. You see the files and folders are deleted. In some operating systems, it might not delete when we just use rm hyphen r without prompting, even if you don't use hyphen i. But in Ubuntu 20.04, by default, it will try to delete all the files forcefully. Uh, if you say rm itself. In this case, nyse folder is deleted forcefully by going through it recursively. But hyphen r is mandatory whenever we try to delete a folder, especially if it is not empty. Now let me say ls hyphen l, nyse is gone. Once again, I am actually demonstrating by saying rm hr, hr is also folder. It has several files. You see it is complaining by saying it is a directory. You can validate what hr have by saying ls hyphen l hr. You can see there is one file. Now to delete it, we can just say rm hyphen r hr. Let's see what happens if you use rm hyphen f. I'm not using hyphen r, but hyphen f. You see, it is complaining it is a directory, which means to delete a folder recursively, if it have files or folders in it, we have to use hyphen r for sure. Hyphen r is most important when it comes to deleting non-empty folders or directories. Now I can actually say rm hyphen r f hr. Even without f, it should work you can see that hr folder is also gone. This is how you should be able to use rm command to clean up folders with hyphen r.
hyphen r is primarily used to recursively delete all the files and folders in a given folder when we try to delete that folder that being said make sure you are comfortable with rm command with uh, options such as hyphen r hyphen f hyphen i etc you have to use these things quite often as part of this section module we are going through the details about managing files and folders in linux at this time we are talking about rm command before getting into the details about automations around rm command let's go to the details about restoring this data folder already i have deleted quite a few stuff in the data folder i would like to restore it so that uh, i can actually use it again to explore rm command in the perspective of uh, automation first let me clean up this folder for that i should be able to say rm hyphen r f data it will take care of deleting the folder for us now we have the backup under slash tmp you can see there are two uh, tarballs one is uh, uncompressed tarball with uh, tar, tar extension and the one is compressed tarball with tgz extension we should be able to copy one of these uh, backups into the home folder where we would like to restore our data folder i can actually say cp slash tmp slash data dot tar I'll be using uncompressed tarball. Now, let me say dot so that it is copied to the home directory as I'm in the home directory at this time. Now, data dot tar is being copied. You see, it took some time to actually copy the data dot tar from temp directory to this directory. It is actually still running. Let's wait until it is completely run. Then we'll take it further. Now, it is done. Let me say ls hyphen ltr. You can see data dot tar here. Now we can use tar-tvf to list the contents of this tarball. You can see all the files and folders which we have deleted are part of this backup. Now we should be able to say tar-xvf. X is primarily to extract from the tarball and restore. Now we should be able to say data.tar. Hit enter. Now it is being restored. Let's wait until it restores. Now we can actually say ls-ltr. You can see the data folder here. Now we can get into this data folder. Then run ls ltr. You can see all the folders and files which were deleted earlier are restored. As the data folder is restored, now it's time for us to explore how to automate using find and rm command to delete the files based upon certain patterns. Let's go through those details as part of the next lecture. As part of the sectional model, we are going through the details about managing files and folders in Linux. As of now, we are in the process of understanding how to delete the files based upon certain patterns. Already we have gone through the details based on name. Now we wanted to delete the files based upon modified timestamp. But before actually getting into the details, we need to make sure we have the files with different modified timestamps. This approach is typically used to manage log files in servers. It can be production servers, it can be dev servers, it can be UAT servers. On most of the servers, we typically use this approach of managing the old files using uh, find. Sometimes we would like to delete the files. In that process, we will be using find along with rm to delete the files based upon certain modified time. First, let's go to the details about creating the files. We'll also go to the details about updating the timestamps as part of the next lecture. Then we'll actually go to the details about using rm along with find uh, as well as awk to delete the files based upon the modified uh, timestamp. That being said, let me create a folder by name logs just to make sure you understand that this approach is primarily used on top of log files. Now let me get into the logs folder. Let me say ls ltr. As of now, there are no files. I would like to create files at least for two years, starting from 2020 till 2021. For each and every day, I would like to create one log file. Let me use this format to name the log files. It is nothing but server underscore, then four digit year, then month, then day. So this file is related to 2021 January 1st. For 2021 January 31st, the file name will be like this. For 2021 December 1st, the file name will be like this. 12 and then 01. This is the convention using which I would like to create the files starting from 2020 January 1st till 2021 December 31st. We should be able to generate all these files with 3-4 touch commands. Let me start with the first touch command. I am saying touch server underscore. Then in uh, curly braces, I would like to generate files from 2020 till 2021. So it will generate all the files with uh, this uh, convention between 2020 then 2021. After that, I would like to generate files from uh, uh, January till December uh, only for those months which have 31 days. For that, I can actually say 01, 03, 05, 07. So January, March, May, July, then August, 
then October, then December. For this month, the range should be 01 till 31. And then the extension has to be dot log. And hence, let me say dot log. Now let me say ls and ltr. You can see all the files are generated. Let me say ls l rather than ltr so that we see the names in ascending order by name. You can also use ls l, then pipe to wc hyphen l. You should be able to see number of files that are created. Let me also filter for dot log extension. I should be able to say dot log like this. We can see that there are 434 files for the months of January, March, May, uh, July, August, October and December for the years of 2020 and 2021. Now let's go ahead and create the files for the rest of the months where we have 30 days. In this case we have to consider April, June, September and November. So here we have to change the range to 1 to 30. Then we have to remove these months. These are not the months which we are interested in. We cannot add February for 30 days and hence 2 is not option. But April, June or June, September which is nothing but 09 and then November which is nothing but 11. Now let's hit enter. Now the file should be created. Let's see the count. Now we can see that there are 674 files. Now we have to add for the month of February. Let me actually say 01 to 28. Then here we have to say 0 to, we should not be having curly braces like this. If you do not specify the range or comma separated values, it will just use curly brace in the file name as well. For that reason, I have removed curly braces around 0 to. Now files related to February for years 2020 and 2021 up to 28 are generated. However, 2020 is leap year and hence we have to hard code and create one file by saying server underscore 2020 0 to 29 because leap year uh, contain 29 days in February. Let me say log and hit enter. Now let me say ls l. We can see all the files. We can also say ls l wc l. However, in this case, we have to filter for log files and hence let me say star dot log here. Hit enter. You can see 731 files. So for year 2020, we have 366 files. For year 2021, we have 365 and hence total it is 731. So all the files related to year 2020 and 21 are simulated. You can actually see the output here. Now it is time for us to update the timestamps also. For all these files, the timestamp is more or less same. However, to explore how to delete certain files based upon modified time, we need to make sure even the timestamp is updated. For that, we can actually extract the date part from the files and we should be able to use touch with a hyphen T to update the timestamp of these files. Let's go through those details as part of the next lecture. Then we'll actually talk about how to delete files using find and awk in conjunction with RM based upon modified timestamp. As part of the section related to managing files and folders in Linux, at this time we are going through the details about uh, generating the files so that we can explore rm command along with other commands to delete them based upon modified timestamp. Already we have created 731 files for the year 2020 and 2021. However, the timestamp for these files is more or less May 1st around 538-539 time frame. Now I would like to update the timestamp of these files based upon the date that is there in these files. So using this information I would like to update the timestamp. For that we should be able to leverage the touch command. Let's review the uses of the touch and see how we can achieve it. So if you look at the touch hyphen hyphen help output there is an option called as hyphen t. You should be able to pass the timestamp in this approach to update the timestamp of a file. For example, in this case, let's say touch XYZ. Now the file is created. You can see the timestamp for this file. It is nothing but May 1st, 5.49 AM. However, I would like to change it to January 1st, 2021. For that, I can actually say touch hyphen T. First, let's look at the timestamp pattern which is supposed to be used. The pattern is nothing but year which is optional, then month, then two digit date, then two digit hour, two digit minute. So we have to pass year, month, date, hour and minute. Month, date, hour and minute are mandatory. This is how I should be able to pass the information. I can say touch hyphen t. Before running touch command, let's review the output of xyz file. As of now, uh, the timestamp is nothing but May 1st, 549. Now I would like to change it to 2021, January 1st, midnight. For that, I can actually say touch hyphen t 2021. 0101 
which is nothing but January 1st, then 0000, which is nothing but midnight. Now let's say XYZ. Now let's say LS hyphen LTR XYZ. You can see the uh, timestamp being updated uh, with January 1st, 2021. Now let me delete this file. Using this approach, we should be able to update the timestamp for all these files. Already the file names have the date. You can see here, using this date, we should be able to extract and update the timestamp using touch hyphen T. Now let's say ls hyphen one, it will print all the file names in ascending order by name in one column. You can see here, then we should be able to use awk. First, let's see how we can extract only this information. For this, I can use either underscore or dot as delimiter. If you use either of them as delimiter, this one will be the first string after splitting using the delimiters underscore or dot, then this will be the second string, then this will be the third string. The way you can actually consider multiple characters as delimiters is like this. You can say arc hyphen capital F, then square brackets, in this case underscore and a dot, we are considering these two as the delimiters. Now we can actually say print dollar one, it will print server you can see it, it have printed server. If you say three, it will print a log. If you say two, it will actually print the date part of our files. You can see the date part of our files. Now I would like to generate touch hyphen T command with this date and timestamp. Then I would like to apply that on top of the actual files itself. For that purpose, I have to say touch hyphen T space then if I hit enter, you can see it have got the date. However, I would like to get the timestamp part also. The way I can get the timestamp part is like this. I can say touch dollar two, then zero 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 zero. This is for hours and minutes, then space, hit enter. Now you see you got the required format as part of touch hyphen T. Now these touch hyphen T commands should have the file name as the argument. The way we can actually get the file name as argument is by saying dollar zero. You can see file names are arguments for these touch commands. Now we have printed the touch commands here. To update all these files with the corresponding timestamps like this, we just have to pass this to bash. Let me say bash. Now all the files are updated. Now let me say ls hyphen l, hit enter you can see the timestamp being updated for each and every file. So we are able to simulate as if the log files are generated over a period of two years. Now we have two years worth of log files. We can play with these files to understand how to use the combination of find, awk and rm to delete the files which we are not interested in. Let's go through those details as part of the next lecture. But before getting into the next lecture, let's make sure we have files related to the current year as well. Starting from 2022-0101, I would like to create end of the current year. As of now, I'm in year 2022. I'll be creating files related to 2022, starting from 2022-0101, which is the next file to this. Also, we need to update the timestamp based on the date associated with each of these files. Let's take it as an exercise, create all the files, then go to the next lecture. As part of this sectional model, we are going through the details about managing files and folders in Linux. At this time, we are talking about rm command to delete files and folders in Linux. Already, we have gone through the details about basic usage of rm command and also we have seen some level of automation around rm command by name. Now, let's go through the details about deleting the files based on timestamp. Already, we have created quite a lot of files with dot log extension to make sure we have enough files with appropriate timestamp. Now, we should be able to find the files based on timestamp and then we should be able to pass the output to rm command to remove those files. It is a very common use case uh, which the administrators use very often uh, who manages the Linux based servers. Now you can see that there are files until the end of the current year which is nothing but 2022-1231. As of now the date is only May 2nd. Let me say date. We can see the date here. It is still May 1st on the server. It's May 1st 11.45 pm. Now we should be able to use find command to get the files that are modified in the last 10 days or beyond 10 days or even in future. We should be able to get in all possible ways. Typically we'll be interested only in the past, not in the future. The future files should not be touched. First, let's explore how to find files based upon certain criteria. Let's start with the files that are modified before 10 days. For that, we should be able to use find command like this, find.mtime and then plus 10. 
it will actually display all the files that are modified before 10 days. Uh, as of now, the date is May 1st. It could be around April 20th or 21st. Now, let me sort the output so that we can interpret in right manner. We should be able to see up to what point the files are retrieved. You can see that it is retrieved till 2022.04.20.log. So it is able to find all the files that are modified before 10 days. Now we are not sure whether we'll be getting up to 2022.04.20.log or not. Sometimes we might want to hard code. If you want to hard code and if you want to get files up to a particular point or beyond a particular point, then we can use a control argument called as newer. Using newer, you should be able to get the files up to a particular point or beyond particular point. Let's look at the usage of find command by saying find hyphen hyphen help. Let's hit enter. As part of the tests, we should be able to see the newer. You can see there is newer. There is no older, there is only newer. But using newer, we should be able to get the older files also. Newer typically gets us the files modified after a given file timestamp. However, you can also go into the past by using a negate operation. I will also demonstrate how to use negate operation and get the files based upon hard-coded value. Now, let's review the timestamp of 2022.04.30.log. Here we have to say server underscore 2022.04.30.log. Hit enter. You can see that the timestamp is April 30th, 00, 00. Now I would like to get the files beyond this timestamp. For that, I should be able to say find name, not name actually, newer, then server underscore 2022 log. Let me copy this, then paste, hit enter. You see, you got all the files that are modified after that date. Let's sort the output. You can see the files up to 2022.1231.log. Let's reverse it to see the earliest file here. You can see the earliest file to be 2022.0501. All the files beyond 2022.0430 are retrieved. Now, if you want to get beyond 20, you can actually say 20.log here. Now, if you want to go older files than this file, then the logic should be like this. So whatever you are passing here, it should be negated the negation can happen like this. Now we should be able to pipe, then say sort and hit enter. Now you see it got the files up to 2022 April 20th. All the files that are modified before the timestamp that is there as part of this file, all those are displayed here. If you want to delete all the files based upon a certain date which is hard coded, you can use this approach. Otherwise, you can use this approach. This approach will give you all the files that are modified before 10 days. You can see the output here. Let's try to delete all the files that are modified before 90 days. For that, we should be able to say plus 90, then hyphen exec, then rm, then curly braces, plus semicolon, hit enter. Now the file should be deleted. You can actually say ls hyphen ltr, you can actually say wc-l to get the count. Uh, now we have only 336 files. We should have more than 1000 files because uh, I have generated files for 3 years. You can also run this command and uh, then see the output. You can actually reverse it by saying hyphen "-r". You can see the oldest file that survived here. It is nothing but the file with 2022 January 31st. All the files that are older than this file are deleted. Now, if you would like to delete the older files before 60 days, you should be able to use this approach. In this case, you just have to say plus 60. It will take care of deleting all the files before 60 days. Now you should be able to list the files that are available here. You can see that we have files only newer than 2022 March 1st or we have files starting from 2022 March 2nd. All the older files before this file are deleted. This is how you should be able to automate the process of deleting the files beyond a certain date. It is very common when it comes to managing the log files on Linux-based servers. Most of the applications will actually generate the files like this and many times the files will be deleted but some of the applications might not delete. In those scenarios, the administrators will take care of managing the log files like this. Even as developers, sometimes we might have to consider using this approach to delete all the old files in our development servers. 
administrators might give complete control on the dev servers to dev leads or even developers developers might have control and they might be able to manage the log files the way i have demonstrated here make sure you are comfortable with these things so that you can actually streamline the process of supporting the applications on linux based servers so far we have gone through the details about uh, cp to copy mv to move rm to remove files and folders now let's go through the details about how to rename the files as part of managing files and folders in linux also before going further to actually see how to rename the files let me remove this logs folder for that i'm actually going to the parent folder of logs it is currently under data folder i'm actually saying rm hyphen rf then logs it will take care of deleting the logs folder for us as logs folder is cleaned up now it is time for us to go through the details about renaming the files in linux yeah, as part of the sectional module we are going through the details related to managing files and folders in linux so far we have gone through the details about how to copy files and folders in linux using cp command how to move files and folders in linux using mv command also we have seen how to delete or remove files and folders in linux using rm command now it is time for us to explore how to rename files and folders in Linux. Keep in mind that there are no special commands to rename the files and folders in Linux. Either we have to use mv command or cp plus rm commands. Let's go through the details so that you understand what I'm talking about here. Let's say ls ltr. I'm currently in a data folder. You can see that there are quite a few folders and a file in this location. Let's say I would like to rename retail underscore db folder to retail underscore db underscore csv because that folder contains subfolders which contain csv files. For that, either we can say mv, then hyphen ef. It is optional to specify hyphen ef in Ubuntu 20.04. In some cases, you might have to. Let's try without hyphen ef to see if it works. If it doesn't work, then we'll use hyphen ef. In this case, we can say retail underscore db, then retail underscore db underscore csv. Now hit enter. You can see that the folder is renamed. Now there is no retail underscore db. There is only retail underscore db underscore csv. Let's assume even nyse have csv files and we would like to rename nyse to nyse underscore csv. Uh, we can also use cp plus rm for that first we have to use cp to copy nyc folder to uh, whatever folder we want to copy in this case nyc underscore csv then we have to use rm on top of nyc to remove uh, nyc folder so let me say cp then nyc then nyc underscore csv most likely it might fail you can see that it is saying omitting directory and nyse because we have to use hyphen r to recursively copy this folder to this folder i have already ran the command you can see here it was successful and also you can see the output of ls hyphen l you can see both nyse as well as nyse underscore csv when it comes to the timestamp, that timestamp is latest timestamp with respect to nyc underscore csv. If you don't want to change the timestamp, you can use hyphen p as well. It will take care of preserving the timestamp along with the permissions as well as ownership. Let me say rm hyphen r, then nyc underscore csv. Now the folder is deleted. However, it is prompting for each and every file because I have actually configured the rm command in such a way that it uses rm hyphen i whenever I try to run rm command using alias. That's why it is actually prompting for each and every file. Let me say control c. Now I came out of it. Now I can say rm hyphen rf nyse underscore csv. Now nyse underscore csv is deleted. We can validate by saying ls hyphen l. There's no nyse underscore csv. Now I can say cp hyphen rp, then nyse, then nyse underscore csv. This time it will actually preserve the properties of the files and folders uh, uh, that are copied to nyse underscore csv. You can validate by saying ls hyphen l. When it comes to the uh, timestamp and other uh, details, the details are same as what we have seen with respect to nyse here. So in the process of rename, if you wanted to use cp to actually create uh, new folder or file like this and then if you want to delete the original one then make sure you use p as well to preserve the properties of the files and folders now we should be able to say rm hyphen rf then nysc it will take care of deleting the nysc folder now we have only one folder nysc underscore csv which is nothing but copy of nysc which means nysc is now renamed as nysc underscore csv
So we can use either mv command or cp plus rm commands to actually take care of renaming the files and folders. However, mv is more effective because it will be faster to use mv command. It will not uh, copy the contents of the files when we use mv in the process of rename. It will just change the uh, high level name of the folder or file that is being renamed. When it comes to cp, it has to create a new copy of existing all files and folders and hence it will take a little bit more time. On top of it, you also need to use rm command to remove the original file or folder and hence it will be a little bit slower. So even though we can use either mv or cp plus rm commands to actually rename, mv is highly recommended. Let's see the details about the performance, then we'll wrap it up. In this case, we have a bigger folder nyc underscore all, you can see here. Let's check the size of nyc underscore all. Let me say du hyphen sh nyc underscore all. You can see that it is 58 MB. Let me see if uh, there is a larger folder than that. I think LCA is a larger folder. Let me say du hyphen sh LCA. Even this one is not very big because the files are already moved from this location. Let me do this. Let me remove this folder altogether. So data is already removed. Now let's see if I have tar file. There is tar file. So I should be able to restore data from this. Now I can say tar xvf data dot tar. Let me use hyphen xvf data dot tar. It will take care of restoring the data folder for us. Now it is restored. Let me get into the data folder. Now let me say du hyphen sh star. You can see sizes of all the files and folders in this location. The largest one is nothing but nyc underscore all. You can actually say du hyphen s star, then pipe sort hyphen n, hit enter. nyc underscore all is the largest one. It is of size 134 MB. Now let's say cp hyphen rf nyc underscore all nyc underscore all dot csv. It will take few seconds. I will not be using dot csv. I will be using underscore csv. If you observe, it will take few seconds. I am counting the seconds. Actually, it is a little bit faster. It just took one second to copy. Let me actually copy the entire data folder rather than just playing with nyc underscore all. Now let me actually remove nyc underscore all underscore csv. Now the nyc underscore all underscore csv is removed. Now let me go to the one level up. Now it have the data folder. Let's say du hyphen sh data. You can see that it is of size 631 MB. Now let me say cp hyphen rf data data underscore org. So this is the name which I want to use to copy to. Now hit enter. It took almost four seconds to actually create a copy of data folder as data underscore orange and then we have to remove the data folder. Removing the data folder might not take too much of time but copying will take time and also it will not copy the properties uh, directly it will use the latest timestamp. So CP is expensive operation. Now let me delete data underscore orange. Now let me say ls hyphen l. Now there is only data folder, there is no data underscore orange folder. Let's try to rename using mv command. For that I just have to say mv data data underscore orange, hit enter. You see it is instantaneous because it need not copy the contents from one location to another location in the hard drive where these files will be persisted. It will just update the name of the main folder data to data underscore orange. So renaming using mv is a lot more effective compared to renaming using cp plus rm commands. In the process of renaming the files, especially in the same location, always prefer to use mv over a combination of cp and rm commands. MV is a lot more better in performance compared to CP plus RM. That being said, before wrapping this lecture up, let's make sure we rename data underscore orange to data using MV command. You can see that it is renamed. Now let's say ls hyphen L. We have the data folder only. Uh, this is how you should be able to take care of renaming the files and folders either by using MV or CP plus RM commands. However, MV is recommended.